Good morning, Supervisor Chavez. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Wanda. Have a great meeting. Good morning, Supervisor Wasserman. You are on mute, my friend. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a wonderful meeting. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Tuesday. It's going to be a beautiful day. <laughs> Morning, Vice President, Supervisor Chavez. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. You're the elevator music today. Mike. Elevator music. Gloria, <laughs> Gloria. <laughs> Sooner than we know it, there will be five supervisors up here who have never heard of that song. I know, right? Yeah. That's probably my whole office right now. <laughs> Rhonda, we're still missing two soups. That is correct. No, we're just missing one. Um, Supervisor Lee is here. Supervisor Chavez is here and Vice President Ellenberg. All right. um, so we are just missing one. And by the way, your clerk today will be Dave Leon. Big Dave. Big Dave. Hello. Producer to the stars. And here we have Supervisor Simidian. Well, in five minutes for a full house. All right, and I imagine we've got, we do, 930 straight up. Dave, can you open us up with a roll call? Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. I'm here as well. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. You have a quorum. And Supervisor Chavez, if you'd please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, everyone who can stand, please do so. Thank you. I will. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And I'll just give a heads up to anybody wishing to speak in public comment and just a, a few items to please register by raising your hand electronically so that our clerk Dave will know how many people we have planning to speak under that item. Next is the invocation by Rabbi. I didn't know Melanie about the Emerita. Melanie Aaron from Congregation Sher Hadash that Supervisor Chavez is introducing today. Thank you. I'm I am really honored, and I, I mean this very sincerely, uh, to introduce our next um, invocator. Rabbi Emerita Melanie Aaron. Rabbi Melanie Aaron served as the rabbi at the Congregation Shir Hadash of Los Gatos from 1990 to 2020. 
ordained at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in 1981, Rabbi Aaron has served congregations in Morristown, New Jersey, and Brooklyn, and New York, uh, I'm sorry, Brooklyn, New York, before coming to California. She's a past board president of Silicon Valley Faces and the Jewish Federation of Silicon Valley, as well as a past board member of the American Leadership Forum of Silicon Valley. Rabbi Aaron is the past chair of the Interfaith Council on Religion, Race, and Economic and Social Justice, and she's also served on the Ethics Committee of the Kaiser, of Kaiser Hospital Santa Clara. Rabbi Aaron has been involved and has uh, remains involved in PACT, people acting in community together, and has chaired the Los Gatos clergy group and is involved in interfaith dialogues with Muslim and Christian communities. I think what you can tell by <laughs> Rabbi Aaron's activities is that she doesn't wait for people to come to the temple. She is out in the community building bridges and making change. I especially wanted to just acknowledge as she becomes um, uh, emerita that I, on behalf of many, many in our community, want to say a very sincere thank you. We're so grateful, Melanie, for all the leadership you've shown for years and years and helping our community stay knitted together and putting social justice always first in your actions. Thank you very much for those very kind words, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you this morning. I want to tell a little story of an experience I had with a bar mitzvah student who repeated to me something he must have overheard someone saying, quote, that the government does nothing and taxes are theft. So in response, we had to have a little conversation about the benefits that he received from the government, including traffic lights, schools, and even the water and sewage upon which he depended. What this young man had absorbed was not in keeping at all with the Jewish attitude towards government. Since 586 BCE, when Jewish exiles in Babylonia were instructed by the prophet Jeremiah to seek the welfare of the place where I have sent you and pray to God on its behalf, Jews have recognized the role of government in securing the welfare of the entire community. That's why Rabbi Hanina, even though he lived under harsh Roman rule, still advised, pray for the welfare of the government. The oldest version of the prayer we include each Sabbath in synagogues is found in the prayer book of David of Bordaham, who lived in Seville in the 14th century, a golden age of Muslim Christian Jewish interchange. Now, the prayer changed over the years, particularly in the United States, where prayer for the king was replaced with a prayer for our elected leaders. These weekly prayers make us mindful of the government's importance to all of our well being. Let me conclude then with a threefold prayer for our, our contemporary prayer book. O oh God, grant our leaders wisdom and forbearance. Help each of us to appreciate one another and respect the many different ways that we serve you. May our homes be safe from affliction and strife and our country sound in body and soul. And let us say together, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Supervisor Chavez, thank you very much for picking Melanie. Rabbi, it was great seeing you. Thank you very much for all you've done for decades and decades. I really, really appreciate it on behalf of uh, all our communities. Thank you very much. All right, we now go to item number four, which is the uh, announcing adjournments in memoriam. I don't see any specific from supervisors. I'm checking across already. Move on to item number five, commendations and proclamations. The first will be by Supervisor Lee. The second will be by Supervisor Ellenberg. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Good morning. Well, in the month of April, the Donor Network West Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and the Santa Clara County Medical Examiner's Office are coordinating with our office to proclaim April as a National Donate Life Month in Santa Clara County. Today, we have Sandy Andrada, Regional Director from the Donor Network West, to represent three organizations and the rest of the members are observing on the public link. We have Brittany Gann from the Donor Network West, from Santa Clara 
Valley Medical Center, we have our own Paul Lorenz, Dr. John Weiner, Joe Sproul, Eileen Hoover, and Loretta Regan. And from Santa Clara County Medical Examiner's Office, we have Dr. Michelle Jordan and Rosa Vega. More than 1,500 individuals in Santa Clara County are currently on the National Organ Transplant Waiting List, and 22 patients die each day due to the shortage of donated organs. The Donor Network West serves as the federally designated organ procurement organization in Northern and Central California and Northern Nevada, and works in close partnership with families, doctors, nurses, and coroners in hospitals to connect donors to recipients. Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Hospital and Clinics provides high quality, compassionate, and accessible healthcare for all persons in Santa Clara County, regardless of the socioeconomic status and the ability to pay, and in collaboration with the Donor Network West, works in partnership to save and heal lives in our community through donation. Organ tissue are life-giving acts recognized worldwide as expressions of compassion to those in need that save thousands of lives each year. So the need for donated organs, especially urgent in Hispanic, Latino, uh, Latinx, Asian, and African-American communities. A single individual's donation of the heart, lung, liver, kidneys, pancreas, and small intestine can save up to eight lives. Donation of tissue can save and heal the lives of up to 75 others. Over 15 million Californians have signed up with the state authorized Donate Life California Registry to ensure the wishes to be organs and tissues donors be honored. And whereas, uh, here's the uh, proclamation I want to show everybody. And let's see if I could show it. Uh, hmm, I think the background doesn't make it uh, easy. Let me try something else here. How about this? I think that works better. So I'm just gonna read out. Um, whereas, California residents can sign up with the Donate Life California Donor Registry when applying or renewing the driver's license or ID cards at the California Department of Motor Vehicles. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara does hereby recognize and proclaim the month of April 2021 as National Donate Life Month in Santa Clara County, and in doing so, encourage all Californians to check yes when applying for renewing the driver's license or ID card or by signing up at donornetworkwest.org. Congratulations. Here it is. I will get those sent to you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you. Uh, before I begin, I just want to quickly thank Supervisor Lee for um, for lifting up this this issue. I've had a um, donor sticker on my driver's license since I had a license. Um, and have also become a, added myself to the bone marrow registry, which I would also include people to encourage people to look into. And that one, of course, um, you don't have to be. Uh, you can continue to live <laughs> once you have donated that. Anyway, that's the end of the PSA. And thanks, uh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, moving into uh, my com uh, commendation today. Over the past year, health disparities and systemic racism have been front and center in our national conversation. But the glaring disparities in maternal and infant health for our African and African ancestry community has persisted for generations. We need to elevate the issue, confront systemic racism that drives the disparity, and engage with our partners to close these gaps. We are very fortunate to have programs such as the county's Black Infant Health Program and the Roots Families First Program in Santa Clara County to support our pregnant and parenting residents. And I am very proud to present this proclamation today to Alma Burrell, Associate Director of the Roots Community Clinic, Rhonda McClinton Brown, Director of the Public Health Department, Healthy Communities Branch, and Camilla Davis, Coordinator of the Prenatal Equity Initiative. I am so grateful for the leadership of these women in raising awareness of the crisis, providing culturally congruent care, and advocating on behalf of all parents and babies in our community. It is with appreciation for the work already done and also with urgency to undertake additional work necessary to end this disparity 
that I proclaim April 11th through 17th as Black Maternal Health Week. I wanna read the proclamation so that the public can hear it and then invite our guests, Alma Burrell and Camilla Davis to say a few words. Whereas babies born to Black women die at three times the rate of other babies in all populations within the first year of life, and Black women die in childbirth at four times the rate of other women in all populations. And these health disparities persist regardless of education and income. Whereas research has identified that root causes of these disparities include maternal stress caused by experiencing racism, discriminatory, discriminatory practices in healthcare settings, and other unjust social and economic barriers. Whereas four years ago, the Black Mamas Matter Alliance established Black Maternal Health Week to promote awareness, activism, and community building to deepen the national conversation about Black maternal health and reproductive justice in the United States. Whereas the Santa Clara County Black Infant Health Program, the Perinatal Equity Initiative, the Roots Community Health Center, and other healthcare providers and community-based organizations in Santa Clara County continue to work to reduce disparities in Black maternal and infant health and to deliver programs and supports that are grounded in evidence, community, and culture for African and African ancestry residents and the County of Santa Clara has established a race and health disparities initiative and has declared racism a public health crisis. And whereas ending unacceptable disparities in black maternal and infant health requires both centering the voices and lived experience of black birthing people, families and stakeholders in the conversation and engaging broader health system partners and allies to listen and act. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara in recognition of the above does hereby proclaim April 11th through April 17th, 2021 as the fourth annual Black Maternal Health Week. Alma, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Ladies. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you this morning. And I wanna say that I have personally experienced um, pro poor birth outcomes in my own family with my daughter having lost uh, two children and my daughter-in-law having lost children. Um, during the birthing experience and my own self having some mater serious maternal complications during uh, birth. So this, this matter is near and dear to me. And I will say that uh, this proclamation announcing Black Maternal Health Week shines a light on the tragic birth outcomes experienced by mothers of African ancestry in this county. And here locally, I mean, in this country and also here locally in our own county. The facts are that our black babies right here in Santa Clara County are dying at three times the rate of other babies in their first year of life. Not only that, African ancestry, maternal morbidity, morbidity and mortality are disproportionate when compared to other groups. The good news is that scientists and journalists are bringing these sad facts to the forefront, thus allowing policymakers, community-based organizations, community clinics, concerned citizens, and advocates opportunities to work towards improving birth outcomes for moms and babies. History tells us that there was a time when the infant mortality disparity among our communities was almost negligible here in the United States. According to a 1989 journal article written by Kenneth Che and Michael Greenstone, the narrow time period between 1965 and 1970 is the only time in US history that the infant mortality rate for black babies declined sharply and stabilized nearly on par with white babies. During that time period, death among black infants in their first year of life fell by 30%. The infant mortality rate for black babies held at 2.8 per 100 births and the ratio between black and white infant mortality was at 1.6. Experts say that infant mortality is an important indicator of a community's overall physical health. That being said, 1965 through 1970 was the healthiest time in the U.S. history for people of African ancestry. And today the indicators are that the overall health 
of our community is very poor. I suggest that we examine that time period to determine the factors that contributed toward these health improvements for families and that we endeavor to replicate what, what worked. I've committed my professional career to imp towards improving birth outcomes and I am thrilled that Supervisor Ellenberg has taken this to heart and that, um, and that um, she has made contributing toward the solution to heal this problem a primary focus. I'm honored to work alongside her and my colleagues toward eliminating this disparity. Solutions to this problem take fortitude, determination, and focus, all of which we commit to without hesitation. Thank you. Thank you. Camilla, did you want to say a few words? Yeah, thank you. Greetings and good morning um, to the Board of Supervisors. And thank you again so much, Supervisor Ellenberg, for um, leading this proclamation. So my name is Camila Davis Monroe. I'm a program coordinator for the Perinatal Equity Initiative, and I'm here to share some words on behalf of our public health department, Black Infant Health Program, um, and also Perinatal Equity Initiative. I want to begin my statement by acknowledging the current staff of our Black Infant Health Program and the work that Black Infant Health has been doing in this county since 1991 to support Black pregnant women and their infants in navigating healthcare systems that weren't designed for us. As a former program participant, I can honestly say that the education, the support, and the affirmation they provide is life-changing. So the work is being done, but there's still little public knowledge of our nation's Black maternal health crisis, which is why this proclamation is so important. 30 years later, the statistics have changed very little, um, except for that time period, um, or I mean, that was before. Okay. <laughs> and I didn't know that, Sister Alma, about the 1965-1970. So as previously stated, Black mothers and babies are dying at rates that dwarf those of white, Latina, and Asian mothers. And this crisis is not one caused by socioeconomic, lack of resources, or education, which has been said already, um, which are all well-known determinants of health, but by racism. Plainly put, the health and well-being of the Black mother is threatened by chronic stress, institutional barriers, unequal access to appropriate and quality medical care, and no matter how much money or education, and no matter how many resources or accolades, she may have, she is perceived as less than because of her blackness. And because of this, black mothers are dying and our babies are being born too early, too small or not at all. As a county, we have an amazing opportunity to become a model for other counties in addressing racial inequity in our healthcare system. We look forward to being a part of the ongoing discussion and partnering with the Board of Supervisors to make this happen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you both. That concludes item number five. We now move on to public comment, which is item number six, which is what I said a few minutes ago. Anybody wishing to speak at this time needs to electronically raise their hand. Um, I see four people right now. I see five. This is the opportunity for anyone who wishes to speak at this time about something that is not on today's agenda. If you want to speak about something on today's agenda, you need to speak at that time. All righty. David, let's go. I see five speakers. So let's just go with two minutes each. Start, okay. Start when you're ready. One moment, please, while we get the timer set. Yep. And once that is on screen, we'll begin. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Paul Soto, are you there? Hey, yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, supervisors. This is uh, Paul Soto uh, from the Horseshoe. Um, I'm glad that, this, that uh, the infant mortality rates was on the agenda today to be uh, at least acknowledged because John Steinbeck did a copious amount of work with the Santa Clara County Coroner's Office back in 1938 when he wrote Starvation Under the Orange Tree and Dubious Battle in California. And the reason why I'm here today is to, is to, caution, to caution our county and city and also to challenge my county and city. Because what is going to be happening with respect to the next five years, 
we are going to have our own trail of tears. Exactly what Andrew Jackson did with the Native Americans is precisely what is going to happen here. Absent some very bold, courageous, political, social, and economic changes, absent all three of those, that's what we're going to have, a trail of tears. And the racism that has infected, because that's what it is, the racism and white supremacy is an infection far more deadly than COVID. In fact, it was white supremacy that kept the COVID vaccines from the east side of San Jose. That's what kept it from it. That's how deadly it is. That's how insidious, that's how rooted, that's how institutionalized it is. And we're not confronting it. We're not looking at it dead in the eye and saying, you know what, we need to contend with this because what has befallen my Chinese brothers stems from Leland Stanford, Peter Burnett, because they were the co-authors of the Chinese Exclusionary Act. And Stanford University is sitting on all that wealth. They're our next speaker is Jennifer Santos. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Um, thank you, Board of Supervisors. Thank you, Supervisor Mike Wasserman and the rest of the supervisors. My name is Jennifer Santos, the Public Policy Coordinator for West Valley Community Services. I represent West Valley Community Services, a nonprofit community-based organization that serves individuals and families facing food and housing insecurities in the communities of Cupertino, Los Gatos, West San Jose, Saratoga, and Monto Serrano. Thank you, Board of Supervisors, for the support of this project, and as well as the county staff and the Office of Supportive Housing for all of the work on this project. WVCS fully supports the purchase of the property and the development of affordable housing. And some of the reasons why we think this location is ideal, it's because of it's near public transportation, near the highway. It's within walking distance of WVCS for supportive services such as our food pantry and other services within walking distance of public services such as supermarkets and shopping. We're excited by the support of this project that has garnered from the city council, Cupertino City Council and the interest in collaborating on a vision for affordable housing on that property. Affordable housing is very vital in our region and the basic necessities of life, especially housing. And thank you again. And I really appreciate with the previous speakers and I, I just wanted to highlight that and thank you for um, your time and educating the community with everything. And um, just wanna say thank you again for everything. And um, that's all. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next speaker is Pat Toombs. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, this is actually Larry Toombs. Thank you for allowing me to address the Board of Supervisors. I would like to speak regarding the upcoming RV ordinance and amendments that are scheduled to come to the Board on June 8, 2021. This legislation package was approved by the Planning Commission with a favorable recommendation. Can you speak a little bit louder? Uh, yeah, I can move a little closer. Thank you. Uh, this legislation package was approved by the Planning Commission with a favorable recommendation to the Board of Supervisors at the March 25th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Originally, we understood that this would be heard on May 25th, and now we understand it is not scheduled to be heard until June 8th. The over 15 families I am working with on this Orby ordinance and, and amendments would, would like it to be moved up to be considered by the Board of Supervisors at its May 2021 hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. I took the day off of uh, work today to focus more on predatory tow companies in Santa Clara County. I've been able to compile a lot of information over the last four or five years of digging into these uh, well, we won't use that type of colorful language today, but they really are dirty dogs. And they really prey on a lot of people that live in East Side San Jose. And it's not just the homeless, it's not just the mentally ill that are losing RVs and cars. It's people that are paycheck to paycheck that literally get their transportation yanked from out uh, from underneath them. These predatory tow companies park out in front of apartment complexes, they wait late at night, and they just tow, tow, tow. And when that vehicle ends up at either courtesy or motto's tow, 
they ended up taking all the belongings out and they just send the person in circles. They're very mean. They don't open the gates late at night and they're not following any state rules or guidelines. There's a proper way to do a lien sale and they've completely bypassed that. Um, the real sick thing that Mottos and Courtesy Tow are doing is they're reselling these motorhomes um, to homeless people knowing that they'll never get them running, knowing that they'll, they will re-impound that vehicle. So they sell it to them throughout a lien process, and then they're parked on the side of courtesy tow. And, and I've gotten to know some of the people out there because I'm really, really trying to film and document this. It's a disgusting thing to do to people. And this is happening in a lot of areas in Santa Clara County. Um, the San Jose Police Department doesn't even mark vehicles properly anymore. No marks on the tires, no pictures of anything. It's your word against theirs. This is the same way in many other cities. And I remember the good old days when you had a notice, when you had the tires chalked, when you had the ability to move your vehicle. And we don't do that anymore. And, and you guys really, really need to start looking into this because this is how a lot of people are ending up on the streets. So thank you. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Irvish, are you there? Me. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning to all the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara. I want to reach out uh, with regards to the President uh, Biden's administration plan for the American Rescue. Uh, President Biden recently signed a 1.9 trillion bill to provide the COVID-19 response in terms of a vaccination and as well as COVID-19 testing to be provided to the respective city, county, and as well as state. In order to provide the right set of a uh, vaccination from AstraZeneca, the Pfizer, as well as the Medic, uh, as well as the, the Moderna, President has provided a different set of uh, uh, guidelines and as well as, you know, in order to ensure the safety of the people including the first responder working with the COVID-19. It is also to ensure that, you know, as a part of our American Rescue Plan, the president has provided a different set of a guidelines to the relief of relief to Americans, safely reopening the schools, as well as how to, uh, how to access the direct relief with the 1,400 per person check plan, increasing the child tax credit, extend unemployment insurance, small business support, I request the County of Santa Clara to, to review the American Rescue Plan as well as applicability of the American Rescue Plan as per the state, county, and city jurisdiction and provide the right set of a guidelines and standard for the 1.9 trillion bill to be implemented to the County of Santa Clara. Thank you very much. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Board members will now move on to item number seven, which is approval of the consent calendar. David, will you please read out what we have? Uh, no requests were received for the consent calendar update, sir. Thank you very much. Board members, any of you wish to want to raise your hand virtually or in person? Supervisor Chavez, please go right ahead. Thank you very much. Um, for, for item 27, and this is relating to the March 22nd closed section, closed session meeting minutes. The minutes state that I was absent. I did attend that meeting. I was, I was uh, late because of another meeting. Um, on item 29, this is regarding the deletion of the three S, uh, social services uh, positions and adding two social work supervisor positions. I would like to request this item be deferred till our next meeting. I understand this was a result of VSIP. I understand, but I also know that the, um, the union and labor relations are still meeting and I'd like to give them an opportunity to come to concurrence. Um, item 44, this is the referral matrix and I understand the administration has taken off the referral from supervisor Ellenberg and myself related to the ESA audit. ESA indicated to my staff, they believe the item uh, is, should be closed based on agenda reports received and the request for a pilot program from supervisor Ellenberg and myself and responses to other questions like the one I posted about executive recruitment have not been answered. So what I would like to recommend is that, um, that, that we put these items to FGOC actually to have a, a discussion about them with, 
the with the staff to make sure that we looked carefully at those items and then determine whether or not they really should be removed from the matrix. And then um, there's another issue. Yeah, well, anyway, I, I, I think if we could start there, that would be that would be ideal. Supervisor Chavez, excuse me, I'm taking notes and I didn't fully understand what item you said do what with. So on the item 44, uh -huh. this is the matrix from the administration that tracks all of our referrals. Yes. And one of them that was removed was ESAs um, that it had been completed. And Supervisor Allenberg and I had two requests on that. One was um, that we're auditing the the um, auditing ESA for best practices, and the other was how we were doing executive recruitment. And rather than um, today, where no one's prepared to have a discussion about what you know, from, from everybody's perspective, what should and shouldn't be on the referral. What I'm gonna, what I'm asking is that the, that this discussion about why these were completed or not occur at FGOC so that we can dive a little deeper into why SCA, ESA believes these were completed versus why I frankly don't. So your ask is to remove that part of item 44, which says receive monthly status report on items and refer it to FTOC? Just the particular removal of the ESA component. Got it, understood, thank you. Thank you. Anything else for you, Supervisor? No, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other supervisors that wish any other comment? Otherwise, I have one disclosure I need to make. I don't see any other hands. I do see a hand just went up. I just want to express support. So I just want to express support for um, supervisors, Supervisor Chavez's uh, request to look more closely at why the ESA recommendation has come off of the uh, consent calendar, uh, has come off of the board items calendar. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't see any more from Supervisor Simidian or Supervisor Lee. I'll chime in with a couple of things. One, I want to thank my fellow staff members and staff in general for putting things on consent whenever appropriate and having things um, on the non-consent item whenever appropriate, that helps us expedite the meetings. It was interesting, I found out that the top 12 to 15 people in our county that put all this together spend 41% of their working hours putting together the agenda and attending the meeting. And I think everything we can do to help free them up um, the better for our county as a whole. So I thank all of you for your efficiency. Um, I will also disclose on item 48, David, I need to recuse myself because of my financial interest in Facebook. We'll note that in the minutes, sir. Thank you very much. And I see we have one speaker for the consent items. That speaker shall have two minutes. Okay, our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Scott Larkin. Uh, the item on the consent calendar uh, that I would like to discuss is item number 48. Uh, I do appreciate you, uh, Mike, recusing yourself uh, properly on these items, including some of the other ones, uh, banks that you own stock in. Um, over the years, I was really concerned that other supervisors were not doing the right thing. It seems like everybody is kind of trying to do that now. Um, grants and donations and things like this from large companies like Facebook and Wells Fargo, um, that just kind of gets a little scary. And I don't know if the public's really aware, these big dogs right here, when we have problems with them with our county, like Facebook, Wells Fargo, um, it seems like there would be a conflict of interest. We are actually, you know, processing cases that our county is involved with, with Facebook and Wells Fargo. So these donations seem kind of shady. Um, I guess I could just leave it at that. Um, you, you, you know, we, we, let me actually, you know what, I'm going to open up a little more about this. When we got in a little trouble in a way with problems with Wells Fargo, we suspended it for several years as far as investing with them but we continue to let them handle everything involving uh, child support services, which I considered very shady. And then we got back in bed with them. 
the things with Facebook right now, the public's having a lot of problems with them. Um, you know, the way they're kind of tapping into people's accounts and, and, and providing advertisement you never even asked for. And, and, and I kind of, you know, am, am very worried about that company. And it seems like with these donations that we might turn a blind eye to their bad behavior. And we did that with Wells Fargo and we do that with a lot of other companies here in Santa Clara County. Um, I think we need to cut some of these people off when they do bad things. So thank you. Our next speaker is Neil Park McClintic. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I think I meant to comment on item eight. Okay, that'll be next. We'll All right. Look. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna lower Thank my you. <laughs> we'll mute you. Thank you. That concludes our public speakers. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. So I don't see any other hands from my board, fellow board members. Dave, would you please take a roll call vote? And we're going to note that uh, on item 27, Supervisor Chavez was present. On item number 29, it's being deferred. And on item 44, the issues dealing with ESA are being um, taken out and being forwarded to FGOC for further discussion. I, oh, and then I recused myself on 48. Did I cover those, David? Yes, I believe so. Thank you, sir. With that, if you'll please take a roll call. Excuse me, we need a motion. I'll move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Thank you. Motion by Chavez, second by Ellenberg. Any further discussion, board members? Hearing none, David, roll call, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to item number eight, was, which was to be heard no sooner than 10 a.m. And it's 10.09, so that qualifies. And I believe Consuelo and Jeff. Who do we, I see Consuelo. Consuelo, excuse me. And uh, Consuelo, why don't you open it up and then we'll hear from speakers and then board members. Good morning. Thank you, Board President Wasserman. Consuelo Hernandez, Director with the Office of Supportive Housing. The recommended action today is to open the public hearing and consider the acquisition of the property. We have no formal presentation, but happy to answer questions from the board. Thank you. We'll consider the uh, item eight opened and thank you for um, what you just said. Now we will turn to speakers. Anyone wishing to speak on this item from the public, please raise your hand electronically. Do, 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 do. All righty. And let's go to one minute each, David. All right, one moment, please, while we set the timer. Thank you. Our next speaker is Connie Cunningham. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, thank you. My name is Connie Cunningham. I am uh, from Cupertino. I'm currently on the Housing Commission, but speaking on for my own behalf this morning. Good morning to you all. And I'm very excited um, from Cupertino to welcome this particular um, of housing possibility in our neighborhood. Um, I'm excited because it's in a very good location with access to services and transit. And I think it is a valuable um, asset to our community by providing affordable housing which we do not have as much as we need, very much like other cities. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Connie. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I Really, I, I, I hope I heard that wrong, that Cupertino is going to avail itself of this type of housing. Okay, and yet, out of your out of your mouths, in your contracts, in your public rhetoric, you talk about equity. There is absolutely nothing equitable about that allocation. Let me give you an example. When when that Measure A money got funded, the very first project, very first one, okay, and what the selling point was selling that idea to the population to assist the homeless. The very first project, it went up in Cupertino and it was a 19 unit uh, housing for seniors. That's what it was. And so 
they wanted it to be for seniors because now who can argue against that, right? Who can who can morally object to that? This is this is getting like sickening to mouth equity in one minute and then do the exact opposite the next. Our next speaker is J.R. Fruin. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, members of the board. My name is J.R. Fruin. I am a Cupertino resident and I'm a policy director for Cupertino for All. I'm here this morning to urge your support of the acquisition of this parcel. Cupertino is woefully behind on um, all of its uh, arena production, but in particular on its uh, very low income and low income production. It has the worst jobs housing fit ratio in the entire Bay Area. Um, so I urge your uh, acquisition of this property and that you construct as many units as you can possibly put there. We need them. Um, we are only at 5% of our very low um, uh, arena production. That is all from the aforementioned uh, veranda project, 19 units and zero of our low income. So you can see the problem here. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Neil Park McClintock. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, board and chair. Sorry, I uh, spoke on the wrong item first. Um, so I'm here representing Cupertino for All as the chair. Uh, we're a progressive coalition made up of longtime residents, displaced residents, students, parents, homeowners, renters, and our allies. And we're here to support um, the acquisition of the land that is currently Outback Steakhouse. This is a really exciting potential project for us. Uh, it actually gives us a project to advocate for because there hasn't been a lot of um, affordable housing development in Cupertino, unfortunately, as, as JR just mentioned. And the consequences have been pretty extreme. I mean, we're about to vote on a special election for a ballot measure to bail out our schools in one of the wealthiest school districts in the state which is just a testament to how much we've been bleeding in terms of working class and middle class families. We don't have them anymore. Um, so please help us out. Uh, let's build this partnership between the county and the city. And this will be awesome. Thanks. Our next speaker is Rod Sinks. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much, supervisors. I. Uh... I, I too uh, live in Cupertino. I'm a former mayor. I was delighted to support um, Measure A uh, 2016 uh, under the leadership of Cindy Chavez and all of you. And um, we are excited in Cupertino to have an opportunity to, uh, for the county to make an investment in our city. We will bring the social capital of our uh, community uh, to the table to help uh, create with you whatever project uh, we we together uh, can dream and design. It's uh, it's critical to our community. I think we know that we have a lot of folks here who have become unhoused uh, over the last um, uh, years, especially this last year. And we really appreciate your support. A special shout out to Consuelo Hernandez, her team, Casey, and the whole real estate team for making this happen queuing up this. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alexander Espinosa Pieb. Forgive me if I mispronounced your last name. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, good morning. I just wanted to echo support uh, for the acquisition of this land for Cupertino. Um, I grew up here uh, in Cupertino and uh, personally, when I think of what an unlivable community or an unlivable uh, city is, I don't think of places with uh, high crime. I don't think of places with that in infrastructure. I first think of places like my hometown, uh, which by all accounts, people, most people would say is a nice place to live, but um, has become just so unaffordable and inaccessible that uh, it is unlivable because no one can live here. Uh, including the very people who serve our city, who work here, uh, and uh, who are just trying to make a living. Uh, so this is a very exciting opportunity, and I would very much hope that uh, we can acquire this land. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is a phone number ending in 697. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Phone number ending in 697. I'm going to ask you to unmute one more time. 
they have dropped off. Our next speaker is Connie Cunningham. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Oh, good morning. Uh, this is Connie Cunningham, and I did speak a little bit earlier, so I won't take the whole minute. I'll just repeat that I very much support this uh, project of collaboration with Cupertino and the county. Thank you. Our next speaker is Danelle Rudd. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, good morning. Thank you for um, hearing me today. I am a Cupertino resident, a parent and educator, and I'm calling in support of this project for low income housing in Cupertino. We are um, extremely limited in income, I'm sorry, low income housing opportunities here, and we need this housing project to be more inclusive and to provide housing for our community. We so badly need it. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Jennifer Santos. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, hello. I spoke earlier again, um, but I just wanted to reiterate that um, West Valley Community Services is, is full is in full support of the purchase of this property, and just want to thank the Office of Supportive Housing again and the county for this project. And um, Supervisor Mike Wasserman, thank you for everything, and we just really appreciate this and are in full support of this. And um, just thanks for all your hard work with this, because I know there's there's a lot that comes with this project and. Um, this project is ideal because of the public transportation. It's close to the services that we offer here at West Valley Community Services. And it's just exciting. And I'm super um, glad to hear about everyone supporting on this project. Thank you again for um, this opportunity. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to mention to uh, all the uh, Board of Supervisors that in 2019, the in 2016, the major A was supported by the Santa Clara County and provided the 950 million affordable housing bond, which is going to be providing the city's residents uh, with the affordable housing and supportive housing. Also, the proposition two funding, you know, that is available for the county of Santa Clara to apply to its partner to utilize the bonds fund projected towards 120 new affordable housing that is coming up over, as well as for the city of Cooper in a fiscal year 2019, there were 20 notice of funding availability were provided. So certainly as a part of the project for providing the uh, supportive housing solutions for the homelessness, this project you know, certainly be, uh, would require to be implemented. And as well as you know, more funding availability you know, should be provided to the city by the county. So such, such project uh, be, be prospered by the city and as well as, uh, as, well as the other residents to provide the, uh, the supportive housing to the homelessness. Thank you. Our next speaker is Connie Cunningham. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I appear to be having problems with my raising and lowering of my hands. I apologize. I absolutely support <laughs> this. And so I will I will just say uh, in, a, in agreement that West Valley Community Services is nearby there and it's an excellent location. Sorry about my hand. <laughs> that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much, David. With that, I am going to close the public hearing portion and turn to Supervisor Smitty. Move approval. I was. Oh, sorry, Mike. That's that's no that that's all right. Second by Supervisor Chavez. Any further discussion by board members? Supervisor Chavez, and then Supervisor I just, Lee. I just wanted to say um, to Consuelo's team that yeah. real quick moving and could work with the community. So thank you for both of those. Thank you. And Supervisor Lee, you had your hand raised? Yes, thank you, uh, <clears throat> President Wasserman. Uh, yes, uh, echoing the sentiment of uh, thanking the Office of Support Housing and Consuelo's leadership to make this happen. Uh, our affordable housing, especially in the west side of Cupertino, is certainly extremely lacking with the arena numbers that we have seen. Uh, I was at the opening of the 19 units of the first measure funds uh, being used for uh, this affordable housing in Cupertino. It was a great project. The only problem is it's too small. And uh, this is certainly a continuation of it. And I really look forward to having more of these being built at higher density so that we could uh, get more folks uh, into a wonderful neighborhood. Uh, and uh, this is exactly what we need. And thank you so much for your good work. Thank you. And that concludes it. So we have motion by Simidian, second by Chavez. David, if you'll take a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. 
Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. And Consuelo, fabulous job to you and, and all that uh, you work with. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're Supervisor, now going to move on to- Supervisor President Wasserman, I just wanted to say one other thank you, and that was to Rod Deer, I mean, uh, Rod Sinks too. I mean, really on the job. So thank you. Yes, Mr. Mayor Sinks has that going in the Rotary Club and a lot of other things happening. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, with that, we will move on to item number nine. Should we just flip that page over. Uh, public agency zoning ordinance amendments. And we're tur turning to our director of the Department of Planning and Development, Jacqueline Onciano. Nice to see you, Jacqueline. Good morning, President Wasserman, board members, Jacqueline Onciano, director of planning and development. The item before you, as stated, is an amendment to section C12300 of the County of Santa Clara's code and section 1.20. 0 0.070 of Appendix I of the zoning. And Jacqueline, I'm going to interrupt you for one second, David. We're going to officially open the public hearing and receive testimony, including from staff. Thank you. Do I continue or no? Please. Oh, yes. Okay. We have two staff. Um, Lisa McKyle, our principal planner, is um, with us today to present, and Joanna Wilk, associate planner, and they are prepared to present this item. Thank you. Joanna and Lisa. Good morning. Uh, please give me one moment while I share my screen and sure. get the presentation ready. And anyone wishing to speak on this item, please raise your hand electronically and we'll recognize you just as soon as this presentation is over. Okay. So thank you, President Wasserman and good morning, honorable members of the board. My name is Joanna Wilk, Associate Planner with the Department of Planning and Development. We're going to give you a presentation on agenda item number nine, the department's proposed amendments to the county ordinance code and zoning ordinance regarding public agency projects. By way of background, the county of Santa Clara has a variety of projects and they can be located within the unincorporated areas and within cities. County projects within cities are not subject to that city's zoning ordinance pursuant to government code 53090. However, county projects located within unincorporated areas are subject to the county zoning ordinance unless specifically exempted by the board as stated in section 120.070B of the zoning ordinance. In order to make the permitting process for county projects equitable across all types of jurisdictions and to provide clarity to the public agencies regarding the appropriate permitting process, the department proposes to revise language in section 120.070B and exempt county projects from the zoning ordinance unless the board decides to subject a specific project to the zoning ordinance through the contract review process. The department would like to note that county projects will continue to require building permit review with the county. They are subject to the county's grading ordinance and they will also continue to perform their own CEQA review, which is required by law in section 15002B of the CEQA guidelines. Additionally, pursuant to state law, the planning department will review the ongoing list of county projects on an annual basis to ensure they conform with the county's general plan policies. So not only has the department run into permitting uncertainties with the county projects, but also with other local agency projects such as Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District or MIDPEN and the Open Space Authority. These local agencies typically come to the county with projects that are low impact recreational uses such as trailheads with parking lots and ranger outposts. Yet the county zoning ordinance does not identify these types of uses or specify an appropriate permitting process. So because these uses are generally low impact and they do conform with the subject properties underlying general plan designation, the department proposes to exempt these types of uses by modifying language in section 120.070B. However, if the local agency is proposing a higher intensity use, such as a commercial stable, education center, or something similar, then the zoning ordinance and appropriate permitting process would apply. The local agency may request that that high intensity project be exempt from the zoning ordinance 
but that exemption must be approved by the board. The department would like to note that these agencies, just like county agencies, require building permit review from the county, are subject to the county's grading ordinance, and are required to conduct their own CEQA review. County and local agency projects sometimes involve construction of residences. These residences can be used for employees who perform land management or are general caretaker units. Typically, these types of residential projects would require building site approval pursuant to Ordinance Code Section C-12300. Yet in the spirit of streamlining the permitting process for agencies who are subject to the building <coughs> permit review, perform their own CEQA, the department proposes to modify the ordinance language to exempt the public agencies from this site approval process. Staff brought the proposed amendments to the San Martin Planning Advisory Committee on February 24th. The committee moved to make a favorable recommendation to the Planning Commission that the amendments are exempt from CEQA and to amend the ordinance code and zoning ordinance relating to these public agency projects. The department also brought the amendments to the Planning Commission who also forwarded a favorable recommendation to the board that the amendments are exempt from CEQA and to amend the county ordinance code and zoning ordinance relating to these projects. Lastly, the amendments were presented to the Airport Land Use Commission on March 24th. The commission found the amendments consistent with the comprehensive land use plan and made a suggestion to include language in the zoning ordinance that county and local agency projects within the airport influence area remain subject to zoning ordinance regulations. In order to make an amendment to the county zoning ordinance, the amendment must meet the finding listed on the slide and in section 575040. The department was able to make this finding because the proposed amendments make the regulations clearer, more effective, more efficient, and minimize confusion with public agencies and planning staff. The proposed amendments will also maintain consistency with state and federal law, and they do not conflict with the general purpose of the zoning ordinance. In conclusion, staff recommends the board amend section C-12300 of the County of Santa Clara Ordinance Code and amend section 120070 of the zoning ordinance code relating to county and other local agency projects. So this concludes staff's uh, presentation. Thank the you. following staff is available to answer any questions that you may have. We also have representatives from the Fleets and Facility and Parks Department uh, if the board has questions regarding uh, their processes for county projects. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, very clear. With that, Dave, we're gonna turn to public speakers. They'll have two minutes each. Okay, one moment while we set the timer, please. Thank you. Uh, two minutes each, you said? Yes. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is Donna Plunkett. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, good morning, members of the Board of Supervisors and the public. My name is Donna Plunkett, Planning Manager at the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. We appreciate the opportunity to speak today on item number nine, amendments to section C12-300 of the County of Santa Clara Code regarding county and other public agency projects. We enthusiastically support the staff report and recommendations and respectfully request that the Board of Supervisors vote in favor to approve these amendments. We at the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority and Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District have been working closely together with county planning staff share the work of our agencies and all the ways that this proposed amendment is consistent with other sections of the county code, county general plan, and other county guiding documents regarding recreational uses. We want to wholeheartedly thank the planning staff for their work to bring this forward for your review. We greatly appreciate uh, the attention to this item at this time when county staff are additionally stretched thin. We would like to respectfully request that the uh, board um, approves these amendments and, and as expeditiously as possible. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alice Kaufman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, President Wasserman and supervisors. Alice Kaufman speaking for Green Foothills. 
Um, Green Fidels, we are in support of the, uh, the, the portion of the proposed amendments that would apply to the open space districts. Um, but we have, uh, I, I have a concern about uh, the scope of the proposed amendments as they apply to all of the county owned or leased parcels. Um, I'd be concerned that this could potentially allow inappropriate uses, for example, commercial or industrial uses in agricultural or hillside areas. Um, there's a reason that we have a zoning code and we don't just rely on CEQA alone. There are considerations of appropriateness of use type that don't always rise to the level of significant environmental impacts under CEQA, but that could nevertheless impact, for example, the neighbors with noise or traffic or whatever. Um, also, zoning restrictions are prescriptive. They require that changes in use go through a process up front, whereas CEQA only kicks in after the process has been initiated. So if you've got an inappropriate use that shouldn't be happening, it makes sense to ask the question up front whether this is something that you even want to do rather than going through all of the trouble and expense of the CEQA analysis. So it's just, it's just not clear to me why the proposed amendments would exempt all county owned or leased parcels from the zoning code. I think that it would make sense if, this, if it was limited in the same way that these exemptions are being limited for the open space districts. That seems like an appropriate step to take. Um, then those are my comments. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Luna. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Sharon, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to comment. Um, when I first read what these zoning ordinance changes were implying, I did not think that there was a concern for the unincorporated San Martin areas. Um, however, I started to do some research on why there was a need to change this ordinance. The word county is stated as is local agency, so why the change to add development unincorporated county? I started to view some of the upcoming projects, capital and non-capital, and thought the unincorporated areas have a lot of county land, and if unincorporated is included, this may lead to future concerns. This change could allow the Board of Supervisors to possibly not adhering to zoning ordinance for projects that normally would require CECRA and adherence to zoning ordinance. In the unincorporated areas of San Martin um, and other areas, we have the Coyote Project, we have the San Martin Airport Project, RV parks, and perhaps other pro other projects that the public is not privy to at this time. I would request that you really look at considering what this ordinance would mean, and I'd like to point out at the SIMPAC meeting, it was stated uh, by one of the committee members that uh, it seems that there's two separate um, ways of doing business, one for the county and one for the public. And so I would like you to really consider what this ordinance change could mean. Um, in our area, we're not, we realize that growth is intimate in our area. Um, last year, the uh, planning department presented a plan for San Martin um, from one of the universities and um, it was an excellent plan. So I would like you to consider this uh, zoning ordinance. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, hi, uh, Paul Soto. We have not, as a collective, as a society, as Californios, as Americans, as Chicanos, in all those roles, we have not confronted the historical injustices that stem from what Peter Burnett did to the Native American populations and all the injustices that have continued to flow and that the Chicano has no point of rest, no point of peace, no point of there being a vindication, a rectification, a, a, a reconciliation and the reckoning of all of that. The land that you govern right now, that you sit as the as 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 a, as a leader in this community, was founded on the cutting off decapitations in this city between 1849 and 1852. They were cutting off Native Americans' heads. You got five dollars for the head, and you got 25 cents for the scalp. 
That's what this is predicated upon. Then from there flowed Burnett and Leland Stanford. Leland Stanford eventually coming governor. What he, both of them did, along with Judge Lawrence Archer, who was a, who was a founding, he, he settled here, and he was a uh, extremely prominent judge. He married Lewis Kelly, who Kelly Park after. So there has never been a point of, of, of reckoning with the savage brutality that created this area in the first place. And for any of these policies and any of these amendments, without keeping those uppermost in mind, that history, there is absolutely no legitimacy to any of the amendments that you make. I'll give you an example. Uh, do you, does slavery still exist in the United States? Everybody will say no. That's false. The 13th Amendment has an exception clause. Slavery is still legal in the United States. We really need to tell the truth. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much again to all the Board of Supervisors. I wanted to uh, mention about the, the general plan, uh, the plan update for uh, for the ordinance for the County of Santa Clara. As, uh, as, as zoning code changes to, to address the, uh, to address some of the concerns which relates to the overcrowding as well as the replacing the term board, boarding house to the zoning code and more precisely creating the limits for the individuals to occupy the residence. Those are some of the concerns are really important in updating the zoning also, and it is important to, uh, to measure what are the habitable areas in the form of any residence that has been created uh, it, and updating the zoning codes. Uh, the uh, specifically with the, uh, with the community development, uh, the zoning code updates uh, updates are very important. Also, other than that, uh, some of the uh, some of the senior centers, uh, commercialized properties, industrialization industrialization areas. Those are some of the concepts uh, to be uh, to be included in terms of uh, applying the enforcement for the zone uh, for the zone update, and as well as you know making sure about that that when any zoning uh, zoning code changes or updates are being made. It is being communicated to the community in a work well manner where any uh, any ordinances applicability that is going to be applied to the a specific neighborhood or a community or a senior center or a commercialized area or a, or a land use area they have to be specifically updated with respect to the county uh, ordinances as, a, as well as the city's ordinance if the applicability will not be applied so would be the case, you know, where the ordinances would not reflect the right set of standards for the county to maintain, as well as the, for the city to maintain, because the county ordinances also sometimes take the precedence over the city, and so is the case with the city and vice versa. So it is important to take measures in updating the zoning codes for the county. Thank you very much. That concludes our public speakers. Thank you, Dave. And with that, we will officially close the public hearing. I will turn to my soups for any discussion or a motion. And what is being asked of us is the adoption of the text amendments as uh, stated in the staff report under recommended actions. Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for staff and or for county council. I wanna just uh, confirm <coughs> that the proposed zoning ordinance amendments apply only to the county or to local agencies, yes? Mr. Eastwood, Jacqueline, Joanna? Go ahead, Joanna. Correct. And looking at the actual language of the ordinance, uh, that it applies only to what are described as outdoor recreational activities. Is that also correct? When it comes to the local agency projects, the exemption, it only applies to those low intensity outdoor recreational uses. I believe that is correct. Thank you. But the exemption that's being proposed for our county is broader than that. Yes, it also applies to any other uh, activities. It's not limited to the outdoor recreation. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so uh, thank you. And then 
there is reference in the materials. I'm looking at packet page 32, um, page one of the memo from uh, Director Anciano says um, that the proposed zoning ordinance amendments will exempt land uses and development on lands owned or leased by the county or any district for which the Board of Supervisors acts as the governing body of the district, unless the board expressly subjects a specific parcel or parcels to the zoning ordinance. And I guess the question I would ask is, how would we know on anything other than the largest projects that there was a project anticipated for a property that might be the basis of some concern? In other words, I. I understand the point that's being made that we could exercise the authority of the board to subject a specific parcel to the zoning ordinance, but it's only likely to arise if there's a project in the works. And I guess the question is if, we, if we're not relying on the zoning for compatibility and consistency, how do we know that there's a project going forward? Do we? Sure, Supervisor, let me jump in on this. Um, the, the board, already as the governing body uh, acts on the projects themselves. So if you're doing a capital project, which is what we're really talking about, um, the project approvals, including, for example, the initiation of the RFP, for instance, the approval of the contract, uh, all of those provisions under the public contract code come before the board uh, on the board agenda for approval. So, um, you know, the I think the simplest way to put this proposal with respect to the county is the county is currently under state law fully exempt from all city zoning ordinances. And so when we do projects inside cities, this is a complete non-issue. And the intent of this provision is basically a cleanup from my perspective to uh, ensure that that's the same process for county projects in unincorporated areas as it is within cities. Thank you. The last question, I think, uh, well, I have a question and then a suggestion. Um, it, the same same page of the document, packet page 32, uh, indicates that in addition, the proposed zoning ordinance amendments will exempt land uses and developments by other local agencies that constitute outdoor recreation and are compatible with the natural environment. Who makes the determination that something is compatible with the natural environment? Sure. So in the zoning ordinance amendments, there is a description of the type of use that would be compatible with the natural environment. It states in 120.070 B2, it would consist of open space preserves, ranger outposts, trails, trailheads, related parking, restrooms, signage, and kiosks. If the proposal goes beyond that scope, staff would determine that it would be subject to the zoning ordinance. Ms. Wilk, um, I'm looking at the same language and, and I, I think that's a helpful and important reminder, but I'm, I'm looking at the language that also indicates that, um, that the assessment is as to whether something constitutes outdoor recreation is compatible with the outdoor, uh, excuse me, with the natural environment, including but not limited to. So uh, it's clear that it's not just the um, identified uses that I think uh, most folks would be pretty comfortable with saying, yeah, sure, that's a good fit. Uh, it's also these um, other uh, proposed or potential proposed uses that are in the including but not limited to category. So that's what's got me a little bit anxious and I'm trying to uh, determine who gets to make that call. Sure, so it's my understanding that the department would take a closer look at the proposal if it goes beyond that scope. Um, and then I would like to defer to either uh, planning manager Robert Eastwood or director Anciano to uh, further describe who would make the final call on whether that proposal would be subject to the zoning ordinance or not. Sure. Let me just uh, help the question along, Mr. Chairman, if I may, by giving a for instance uh, that's a little bit out there, but it'll perhaps uh, indicate why I asked the question. 
So someone comes along and says, you know, it'd be a great idea if we could have some outdoor concerts in a amphitheater that we might carve out of the side of the hill. We could use some really lovely rough hewn wood logs to uh, make benches and uh, carve out this outdoor amphitheater. And then we could have concerts with, you know, maybe four or 500 people, not a big rock concert kind of thing, but just, you know, four or 500 people coming into the facility on a regular basis. And all of a sudden I'm left wondering, uh, is that um, is that the kind of use that is or isn't exempt? And who who specifically makes that call? Is that the judgment of the uh, head of the planning department? Is it a planning commission judgment? Um, so that's the question, and that's the the kind of use that goes uh, beyond a, a, a ranger outpost or a trailhead uh, that I'm I'm starting to think is a slippery slope that I just want to be thoughtful about. Thank you. Any response to that? I, Joanna, I start. Rob, yeah, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, we, we would also consider that a slip place so supervisor submitting and the examples Joanna articulated. Uh, we are we identify them as passive recreation, trailheads, um, hiking, anything of any intensive nature would, of an assembly use or a, a use that would be a visitor center or, or something of more intensity. Uh, I, the department would not determine within that. Uh, within that qualification. Uh, but to answer your question, the, the decision will be made by the department director. Uh, and this, you know, this is typical with our zoning ordinance. We try and articulate as many uses as we can, but sometimes uh, there are, are uses that live around the edges and you need to determine the intent of the ordinance and the spirit of the ordinance. And, and does that use meet uh, to the best extent we try to articulate what we were trying to, to define. How would this apply to the county uh, fairgrounds, for example, as a county owned property where there have been discussions about some um, appreciably more um, significant uh, uses? Because uh, clearly uh, it would not be limited to the uh, relatively constrained list of uses under local agency. Uh, thank you for the clarity about the distinction between county lands and other local agency lands, but how would it apply in the case of the fairgrounds, for example? If I may, Jacqueline and Shano, Director of Planning Please. Development, the fairgrounds would be exempt and those projects that would come into question would be presented to the board um, through the administration. So we, we have currently operated in this way with the fairgrounds. We have not issued permits on those grounds. So um, the uses that might be proposed uh, with the ordinance uh, amendments would not have to be in compliance with the local, excuse me, with the zoning. Um, they would be exempt from zoning. And I think Mr. Williams was uh, reminding uh, me slash us uh, earlier that uh, we were already exempt from the zoning if we chose to be. Mr. Williams, did I get that right? Yes, not only are we already exempt if we choose to be, but we are by state law exempt for any project within a city. And so, you know, this is really, like I said, with respect to the county, a cleanup item, you know, for example, the VMC campus is unincorporated. Uh, we have a lot of projects there. Um, this is a cleanup item to address county uh, projects in unincorporated areas. Um, we, you know, to, to treat them on parity with county projects, for example, the government center, uh, which is in the city of San Jose and is categorically exempt from the San Jose zoning ordinance. Do we, through the chair, if I may, Mr. Wasserman, do yes. we have a, thank you, sir. We Do we have, Mr. Williams, do we have a, process in place or perhaps Ms. Anshano for uh, whoever is best uh, situated. Do we have a process in place that currently requires that when we have a project on county lands that is inconsistent with uh, the zoning that that's identified, that's called out? Uh, it, it seems to me it probably would be just on the natural, but I, I don't know if that's something that's in some way codified or required as we do our work. If I may, Jacqueline and Shano, we for the fairgrounds or for FAF projects, what we have is that when they 
prepare their list of projects, they bring them to the planning department and we comment on them. And so if there's any inconsistencies or any modifications, they bring their list to us for us to review and to comment on. So that's the process by which we work with fleet and facilities, FAF. Um, often the fairgrounds, well, the past practice with the fairgrounds most recently has been that um, they come to us uh, with their projects. And as uh, Mr. Williams said, this will, will clean that process up um, so that it's very clear to everyone um, as best we can um, how the process would work. But there is not a process in place to answer your question. All right. Mr. Chairman, um, one, one last question and then I'm prepared to offer a motion. Ms. Anshano, any reason we couldn't ask for a report back from staff at the Housing, Land Use, Environment and Transportation Committee prior to the end of calendar year 2022, meaning next calendar year, uh, as to the use and impact, if any, uh, uh, of the amendments, if they are passed? No reason, we, we would welcome that. Then, Mr. Chairman, I'm prepared to move the staff recommendation with two amendments. The first is direction to uh, bring uh, bring the item to um, bring a report back to to Hewlett prior to the end of 2022. And the second is that we direct uh, administration, including but not limited to planning staff, to um, explicitly identify uh, any projects as being inconsistent with the zoning ordinance that come to our board for uh, consideration, if in fact they are inconsistent with the applicable zoning. I just think that that will highlight uh, what, um, uh, what the situation is and then the board is in a better position to exercise its judgment about whether or not the inconsistency with the zoning ordinance uh, raises any concerns. Thank you. I'm happy to second that motion. Motion, Mr. Eastwood, I see your hand up. I, I just wanted to add, per State Government Code 65401, uh, the Planning Department reviews the capital improvement um, uh, projects each year that are proposed, and we, we submit that, that general plan conforms review to FAF, and that then is presented to the board. I just want to make sure. Thank you. And I, what I'm, what I'm shooting for, Mr. Chairman, is, uh, and Ms. Anshano, uh, and Mr. Eastwood, and Ms. Wilk et al., is a nice big uh, sentence in capital letters that says, hey, by the way, Board of Supervisors, this project is inconsistent with the uh, zoning ordinance, uh, period, so that we know that. And then if you want to go on to say, but we think that's fine because... Uh, or we think the issues that that might raise have been addressed because, great. But I do sort of want us to be fully informed and, and not just in the sense that, you know, we've dotted our I's and crossed our T's legally, but, you know, in a very real way, fully informed that, hey, we've made a judgment, somebody's made a judgment that uh, we are not complying with the, our own zoning and uh, that we think that's okay for, you know, some specific set of reasons. Thanks again. Mr. President, you are muted. Let me try. I don't know how that happened, but I'll repeat that very quickly. By saying Jacqueline and everyone, thank you very much for helping to bring our current practices into better alignment with our written policies. I think this was a needed cleanup and I agree with the two addendum that Supervisor Submitian provided, so I seconded the motion. Any other supervisors wishing to comment? Otherwise, we'll call for the question. Seeing no hands raised, David. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Submitian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. This now moves on to item number 10, which is the consider recommendation relating to a private initiated general plan 
amendment. What I plan on doing with this one, supervisors, is we're going to open with staff's presentation first, then the applicant, then the public, then the applicant's opportunity to rebut or comment, and then I'll turn to each of the supervisors. Thank you very much. Jacqueline. Good morning, supervisors. Um, Jacqueline Anshano. This is an item for general plan amendment process. We're before the board to receive direction as to how to proceed with the processing of this general plan amendment. Before us today to make the presentation is again, Joanna Wilk, supported by um, Lisa McKyle, Rob Eastwood, and myself. Ms. Wilk, if you would present, please. Thank you, Director Anciano. One moment while I share my screen. Thank you. And anyone wishing to speak on this item, please raise your hand electronically so the clerk and I can see that ahead of time. One moment, just wanna make sure I share the correct PowerPoint. Thank you for your patience. You betcha. Again, thank you, President Wasserman, and good morning. Again, Joanna Wilk, Associate Planner with the Department of Planning and Development, here to give you a presentation on agenda item number 10. It is a privately initiated general plan amendment application for two parcels addressed 21670. Chillingsburg Avenue. Staff would like to inform the board about the process for the privately initiated general plan amendment application. So first, the application must be submitted by April of any year. By May of that year, staff will evaluate the proposal and then bring it before the planning commission and then the board no earlier of September of that same year. In this instance, the proposal went before the Planning Commission in November of 2020 and is now before the board in April of 2021. As Director Anciano had mentioned, the purpose of bringing this application forward to the board is so that the members may provide a decision on whether or not the application should be accepted for processing. It is not an approval or denial of the designation change. Staff would like to note that the general plan amendment application may only be accepted for processing if the proposal is found to be substantially consistent with the goals and policies of the general plan in terms of the proposed uses, location, scale, and general nature. Now, if the application is accepted for processing, staff will perform an in-depth review of the proposal and bring it back to the board at a later date for their approval or denial of the designation change. So the subject properties are located in the southwestern portion of the county. They're surrounded by the city of San Jose, which is shown in green. The properties have an average slope of 13%, so they have some hillside topography to them. They are zoned agriculture, medium scale, and have a design review overlay. Their current general plan designation is Open Space Reserve, or OSR, and I'll go into the intent of that designation on the next slide. But I would also like to note that the parcels are within the cities of San Jose's urban growth boundary, which is shown in orange, and the entire neighborhood, all of the parcels shown on the screen are within the city's sphere of influence. The property's current designation, Open Space Reserve, is intended to preserve lands located contiguous to a city's urban service area until joint studies are performed with that affected jurisdiction, which in this case is the city of San Jose, in order to determine the long-term desired land use. As shown on the slide, the cluster of open space reserve properties are not immediately adjacent to the city's urban service area, and the city of San Jose has already designated this area as lower hillsides in their own general plan. So as such, the department finds that the intent of the open space reserve policies are not met for these particular parcels, and an alternative designation may be appropriate. 
Additionally, the open space reserve lands may only allow residential and agricultural uses. Commercial, industrial, or institutional uses are not permitted. So due to the restrictiveness of the open space reserve designation, the applicant proposes to the department to process one of two general plan amendment proposals. Option one shown on the screen consists of changing the open space reserve designation to rural residential to accommodate a nine lot subdivision. Staff reviewed the applicable general plan policies listed to the right of the screen and found that the change from OSR to RR is not consistent with the general plan. Option one would allow for an outward expansion of rural residential areas. Option one would not infill existing rural residential areas as those properties are not surrounded by rural residential properties on three or more sides. Option one would not preserve natural resources as rural residential lands are not a resource conservation designation such as agriculture, agriculture ranch lands or hillsides. And lastly, the subject parcels are not located in an area with an established small developed parcel size. The second proposal, which is staff's recommendation, is to propose a general plan amendment to change the open space reserve designation to hillsides. This would accommodate a commercial stable. Staff would like to note that the commercial stable would not be allowed until the use permit process is completed and obtained. Additionally, the hillside designation would not permit a subdivision based on the slope density lot size standard. Staff reviewed the applicable general plan policies again shown to the right of your screen and found that the hillside designation would fall in line with the county's resource conservation policies. Option two would preserve natural resources and minimize demand for additional public services and facilities. It would preserve the foothills and promote wise management of natural resources. On November 19th, 2020, the department took the proposed options to the Planning Commission. They heard the item and they forwarded a favorable recommendation to the board to accept for formal processing a privately initiated general plan amendment application to change the open space reserve designation to hillside. Additionally, the Planning Commission forwarded a, a recommendation to reject the privately initiated amendment application to change the designation from OSR to rural residential. So based on the analysis described in this presentation, staff recommends the board reject processing an application to change the subject properties from open space reserve to rural residential and accept the general plan amendment application to process an application to change the open space reserve designation to hillside. This concludes staff's presentation and staff is available if the board has any questions. Thank you. Mike, you're muted. I have no idea how that is happening. Huh. My hands are on my lap. Okay, thank you very much, Vice President. Um, David, the applicants will now have, and Joanna, I said, thank you very much for your presentation. I don't know if you heard that or not, but you get it twice. David, the applicants at this point will have five minutes to speak. That's five minutes in total, not five minutes per person. And the members of the public will have two minutes each to speak. And so we'll start with the applicants and the clock will be running. So okay. Mr. Yeah. President, just so you are aware, uh, we'll need just a second to switch the timer from five minutes to two minutes once the applicant is done. Yes, I realize I'm keeping you on your game today. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Whenever the applicant is ready. Hi, I'm, I'm ready. I just have a presentation. I'm wondering if I might be able to share my screen. Um, okay. Um, We won't be able to run the timer simultaneously, but I can keep a timer here uh, and keep that running. And 
Uh, Mr. President, if it's okay with you, I can I can chime in when it's at five minutes to let the applicant know the time is up. Bill, will, will they get five minutes total? When it's down to one minute, please let them know they have one minute remaining. I can do that. Thank you. Okay, um, one moment, please, and we'll start the timer. So um, if the applicant is ready, we'll start the five minutes now. This is Ms. Griswold. Good morning, um, my name is Melanie Griswold and I'm assisting uh, the owner in the application to redesignate two parcels of land from open space reserve to either rural residential or hillside. So thank you for the opportunity to address you. And even though we disagree in part with the staff recommendation, we appreciate and thank staff for its efforts in bringing this project to the board. I'd like to discuss the history of the project in the surrounding area first as this is critical to determining what is the land use designation that best fits with the neighborhood and is most consistent with the land use policies at issue here. So the history of the property is that it has been used as a commercial horse stable for at least the last 30 years. The owner bought the property as a horse facility in 2015, not as a speculative investment. Uh, but in 2019, the county moved to shut down the horse facility as part of a grading enforcement action after there was a mistaken action by the owner uh, where he failed to obtain a grading permit. So the GP process was started to legalize the horse stables or alternatively to build a small number of additional homes. And I say six because um, currently there's two parcels, so two would be allowed, and we're actually seeking to potentially add up to six additional new homes um, as part of a conservation package here. So the surrounding area, as um, the staff report discussed, is, um, is essentially in an open space reserve island um, where the parcels are located. And um, so these parcels are not contiguous to the urban service area boundary and they're essentially surrounded by rural residential parcels, all of which are designated in yellow on the map here. And from what we learned in approximately 1994, um, these prior to 1994, the areas in brown as open space reserve island were in fact designated as rural residential, but in 1994, uh, there was a general plan update where these parcels were designated as rural residential. But interestingly, at the time, none of the parcels in that area really fit with the definition of the open space reserve definition um, and still do not. And if we looking more closely at that open space reserve island, we see that the majority of the parcels were and have been for many years two acre sites with homes, um, despite the color on the map. And in fact, there's approximately 100 parcels of residential estates surrounding the property, most of which do not even conform to the minimum five acre lot standard for rural residential. Uh, despite what's here, however, um, staff has concluded that rural residential is not appropriate for the site because, uh, quote, there's no established pattern of small developed parcels large enough to be considered more than a sort of simple rural development, end quote. But this is just not in keeping with the reality of what is in fact surrounding the site. The other um, issue with the, the staff analysis is that it misapplies uh, RLU61 and RLU62. So RLU61 is the policy that there's no outward expansion. But RLU62 is the exception to that rule and the question here before you is really whether this property meets the criteria for the exception. And one of the main uh, grounds for the denial is that uh, is the contention that it is not substantially surrounded on three sides by existing rural residential areas. But as we looked at that map, and as we have one minute remaining, what's around the area, we see that it is in fact surrounded by rural residential lands. My time here is very short and there's no project before you, but just looking visually at the land, we do propose a substantial con conservation easement to preserve the hillside, which would further the policy of the environmental preservation. So the homes would be located at where the blue line is and the remainder of the, of the land would be in fact a conservation easement. 
I also want to just point out very quickly that the owner is uh, willing to enter into a development agreement and to explore other options to ensure that this area will continue to be a beautiful South County property and that it will further the goals in the general plan of environmental preservation and a rural residential living. Thank you for this opportunity and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Griswold. With that, we'll turn to our speakers, David, and they'll have 10 minutes each. Uh, okay, we'll set the timer at two minutes. Uh, thank you for your patience while we navigate through this. One moment, please. I believe we have to, there we go. Okay, our next speaker is Jan Kearney. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Um, I am one of the 70 horses. My horses are one of the 70 horses that have been displaced from Lakeview Stable. And uh, Hero Ranch was our only hope of finding a place that was uh, drivable in a day. Uh, to put our horses. And uh, I want to be in support of changing it to Hillside. Um, the, I, I was uh, at Lakeview Stable for 20 years and with 70 horses there, uh, I can tell you the traffic was not very bad at all. It's not going to be much different than what it is now because um, people come at different times. They come early in the morning, they come in the afternoon, some come at night, uh, they, and some can't even come for several days at a time. So uh, the traffic will not impact the neighborhood that much. In addition, um, uh, horse people are animal lovers, so we have lots of dogs and cats and we're children. So we're always concerned about driving and most ranches have a five mile an hour driving um, that they don't want anybody to go any faster. So we tend to go slow when we're driving to the ranch. We're aware of animals and people in the neighborhood. So what I've noticed at uh, this property since my horse has been there is that the neighbors drive faster than the boarders do that are the people that are at Hero Ranch. So I just wanted to put that out. And also I think um, the hillside is very compatible with the existing environment because the horses have been the existing environment. And they also help with the environment because they graze down the land, less of a fire hazard, and they have less flies than the cows that are surrounding the area, as well as um, we put out fly predators. So we're not gonna change things that much in the environment. And I'd much rather look at hillside and horses than houses. Our next speaker is Alice Kaufman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Um, thank you. Hello again, President Wasserman and Supervisors. Alice Kaufman for uh, Green Foothills. So um, we, uh, we do oppose the requested redesignation to rural residential. The general plan is very specific concerning when parcels may be considered for redesignation to rural residential. As you saw in the staff report, there are four factors, including that the parcel must be substantially surrounded on three sides by existing rural, rural residential areas. And the argument that, the, that this is kind of a de facto rural residential, even though the, the surrounding parcels are designated open space reserve, doesn't work out because you, that you have to find an established pattern of development of small part, primarily developed parcels assembled in aggregations large enough to be considered more than simple clusters of rural development. And when you look at the surrounding area, it's very clearly um, dominated by hillside and open space uses. And I would also point out that the proposed subdivision would result in eight new parcels that then would be smaller than any other parcel in the area, according to the applicant's own analysis. So the precedent setting effect of this where you would have uh, potentially other landowners saying, hey, what about me? Why can't I get a redesignation? Is not, should not be ignored. So we definitely oppose the re redesignation of rural residential. Uh, with re with re regard to the uh, proposal to redesignate to Hillside, um, it does on the face of it appear that that's appropriate. Given the history of violations on the property, that does give us some concern. Um, we definitely would urge the board, um, if they decide to move forward the hillside application for processing, we'd urge that the use permit process establish adequate restrictions on the size and scale of the commercial stable operation 
such as limitations on hours of operation, nighttime lighting, and other potential activities that could negatively impact the neighborhood or the environment. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is Deborah Goldeen. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I am a 58 year resident of the of uh, Santa Clara County and a fourth generation Californian. The idea that you wouldn't have horses on a hillside or that horses shouldn't be on a hillside to me is is mind boggling, ridiculous, absurd in a rural area. I, I remember horses have always been part of Santa Clara County uh, living. <laughs> I, when I was growing, when I was young, there were horses, horse pastures on the corner of Page Mill and El Camino. And this is, you know, it's just getting whittled down and whittled down and whittled down. And, and you know, the idea that someone would say, we don't want horses, we don't want horses on the hillside is kind of like the people in Portola Valley saying, well, we don't want Stanford University to be there anymore. I mean, to, I know that sounds like an odd analogy, but it's the best one I could think of considering my own personal sense of place. For me, horses and their presence and their presence on hillsides is as much a part of my psychic understanding of Santa Clara County as is Stanford University. So um, I'm surprised that it's even a question whether or not horses can be on that hillside. Uh, as for the rural residential designation, I don't know anything about that. I have boarded at Hero Ranch. Um, and it is surrounded on three sides by rural residential properties. So Alice Kaufman was incorrect about that. Whether or not the board wants to um, grant that or not, I don't know. I just care about allowing horses where I feel they should always be in a rural area. I think that they belong and they're such an incredibly important part of our human experience, at least for people like me and a lot of, of and I have a lot of company in that department that um, I want to see that continue. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto, hijo de campesinos de Sasipuedes, and I'm a California registered native Michigan Indian. I trace my lineage back to the Kumi, who were the first ones to come into contact with Junipero Serra in 1767. My ancestors built the first mission of San Diego, thus the name, the way. And so it's from that space that I moved in these circles. And, and because I speak not for myself at all. However, I do speak for every single ancestor that is buried in Oak Hill Cemetery, which of a total, there is 15. I have 15 ancestors buried in the oldest cemetery in California. Okay, I was, I'm a descendant, direct descendant of Sasi Puedes. So while I respect the previous callers uh, bringing and setting a historical context in terms of public policy, because that's what we need to start doing, is that there's, there's just, we're coming from two different spaces. And the government, because the government has been the primary beneficiary of all of these racist policies that were predicated upon the decimation of the native populations, until that piece is rectified, and here's one of the ways that you do it, you have to quantify it. And you want to rectify, you've got to quantify. Now, to quantify it, you must determine how many billions of dollars was robbed, literally stolen, from, from my generation, from inheriting, as a result of red, uh, redlining that went on in Willow Glen and the Rose Garden area and parts of downtown. These right here, because the laws that were being, the laws that are being used now are all predicated upon that redlining system. They are, these laws that we have now are the inheritors as well. And it needs to be challenged. It needs to be rooted out. There's going to be some grieving. There's going to be some crying. And there's going to be some pissed off people. That's all right, man. So was my ancestors in those fields building that well. Our next speaker is Michelle Wellington. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thank you for um, your time today, board. Um, I am a resident of uh, the neighborhood that's in question right across the street. Um, I've written already several times uh, my opposition to uh, really change anything about um, either parcel both for rural residential or for um, the commercial horse stables. 
really my concern is around the preservation and the preserving the natural beauty and the resources and um, the, the wildlife that lives there, but also the quietness of our community. Um, this person uh, does like divested their interest um, as soon as they left the neighborhood. However, the decisions that are going to be made today are going to affect the residents that live there today, myself included. And because we received this notice so last minute um, about this meeting, a lot of our neighbors couldn't attend this meeting today. But I know uh, that I, I'm representing several that are all in opposition to to either um, motion. I echo everything that Alice uh, Kaufman has said um, with respect to both uh, rural residential. For the hillside piece, there was a lot of dishonesty that she already mentioned around the permitting and kind of doing things maybe back door. Um, so I would be very worried uh, if anything gets approved and if the scope gets changed because you know, it's really the neighborhood that is going to suffer and the families that live there uh, that are really gonna have to deal with the consequences of whatever comes out of this decision today. Um, I took an hour and a half uh, away from work today to attend. Um, so really hope that you know, we make the right decision. Thank you. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much to all the board of supervisors. First of all, I wanted to mention about uh, the open space reserves. When we, when we are referring to the open space reserve, it is very important to understand that there, in terms of open space reserves, there is a careful planning that is required to propose the residential subdivision. Because typically the open space reserve, they, are, they, could, be, they could be a space for, uh, for the playground, they could be a space for uh, uh, for the schools, there could be a space for accessible parks. So in terms of a good living environment and a proper densities, densities and compatible land uses, it is important that the open space reserves when converted to the rural residential areas, the right set of standards be placed because nowadays all the cities, they are demolishing their old slums and replacing them with the good buildings or well-planned integrated neighborhoods. Open space reserves, they are part of a government land use when they are being converted to the rural residentials or any construction you know, that is being approved, there's a careful planning you know, which is required so that the open space reserve be properly utilized. Also, there are a number of factors you know, that is to be, uh, that is to be you know, put into the consideration that the right side of a subdivision development is to take place and to determine that you know, what are the physical surroundings they are continue to be maintained in the open space reserve, whereas the no, det no deterioration or contamination be happen in the open space reserves and as well as it's continue to maintain its natural resources. Also, such matter be also be required to be referred to the planning commissions further in order to, in order to create the master plan for this for the establishment and the development of a subdivision right set of a zoning be established or whether you know any specific recreational school or any particular space you know to be permitted within the open space reserves. Also, a planning advisory services be concerned with the board of supervisor that any such decisions you know be made for such open space reserve be considered and our next speaker is mark normandin i am unmuting you please accept the unmute you will have two minutes to speak the timer will start when you begin speaking mark are you there i'll ask you to unmute one more time it appears that there mark oh there you are go ahead well, thank you for the supervisors for listening to our uh, our comments. Uh, I'd like to address the option two, which is the commercial uh, aspect in our neighborhood. Uh, our neighborhood has nothing against horses. We have horses everywhere. Um, I live right adjacent to the property at uh, on Lone Oak, which is right off of Shillingsburg. My corner, uh, I'm on a corner house there. Been there for almost 18 years now. When we moved in, yes, there was horses on the hillside grazing openly. Did not ever see any. Um, um, the boarding going on because the stalls were behind the hill and hidden. Didn't see people coming and going because it wasn't very many people, I guess. Um, now they've uh, the owner of the property has come and he's he's illegally graded. He has illegally put up stalls, uh, many numerous stalls, 40, 50 different stalls, open arenas now. Um, we hear people in our backyard giving horse lessons with bullhorns, um, comings and goings of people on our street. If you look on our street, if you've been our, in our neighborhood, we've got a very, very small bridge that crosses Schillingsburg. If uh, any small car gets across, it's a one-lane bridge. 
when you start bringing horse trailers across and the traffic that a, came, a commercial um, horse boarding facility would bring to our neighborhood, um, we are very much ag against that. Uh, we moved into our neighborhood for a reason uh, of a quiet community, love our neighbors, love our, our community, love our quiet streets. Uh, it's real nice to say for the horse people, and, and I've got nothing against horse people. Uh, I love horses, I love animals. But for them to say, you know, yes, well, let's bring horses. Well, it's not their neighborhood that they're bringing the horses into. Um, like I said, we don't have a problem with horses. It's just a number of people that would bring into our neighborhoods the unsafe uh, driving on the streets and so on. We're very concerned. So we would like to oppose the hillside res uh, res uh, rating on this property. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ritika Karbanda. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, hi, uh, this is Jasdeep Ritika Sas when she's right here. I'm speaking on both our behalfs here. So uh, I, I didn't get to hear everybody's comments from the neighborhood. I'm uh, chiming in and out as work uh, permits. But here, here's the thing. The big question is all the people talking in support of this, how would they like uh, all these horses and everything that comes with it in their backyards. Most of these people don't live here, we do. And this neighborhood, to Mark's point, many of the residents have horses themselves. It is not that we have anything against horses. They are welcome to keep the horses. The issues are beyond that. The issues are commercialization, the number of horses in the space that would house these many horses and everything that comes with it. We are seeing changes just in the last few months on the streets. Forget that area, we don't even walk in there. We don't have a horse, we don't walk in there. But on the streets, we're seeing the difference and how the landscape is changing, how the neighborhood is changing, how the traffic is changing. I wonder if other people who do support this would want all of this in nothing, like I said, nothing against horses. And they have their horses, but would they like to bring all of this in their backyards? And I bet you, I'll go out on a limb and say the answer is no. But they're okay doing it in a neighborhood where people who live there don't welcome that. So, uh, I, I, like I said, I haven't heard everybody's comments. We have given our comments in writing too, but it is not that we're against the horses. The, and to, to the point that the law wasn't followed in the past, what are the chances it's going to be followed now? There are violation after violations. You know, there are, there are not appropriate permits in place. And yet this goes on. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi there, this is Mark speaking on behalf of our family. I'd uh, first like to say thank you for hearing this. Um, I need to say maintaining open space, uh, I'll step back. We've been residents here for nearly 40 years and we really understand this area and value it for all. Uh, main, maintaining open space reserve is fundamental to preserving the character of the neighborhood and the natural environment and cannot be removed if pres preservation of the area is a legitimate part of this conversation. We absolutely need to solve the horse boarding problem right away for all that need it. But our, our neighborhood is not a viable long-term solution to that problem. Um, you know, horses have been in that area, but they were actually in pasture. Now much of that pasture where the horses were has been degraded and damaged by the already uh, constructed paddocks that um, do not actually allow pasture grazing anymore in those areas. Um, the traffic has already significantly increased in this neighborhood due to the activities of these parcels and the, uh, the owner's previous property. And the noise has already greatly increased, i.e. the megaphone use for the lessons and the generator powered lights for nighttime lessons. The neighborhood does not support this nor want this. We are horse lovers and supporters ourselves. We, we need to solve this problem for the horse community. Again, our neighborhood is not a viable option for any party involved other than perhaps the owner and, and applicant. Um, please understand that this, uh, these parcels are habitat for eagles, foxes, mountain lions, just a, a wide range of, of uh, species that have already been impacted by these activities. 
And this opens the door for further de degradation of, of, of minimal remaining habitat and, and spaces like this for humans and, and animals alike. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Richard W. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, um, I'm another neighbor uh, of this community. I want to just give a, a big plus one to Mark, uh, Ratika, Michelle, and Alice's statements um, with uh, the similar concerns and the implications of what would be to come uh, with the approval of these changes, as well as the pattern of previous violations being a concern on how things would um, change going forward. So uh, nothing new to unfold, but just want to weigh in to give a plus one to the previous concerns that have been um, stated. And that concludes our speakers on this item. Thank you very much, Dave. And if you can set your timer back to five minutes, the uh, applicant or applicant's representative will have that time to speak, address anything they wish. One moment, please. We'll set the timer for five minutes. And whenever the applicant is ready. Hi, it's Melanie Griswold. I just wanted to reserve a minute for the owner to also speak if I could. So if I could just have- it's all It's all in the five minutes. Oh, okay, wonderful. So right ahead and start the clock, David. All right, so thank you. Um, so I just wanna address first the neighborhood opposition and point out that while I understand where the neighbors are coming from, um, essentially the neighbors are living and enjoying their properties and essentially saying that nobody else should have the same opportunity that they are having to enjoy the land. They're living on parcels that are essentially rural residential that have the ability to have commercial horse boarding facilities on it, but for whatever reason, it is not appropriate for their neighbor to have that same opportunity. And it does um, just smack of the nimbyism that is um, that has been problematic in, um, in allowing uh, development where it is appropriate. Um, here, uh, in terms of the commercial horse stables, um, the impacts, to the neighbors if uh, commercial horse stables were to be permitted here would be addressed um, through a conditional use permit. This is not a decision to allow stables or to allow 100 horses, it's simply to potentially provide a path to legalizing uh, what the way in which the land is being currently used right now. Uh, in terms of the substantial surrounding uh, on all three sides, um, I just you know want to I guess ask the question that if we were to redesignate the portions of the land that were neighboring all of those small uh, rural residentially used properties that are currently designated as OSR, what would be the appropriate designation? And the reality is that it only uh, complies and it doesn't even comply with the rural residential designation. So we do have uh, the property being surrounded on all three sides by rural residential. Um, Finally, just uh, speaking about the conservation policies, uh, an easement is in perpetuity. A general plan designation lasts only as long as uh, the Board of Supervisors says it does. And this conservation easement of 34 acres would ensure that that area could be used for all sorts of habitat for animals and that that would be forever, not um, not something that could be changed. So I think that that really does present an opportunity and we look forward to hopefully having further conversation with that. But I'll turn it to the owner now. Thank you very much, Melanie. Um, I just want to point out a few things. First of all, um, I have never been dishonest in anything that I've done. I admittedly made a mistake by doing some grading um, in one portion of the property where the arena was and a few other spaces um, per the advice of the contractor, but we have done everything that we were supposed to do to rectify the situation with the county and pulled all of the appropriate permits. Um, this was a mistake that I acknowledge, but we never ever did anything underhandedly or dishonestly. The next thing I want to just address is that when I purchased this property, there were 58 horses there. Mr. Norman and Michelle, you are not aware of this and you are incorrect in determining that those were all pasture horses. Of those 58 horses that were on that property, 22 of them were in pasture. What we've done is we've created a beautiful spot using the natural terroir uh, or natural slope of the property 
um, where these horses have more paddock space than any other spot in Santa Clara County, period. Um, and this has just been a devastating thing for my family. We have three kids. My children love to ride. There are no bullhorns. There are absolutely no bullhorns. Um, I feel extremely violated when I'm, I'm seeing neighbors take pictures of my children who have every right to be out there enjoying that arena, which was done lawfully and is fully permitted. Um, and the other thing I just want to say is I've never done anything other than try to improve the integrity of that neighborhood and preserve the beautiful, beautiful nature that's out there. Um, this is one minute remaining. This has been a horse property for over 30 years. All I want to do at this point is legalize what has already been there. We are not trying to do anything that would adversely impact this neighborhood. This was a horse property. I have all of the proof. I have all of the documentation. I have all of the, the photos. I have all of the leasing agreements. We just want to make it legal. And I feel like I've been unfairly targeted by a few people who have just come at us and our family to make this such a difficult process. These horses, these people that have had no place to go deserve a spot to go. And it's just not fair to say that I, I've divested my interest. I have more acreage collectively, 50 acres on this parcel than any of those, pe those people that I spoke today. So it's not fair to say I've divested my interest. I sold my home, but I still own 50 acres. Most of these people that I've spoke today collectively don't even have 10. And that's so, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And supervisors, unless any of you are just uh, dying to speak first, this is in my district. So I'll be happy to give my perspective first, as is our practice on the Board of Supervisors with um, agenda items that come up in our district. First and foremost, I've, I've got the general plan in front of me, and it's very much my interpretation that the open space reserve that was put on it long ago was a temporary until we can figure out between the city and the county and what's to be done. The fact this has gone through our planning commission and they've recommended, approved the OSR, Open Space Reserve designation be changed to Hillside. It's then gone on to our planning department, which um, is recommending basically a change from OSR to Hillside. I too am in favor of that. I think it's very important for all those that I, I know a lot of people don't want anything changed. I know a lot of people want, are in favor of open space reserve to, to Hillside, and there's some that want it to go beyond that. But I personally think that the time it's appropriate and the process is appropriate that it be changed to Hillside. And what I do wanna do is take this opportunity to, to address any of those speakers who are still on with us. And I appreciate all those that took time away from their family and from their work to share their thoughts and opinions about this um, conversion. And what I will say, and I don't know, I see Jacqueline is still on there and Rob's on there, um, Joanna as well, thank you all. What I wanna say to all those that are concerned about what has taken place or what might take place is that any further development, anything that happens, if there's gonna be more traffic, there's gonna be CEQA environmental impact reports, to be considered with the traffic impact that is being proposed. As was said in staff's presentation, I think Joanna, you gave this one as well. Um, this is not an approval of any development. This is an approval of, of a change in zoning that allows different types of development if permitted, if found to mitigate any environmental impacts that it may, the, the proposed project may have. So anything that's going to be built will be built with permits. Any, in, any in proposed increase in traffic will need to go through a traffic study a mitigation, and then mitigation if necessary. Everything going forward, if anything comes forward, and again, that's not what's before us today, will go through the county's permitting process so that it is done correctly, safely, for public health, and, and appropriately. And so I just wanna give that assurances to all the neighbors. If a majority of the supervisors agree, I'll make it my motion to approve, I believe it's option B as in Baker, to change from the OSR that it is to the hillside designation. That would be my motion at this time. 
as well as my commitment at this time to all the neighbors that whatever is to be built will be done following the county's laws and with pre-approval. And Jacqueline or Joanna, um, can either of you, anything that I said that is incorrect? Uh, thank you, President Wasserman. Everything you have said is correct. Any development moving forward will be conducted through the appropriate uh, planning and development department permitting process. Thank you. And what we're voting on right now is in fact not a development. We're voting on a change in zone. Actually, if I may, we're 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 receiving direction from the board on the processing of the amendment. So the board is not actually approving the actual change, but um, the Thank process. You. Thank you, which means this will actually go back to the planning commission and then come back to the board of supervisors. That's correct. So we've we've still got another round of this to go, but this is just allowing that process to begin. Uh, with that, I see Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. And thank you, Jacqueline and Joanna. Thank you. I, um, I'll second the motion. And I, and I appreciate the leadership your office is going to take on the next steps. Thank you. Any further comments or hands raised? I don't see any. I would ask David to uh, call the roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And with that, we move on to uh, item 11 and 12 are to be heard after one o'clock. We're going to take a lunch break before that. We'll now move on to item number 13. Hey, I didn't mute myself. That's good. Uh, item 13 is a referral by, I believe, Supervisors Allenberg and Chavez. It is? Yes, please. One of you, please take the lead. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to, to start if that's all right with you, Supervisor Chavez. Of course. Thank you very, very much first uh, for your support on this referral. And thank you to the rest of our colleagues for considering today's request. Um, I'm really pleased to bring this item forward for consideration as it's yet another approach we can take to help support and provide relief to our county's local small businesses during these challenging times. For those of you who aren't familiar with our weights and measures uh, department, there might be a couple of you, please indulge this very, very quick uh, civics lesson. Any business in the county that uses a commercial weighing or measuring device or a scanner must register the device with this department. Every year, employees of this department inspect every device and scanner to make sure that they're properly calibrated in order to ensure that customers aren't unwittingly over or, or undercharged for whatever they're buying. Some examples of businesses that use scales or scanners include jewelry stores, pharmacies, markets, gas stations, taxis, and retail stores. In Santa Clara County, there are approximately 2,000 retail businesses, uh, including grocers, that operate scanner pricing systems and use vari various weights, weighing and measuring devices. Small businesses, which are defined in this referral as those with two or fewer locations, are estimated to number about a thousand. Um, and just as an aside, the weights and measures tracks only the number and type of devices used at each location. The department does not have the data on the number of employees per business location or the number of customers frequenting the business. And it's the intent of this referral to provide relief to those 1,000 small businesses for the 2021 um, fees at an estimated cost to the general fund of approximately $500,000. And this recommendation is in line with the previous um, targeted assistance that Supervisor Chavez and I uh, proposed and that the board um, approved. We are, targeting the, we are targeting financial assistance to our smallest, most vulnerable business owners. Um, this literally keeps money in their pockets um, and helps those experiencing the greatest need without unfairly advantaging those who are not facing the same degree of 
vulnerability. So I am look. I'm happy to move approval of the motion and uh, ask for all of your support. Thank you. And I'll Thank second. You. So we have a motion by Supervisor Ellenberg, a second by Supervisor Chavez, and we have a public speaker. Could, David, would you please allow this uh, speaker to speak for up to two minutes? Okay, one moment while we set the timer, please. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, thank you. And I'd like to remind uh, Supervisor Wasserman, it's not, I'm not the speaker. I'm a sixth generation resident citizen of this city of which you serve the county. So it's very, very critically important that you understand that, that you understand the perspective and who you're talking to. Because this is me and there is tens of thousands of human beings like me. Now, I appreciate what uh, Supervisor Allenberg is, is bringing to the fold with respect to uh, providing some mitigation of the financial burdens that the businesses have had to bear. However, we must keep in mind that the Latino population in that area is the reason why they are going to be afforded that privilege and the county will do it and the city will do it because that is what we do all that i ever ask is for that exact same measure the exact same mitigation be applied with respect to the citizens that have historically over generations experienced the lack thereof, the lack thereof in terms of the generosity and the and the understanding of what it is that the citizens of this county face and what government's role is in to stand in its mitigation. Okay, we talked a lot about earlier with respect to, to horses and, and all these birds, all these wildlife, it's, the, all of those wildlife are only a reflection of the creator's magic and what he can do but man the human being the chicano he is indigenous to this area and he bears the reflection of the creator and we are not honoring that and respecting that that concludes our public speakers thank you dave i appreciate that so we have a motion by vice president ellenberg a second by supervisor chavez i will be supporting the uh, motion as well i appreciate the fact that you're saying it's this year only as we're coming out of covid um, week by week, better and better. And I certainly am looking forward to uh, the hopeful announcement that the federal reimbursement of COVID expenses might be able to cover this expense to the county as well, because we're, we're cutting things at the same time that we're giving money out. Supervisors Lee and Smithian, I don't see your hands up. So hearing nothing more, David, if you please uh, roll call. Oh, David, I still show one panelist, uh, one speaker. It uh, looks like he may have raised his hands after we finished with the last speaker. If you want to take him, we can certainly do that. Sure. Let's have one other speaker. Okay. And that will be it. Okay. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much to uh, all the Board of Supervisors. I, I wanted to emphasize the, the having and registering a business and uh, placing the weight and measure uh, fees for the Santi, uh, for the for the county of uh, uh, Santa Clara. What the weight and measures fees does is that it's protect the buyer and seller in all monetary transaction that use the weight measures or count. In terms of a devices, when inspector tests any gasoline pump scales or other similar devices, the accuracies are also required to be maintained. So such that the case is about the quantity control, petroleum, paymasters service agents, it is important to understand that, you know, this fees impacts the way the county manages the businesses. Considering the COVID-19 situation, uh, such standards are certainly mandatory to implement. However, considering the, the situation with the COVID-19, the fees are required to be waived off. Such consideration be placed for the right set of the consumers where the fees are to be waived on a certain conditions and the eligibility requirements and the criteria are to be implemented such that you know when the fees are waived those small business consumers are reported to county of santa Clara that how much fees are going to be waived because such reporting would directly be impacted to the revenue of a county 
So when you know such such fee waivers are being implemented, such consideration and the criteria to be established as well prior to the waiver of the fee, because these measures allow the county to implement the right set of the standards for the quality control and as well as the measures of the scales. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you. So now we'll take a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian. We'll come back. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. And one more time for Supervisor Simidian. You may have stepped away. Okay. Simidian and I. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Sorry, just a little tech problem of my own, Mr. Chairman. Hey, believe me, I understand. All right. Item number 14 is a referral from Chavez and Lee. Anyone wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand electronically. And um, Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Lee, who's going to open this up? I think I will do that um, and then turn it to Supervisor Lee. Um, this next referral um, is uh, First, let me thank Supervisor Lee for co-joining me. Um, but this next referral is to support Maranatha's Christian uh, Center's efforts to protect the Asian American and Pacific Islander community seniors um, through the the um, through an alarm wristband and lanyard that they want to be able to distribute to the community. This this. Um, is really not a sponsorship, and I'm sorry I used that language. It really is something that we would um, invest in in terms of helping them uh, get these lanyards out. Sponsorships, I know, refer to events, and I apologize for the confusion over the language. Um, but what I'd like to to um, to do is is to say I, I recognize, and I know all of my colleagues do, that the need is really great. If um, my colleagues were comfortable, I'd like to ask that we, instead of doing 5,000, do 10,000 um, dollars because it would allow them to distribute about 2,000 bracelets instead of one. Um, given the limited supply and to ensure fair distribution, the center will work with various um, AP, uh, AAPI community organizations, including Aki, to make sure they get distributed uh, to high-risk seniors. I think given the unfortunate climate of heat towards our friends and relatives, it's really critical we remain vigilant and continue to take preventative measures. And I'd like to turn it over to Supervisor Lee for his thoughts and comments. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Yes, first of all, thank you, Supervisor Chavez for initiating this important work. Uh, I'll try to be brief um, since I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, many of those who speak little or no English faces challenges around communication when dealing with the hate crime. So when I see in the community members advocate for the grassroots level is creating these alarms, wristbands and lanyards so that they could serve as a deterrent or at least makes the individual feel better when being confronted with danger. Uh, the EM Collective has established a program to distribute personal alarms to API older adults and unlock an organization that provides full service healthcare and senior services for most API older adults has also started looking into alarms for their patients and staff as well. Uh, I hope that the Miranda will be able to also partner with these two organizations to leverage these collective efforts. Uh, supporting creation and distribution of these alarm wristbands and lanyards are steps in the right direction towards helping some of our most vulnerable groups of now API community during this sense of time. I certainly do uh, second and support the uh, increase of the funding to uh, 10,000 for uh, this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other supervisors? Otherwise, we'll go to, yes, Supervisor Simidian. Just a quick question. It wasn't clear what the source of funding was. I, I don't know if that's um, uh, part of the motion or if uh, the maker and the seconder are looking to the staff to come back with a recommendation on that at the uh, next board meeting. I I was not. I was hoping we could take action today, um, but perhaps I could a supervisor submit and ask staff to give their thoughts about the most appropriate source of funds. Dr. Smith. Um, if we're talking about $10,000, uh, um, we can probably find that in service and supplies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just uh, apropos of Supervisor Chavez's earlier comment about 
uh, the distinction on sponsorships, I, I just wasn't sure if it was um, from a budgeted line item or from reserves or from supervisorial accounts. Now, I think we have that answer and uh, I'm ready to vote today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. Thank you. Any other Supervisor Ellenberg? Nope. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Chavez and a second by Supervisor Lee. And you, have, you have two public speakers. Oops, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. We have two public speakers and have two minutes each. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to, uh, this is Paul Soto. I'd like to extend a, 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 my, my gratitude for Maranatha's uh, response and, and moving, really actually uh, uh, centering the, the, the philosophical and the spiritual knowledge and teachings that happen within those walls to have, to accept the responsibility and duty to bring those principles and bring those those that 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 spirituality and that philosophy for the benefit of the community and i think that this is a very this is a very good example of that you know and and we we have a mandate for this kind of behavior and it's not only to 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 uh to it's not only to challenge the symptom of the problem which is what we see manifest in our community today. Those are symptoms. Those are not the problem. By the time somebody looks at another human being with intention that I'm gonna dehumanize them, I am going to destroy them because I have determined in and of myself that this person does not deserve to exist. They do not deserve to, to, to be co-equal with me. That, that right there is the sickness. That is the disease. And the only thing that I know that is powerful enough to inoculate us as a collective, us as a society against that is truth, honesty, fidelity to the historical record, and a full commitment to the rectification of those policies so that you could set the consciousness of the people rightly and correctly We've been lied to in the public school system. We've been lied to throughout history. And when we see the symptoms of that manifesting in our communities, we don't even know how to identify for what it actually is at the root. Our next speaker is Reginald Swilly. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. How are you doing? Uh, this is uh, Board Supervisor. I, I, I appreciate you handling this. I've been on a couple of other calls. I, I hope I'm speaking to the issue, <laughs> issue of the Asian hate. Uh, we yes, appreciate this young lady that uh, came up with this program. This was her idea. And, uh, and, and, and our whole church is, is weighing in. Dr. King said uh, 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 that uh, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And we are trying to, we, that is what we are instilling. Spiritually, we are saying that every, we should consider other people at all times, but our church has been in the forefront in this community of serving the least of these and joining our hearts with everybody else to progress and bring all of us along together. And we appreciate this board because we think that's, that's the spirit that you guys operate from. And we are putting our whole spirits behind supporting this young lady in this program. And we think it, will, it, it is a bridge builder for her to come up with this bridge uh, to the Asian community. I think it's a great sign for our county. I think it's a great sign for Maranatha, <laughs> but I think it's a great sign for our whole community. So we, we do hope that you can support this. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rachel. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much to all uh, Board of Supervisors. I think it is imperative to, to know that uh, uh, in terms of the Moranta Christian Center, uh, how, you know, how it is serving to the community and uh, what it is producing in terms of uh, 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 distributing the alarm, with, uh, alarm wrist stands and the land yards. In response to the uh, to the spikes in the crime, uh, the first come first thing you know that comes to the mind is that you know where uh, what is the crime rate around the uh, around the community 
uh, where the uh, where this question center is located, as well as you know how the distributing the wrist hands and producing that with the five thousand dollars is helping that community. Uh, we uh, we have been having a conversation about that. You know how the religious communities are required to be protected, and how uh, the seniors living in those community being served and required to be protected. As uh, the center, you know, which is located in the right around the uh, downtown of the San Jose uh, of the San Jose city area, it is it is inevitable that you know the uh, to consider the crime rate. However, it is also important to help the seniors with the legitimate uh, uh, say a uh, set of a safety. A requirement to be placed. If other than you know the wrist, uh, other than the wrist bands, I also uh, I also suggest to uh, to provide the security in terms of a technology where the where the Christian center be be safeguarded with the right set of a technology, and as well as so be the so be the case with the seniors when you know uh, when they are located within the Christian center, they are also you know, being safeguarded with the right set of a technology. So certainly, I, uh, uh, it is something you know to something to to secure the community is something you know, very much available to 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 do such thing thank you very much our next speaker is pastor alicia Partee. i am unmuting you please accept the unmute you will have two minutes to speak the timer will start when you begin speaking okay <clears throat> hello uh, board of supervisors i'm very grateful that you are hearing us today and i'm very excited that it was a youth in our uh, in our community that came up with this idea and she created a video and she really has um, been the forefront runner in getting this um, moving and our congregation is very happy to be a part of it. Uh, we are going to be partnering and collaborating with like Aki and distributing the wristbands and lanyards through uh, counselors and people that, that deal directly with our, our target population. But I just wanted to say thank you. I, I hope you support it. I really appreciate the increase because that just means more people um, that we can serve. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. President Wasserman, it looks like Pastor Partee might be signed on twice here. Um, I'm going to uh, unmute this individual and see if, if it is in fact the pastor. And if not, uh, I'll you. ask them to rename themselves once they're done. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I am Dr. Tyrone Partee. I'm senior pastor here at Maranatha Christian Center. Uh, and I am in support of uh, this young person who has come forth. It is said that uh, the children shall lead us. And this young person has come forth to create and also with a plan to distribute alarm wristbands and lanyards to the Asian American Pacific Island community. As a community of people from various ethnic backgrounds with a vast history of generations of hate and violence, we want to contribute to stop hate against Asian Americans and Pacific Island residents. Our goal is to help in decreasing hate crimes uh, against especially the elderly in Santa Clara County and other at-risk groups. We're committed to being an active part of the solution to the end of hate and violence in our society. Therefore, we ask for your financial support to help us develop as many alarm wristbands and lanyards that will alert residents of a crime being committed to ward off senseless perpetrators and hopefully aid in the apprehension of said perpetrators. Help us move forward in making Santa Clara County a safer community for all. Thank you so much. That concludes our public speakers. There we go. David, if you'll please take a vote. Oh, Supervisor Allenberg, your hand raised or is that from before? Um, no, that, that's a new one. Um, OK. Just, yes. Uh, uh, we're so appreciating the comments from the community and this cross-cultural piece and the youth piece. And for us to be able to hear, not that this is the only time we do it, but I just want to lift up how important and special it is when a community asks for something specific, um, they are leading on, on the what and we are helping to facilitate it and, and leading on the on the how. And I'm I'm so glad to support this today. And thank you, Supervisors Ali and Chavez for bringing it forward. All right, with that, please call the David. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. That was an aye. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to item 15, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. 
um, colleagues, this referral asks administration to determine what, if any, additional costs would incur if the legislation uh, herein were to pass. And um, in this bill, these bills are intended um, to show on the actual ballot who the um, supporters and opposition are to a particular ballot initiative. And um, so what my hope is, is that over the next uh, couple weeks that our staff can tell us what the actual impact um, will likely be in terms of cost as we're paying for our own postage and, and the implications for printing. And then the second would be to ask staff concurrently uh, to work um, on a letter of support that could come from the board uh, to uh, to support both of these bills. And that would be my motion. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a motion by Chavez, a second by Lee. We have uh, two members of the public. There'll be one minute each, Dave. One okay. minute, sir. Yes, and Supervisor Sumidian, if you wish to speak before, while he changes the timer. I'm happy to wait until we hear from members of the public, sir. Thank you. You got it. Okay, thank you. One moment while we put one minute on the timer. Our next speaker is Craig Dunkerley. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, as uh, I'm currently serving as chair of the Santa Clara County Citizens Advisory Commission on Election, and I'll be submitting a, a resolution uh, to the commission this evening, uh, which I expect will probably pass, uh, recommending to the Board of Supervisors uh, that they do support these bills. Uh, I think uh, it'll pass because the, the value to the county and the voters and our beleaguered uh, uh, democracy uh, exceeds uh, any, any uh, cost that might be involved. Uh, I also serve as South Bay Coordinator for California Clean Money Campaign. And before the pandemic, when we were circulating petitions, uh, we instantly, uh, uh, voters instantly recognized the value of being able to see supporters and opponents right there on the ballot. Lastly, I would say just as a citizen that reading the voter guide, I often come away more confused and with more questions than when I started. And that's when I start looking for who opposed and who supports measures. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much uh, to all the uh, Board of Supervisors. Certainly the, uh, the bill which has been introduced uh, on February 19, 2021. Uh, there, there are certain amendments that has been made to the to the ballot label uh, for containing the names of the candidate as well as the statement of the measure. Uh, the The bill applicability is uh, uh, is for uh, for the fiscal committee and, and uh, has been approved as a part of a majority vote. Certainly, there is a there is a vast legislative change uh, within the bill, so certainly it is required to be implemented as a part of a, a local as well as the county ordinances and uh, the Ballot, uh, the ballot title and summary shall summarize the, the estimated net state for the local government fiscal impact as well. So thank you very much for implementing it. Our next speaker is Trent Lang. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, uh, supervisors, or good afternoon. I'm Trent Lang, president of the California Clean Money Campaign, the sponsor of SB90 and AB 1416. I'd like to uh, thank the supervisors and especially supervisors. Supervisor Chavez for considering this resolution. Um, wealthy special interests have a huge unfair ballot uh, advantage on ballot measures because they can do uh, ads that uh, mislead voters about who really supports and opposes them. That's why these bills are so important to put the actual supporters and opponents on the ballot. Our polls show that 79% of likely voters want, uh, uh, want to know who supports and opposes, but 22% uh, of voters didn't even know this information was in the ballot pamphlet. Um, uh, or how to find it. Um, upcoming amendments will uh, give the county the option to also list it on county uh, and city and other local ballot measures if they like. So everybody has that information at their fingertips. So thank you for uh, considering this measure. Our next speaker is Nancy Neff. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. I am Nancy Neff, California Clean Money Campaign Board Member and Peninsula Coordinator, and a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Palo Alto, whose Action Council has endorsed the Ballot Disclose Act because this is a moral issue. 
It is wrong that wealthy interests can spend millions of dollars convincing people to vote against their own best interests, while nonprofit organizations whose positions would support the people's interests often do not have the money to get their message to voters. UU principles include justice, equity, compassion, and use of the democratic process. These common principles guide us to support this equal opportunity for trusted organizations to be listed as supporters or opponents on the ballot where voters are most likely to see them. It is just and compassionate to provide this essential information on the ballot because all Californians have to live with the consequences of poor choices made by other voters. And these consequences almost always fall on harsh, most harshly on disadvantaged populations. Thank you for your time and consideration of this matter. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to uh, take just a moment because I'm gonna be a no vote today. <clears throat> and um, that uh, uh, may come as a surprise to a lot of folks uh, who are supporting the measure, who I've worked with before, who I know are well-intended. In fact, I'm uh, recalling years and years ago uh, when I was uh, still in the state Senate being uh, among the Oops, campaign You're going in and out, Supervisor. Excuse me, I'll uh, get rid of my picture and limit it to my voice. Thank you. Uh, years ago, uh, for measures on the floor of the state Senate that were supported by the Clean Money Campaign and, of course, have worked with a number of these groups uh, before. But here's my take, and it's just different than the take others have articulated. Um, the, the folks who signed the ballot arguments, which are the folks, as I understand it, that are uh, being identified for placement on the ballot itself, are currently selected by a very uh, sort of complicated uh, priority list uh, contained in state law, but they are not they are not necessarily the funders, uh, either the for or against. Um, they are so the the effort doesn't, as I understand the proposal, the effort doesn't actually identify who's funding the measures. It's simply who, under our somewhat arcane system, it was entitled to author the ballot arguments contained in the ballot handbook. And uh, it's certainly my expectation that uh, if this measure uh, passes and is signed into law, and my understanding is it passed once before but was vetoed, uh, but if it passes and, was signed, and is signed into law, then I think uh, people will uh, shrewdly uh, and smartly uh, jockey to be the ballot measure signers so that they can put their uh, names into the ballot as essentially endorsers. And then what we end up with is a, a ballot that is no longer a clean, apolitical ballot that simply lists the summary of uh, the measure, but essentially has two, three, four endorsers from each side on the ballot, which um, I think is not the function of the, the ballot itself. I, I think it's important that that information be available, understand the arguments people make about the fact that not everyone looks to the ballot pamphlet. Uh, but again, I, I, if you look at who the folks are who actually end up signing ballot arguments, they're, they're not particularly illustrative. They are not in fact uh, always the funders. And we end up with essentially endorsement lists going on the ballot, which uh, is not a path I'd, I'd like to go down. Um, I, I still hold out hope that we can um, drive uh, voter participation based on the merits of the measures themselves and not on uh, endorsement lists that move on to the ballot. So for that reason, I'll be a no vote today. I do not feel the need for our board to take an opposed position. Uh, but I, I can't uh, get myself to a yes today. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. With that, I believe we had the motion by Chavez and the second by Lee. Uh, Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you. And I, I do just want to thank Supervisor Simidian for his thoughtful comments. And I wondered, and I, I know it's difficult to do this, but I wonder if if Trenton uh, Lang wouldn't would give some feedback to that that point, the points that Supervisor Simidian raised. Trent, one, one moment while I unmute him. Um, I do believe Trent Lang is now unmuted. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. 
Okay, thank you for giving me that opportunity to respond and, and uh, uh, thank you, Supervisor Samidian, for your long support of, of clean money issues and, and your concern about these issues. <clears throat> what we find, I mean, uh, what we find is that uh, uh, what is valuable to voters, voters generally, when they look at the title and summary, many voters get confused. It's 75 uh, words of legalese uh, that, that's very hard for most voters. It certainly doesn't give the big picture. Um, and so they end up relying on the millions of dollars of ads that are spent by special interests that often deceive voters about uh, uh, who's behind uh, ballot measures. But when you look at the signers of ballot arguments, certainly there are some signers of ballot arguments that are you know, just meant to uh, 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 you know, tell, tell a story, but you also have very well-known established and trusted organizations that are actually the most common signers of ballot arguments. The League of Women Voters is, is probably the number one signer of ballot arguments for or against, and they do very in-depth uh, uh, analyses of, of their positions, right? You have other well-known and, and trusted groups like the Sierra Club, like ACLU, like AARP, like League of Conservation of Voters, like the California Chamber of Commerce, the Howard Tar Jarvis Taxpayers Association. These are all groups that have the time to, and expertise to do analyses that um, voters simply do not have the capability or time to, to do, and it means a lot to voters when they can look and see, okay, where are those organizations going? So we think that this will end up, there's new amendments that are going to limit fake organizations uh, from, from being uh, entered and therefore encourage trusted organizations like the League of Women Voters, AARP, the Chamber of Commerce, et cetera, to give voters the uh, information that will help them uh, make their decision in a way that they can't necessarily with, with confusing Thank title and summary. Thank you, Mr. Lang. Any other comments by supervisors? Seeing none, if you'll please call for the question. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. No. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes item 15. We'll now move on to item 16, which is a referral by Supervisor Ellenberg. Supervisor, there you go. Thank you. Um, as I discussed earlier this morning while presenting the proclamation for Black Maternal Health Week, there are tragic and persistent disparities in Black maternal and infant mortality across the US in California and right here in Santa Clara County. In the last 25 years, while pregnancy related mortality ratios fell 44% around the world, the American mor maternal mortality rate increased. American birthing people are now more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than any other high income country in the world. Black Americans are three to four times more likely to die giving birth than their white counterparts. The Federal Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2021 is a comprehensive package of 12 bills that aims to prevent, to end preventable mor maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity in the US and close disparities in maternal health outcomes. Passage of the Momnibus Bill would provide critical funding data and mechanisms to improve birth outcomes nationally, including for residents of Santa Clara County, and can inform our own local work to close maternal and infant health disparities. I'm reviewing other efforts as well, like uh, Senate Bill 65, introduced in the California Senate as the Momnibus Act, and SB 464 passed in 2019, the California Dignity in Pregnancy Act, uh, and intend to return to the board in the next month or so with a referral on local action we can take to build on existing local resources and partnerships to close maternal infant health disparities. Uh, today, I'd like to make a motion for my colleagues to join me in calling for the passage of the Federal Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act. Second. Thank, Thank you. you. We have a motion by Vice President Ellenberg, a second by Supervisor Sumidian. We'll turn to our one speaker here. We'll have one minute. Or the speakers we have will have one minute each. 
All right, one moment while we get the timer set. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Irvish, are you there? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. For uh, Senate Bill uh, 116, certainly, you know, uh, it is very uh, it is very imperative to to make sure that uh, uh, that uh, the S the Senate and the Assembly Bill they are you know being implemented respectively for uh, for the funding that is being provided by uh, by the uh, by the CSC uh, SB 16 as well as you know, it is also to make sure uh, for the SB 16 that the ex existing law you know which makes the uh, peace officer and the custodial officer to to make uh, to make about the postal record or specify records to be that be maintained by the any state or local agency. The information be obtained as per the confidential and the prohibited standard that is required to be maintained by the state. And as per the California Public Records Act, uh, the bill has been mandated and would be commencing also further from the from the two, uh, from the 2022. Make every incident involving the use of force use the force of a member of the public, comply with an officer. Thank you, Yervish. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, for bringing uh, this uh, type of policy, because what, what this does is it is it challenges to reorient the, the, the psychology of the American and the, the, the citizen of the county to know that, yes, you do. There is a moral and ethical obligation and a legal one. I would go so far as to argue a legal one to uh, rectify those systems that have, that ultimately created those statistics. One of the major things in terms of his research, because I read the commentary with respect to uh, John Steinbeck when he lived amongst all of these camps from 1936 to 1940. But in 1938, he wrote those two essays and he checked the mortality rates of the uh, coroner's office because that's where it started. That was, the, that was the core of the racism. Our next speaker is Lakeisha Bryant. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Akisha Bryan, field representative for Congressman Rokana, Congressional District 17, and a black mother who recently gave birth to a baby boy. I'm in full support of a referral to support the Federal Mominibus Act of 2021. As a first time mother who was pregnant during a pandemic, I remember going to my first doctor's appointment and feeling rushed and not heard. It's this experience would follow me throughout my pregnancy all the way up to delivery my, when my anesthesiologist became increasingly frustrated that I didn't properly arch my back during the epidural. If it wasn't for that black nurse who spoke on my behalf, then I'm not sure that my epidural would have been administered properly. Also, if it wasn't for programs like the Santa Clara County Black Infant Health Program, I would not have received the proper maternal education to keep myself and my baby healthy, to advocate for myself in the hospital and receive doula support before and after pregnancy. So I am in full support of the model of this act and we must adopt programs and policies at the county level. Thank you. Congrats that concludes our public speakers. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Not on this item, sir. Uh, once we've uh, com completed this item, if I could uh, just uh, correct an earlier statement. Uh, thank you. Certainly. Okay, so we've got Supervisor Ellenberg motion. I believe it was Smidian second. Yes. Oh, am I correct? Thank you. And we'll call for oh, Supervisor Ellenberg. Take yeah, yes for answer. All right. <laughs> I will will do that. But just wanted to note that um, Representative Kano is, was one of the original sponsors of the Monument Bill and want to give him that recognition. Wonderful. All right, Dave, the roll call, please. Uh, it looks oh, like Supervisor oh, Lee has his hand up, sir. Supervisor Lee, thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, Thanks very much for uh, pushing this forward, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, this is such an important issue. Uh, and as we've learned earlier today is uh, uh, that the issue of disparity between the African-American mothers and the rest of us are still very well and alive, not just elsewhere, but right here in Santa Clara County. We're talking about two, three, even four times higher infant mortality rate, and that's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, as much as we congratulate ourselves on doing a good job for Santa Clara County, 
uh, public health uh, and our hospitals, uh, these rates are uh, definitely something that we need to work really hard on, on, on working. Uh, these bills, uh, I've never learned the word momnibus. I looked it up. It doesn't exist, but it's a omnibus. Uh, for this purpose, it became the momnibus. So I think it's a very appropriate way of using this word, this new word that I've learned. Uh, but truly, uh, I'm glad the federal government uh, and, and Congress is taking a very active role on these issues with the, with the right Congress that we have. Uh, these things will hopefully uh, go through both the House and the Senate because yeah. it's absolutely so important for our, uh, 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 for our mothers uh, and, and for the children uh, of those babies. So I, I, I absolutely uh, strongly uh, support this and I want to uh, advocate also for our staff to make sure that our uh, own um, system here in Santa Clara County, that we pay that extra attention and make sure what you know, some of the experiences mentioned, like with uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Lakeisha here, uh, that's mentioned, that does not, uh, does not you know, is, is, is being, being uh, looked at and, and making sure that we are uh, delivering equity to all our mothers. Thank you. Thank you. David, roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes, and thank you. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you very thank you. much. And before we move on to item 17, I wanted to give Supervisor Simidian as much time as necessary to correct himself. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll only take a couple of seconds. Uh, I just wanted to say on item number 15, the Ballot Disclose Act, uh, I mentioned that I thought the uh, legislation last year had been uh, vetoed. And then as I started thinking about it after uh, we had wrapped up, uh, I wanted to double check myself. I did double check myself. I was wrong. I misspoke. Uh, the measure was not vetoed. It was held in committee. It simply uh, got held in committee and did not advance legislatively. Uh, and that may not be a, an important distinction for most, but I didn't want to leave my misstatement on the record without correcting it. Thank you for that 20, 30 seconds. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was enjoyable. All right, we move on to item number 17 now, which is brought forth by Supervisors Ellenberg and Simidian, which is two out of five already. Supervisors, one of you, Supervisor Simidian, your mic is on, go right ahead. I'm gonna to defer to um, Ms. Uh, Ellenberg. Uh, I'm happy to be her uh, second on this. I appreciate her leadership on these issues. All right. uh, as she will tell us this builds on some work uh, she and I did uh, earlier together. So let me say uh, thank you again, Supervisor Ellenberg, and through the chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Alrighty. Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you. Uh, this referral is also asking for support of our colleagues to advocate for legislation that would advance equity for kids in Santa Clara County. One out of every three children in Santa Clara County is food insecure. Last February, Supervisor Simidian and I introduced a referral to develop a pilot program to help high needs uh, school districts in Santa Clara County shift to a universal meals model that would promote greater access to nutritious meals uh, for kids, which is of course also shown to improve not only health, but academic outcomes. Since that time, of course, pandemic uh, caused local levels of food security to soar at the same time that schools closed. And we are all more aware than ever of the critical role that schools play in addressing food insecurity for families. SB 364, the Free School Meals for All Act, would take the same approach as our proposed county pilot to leverage federal funding to ensure that all students can access breakfast and lunch at school. And additionally, the inclusion of the BOOST program would extend the pandemic EBT model to cover families during the summers and school breaks, which has been an ongoing challenge in our county where only 13%, one three of, kid, of eligible kids are estimated to be reached by summer meal programs. This proposed legislation aligns precisely with the leadership this board has already undertaken to address child hunger in our county. And with that, to approve um, support of this bill and that will extend and expand upon our work here. That sounded like a motion to me and so we're submitting and I know seconded the motion. We've got a couple of speakers, David, a minute each. All right, one minute for each speaker. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. 
Thank you very much. Uh, just wanted to mention to all the Board of Supervisors, there are a few amendments that has been made to the bill on February 10, 2021, uh, for establishing the uh, the free school meals for the Act of 2021. It is imperative that you know once once such a bill is going to be implemented, the county works with the uh, with the respective food banks uh, uh, within the county jurisdiction, which will be which will be initiating the federal uh, programs for, for for providing the summer meals and the free meals to the school. It is imperative that you know such efforts be coordinated with the right set of standards and as well as right, as a, right set of a nonprofit organization to implement because the bill implementation actually requires a lot more scale and capacity to implement, not just the bill implementation in terms of passing the bill. School district, county superintendent of schools, kindergartens also required to be, uh, to be included on the bill. Uh, thank you very much for bringing up the bill and, and you know uh, putting on the agenda item. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, thank you. 20 years from now, sociologists are going to be having a spotlight on this particular moment in time. And you're going to be able to see that the, that the nexus between lack of education, for whatever reasons, the reasons doesn't matter. The lack of education, the poverty, the, the, the grief in the morning that has impacted the Latino community in ways that absolutely no other, no other community can relate to, probably with the exception of the Jew. And this is going to, do, that's going to be monetized. The prison system right now is lending money based on all of these numbers from all of these poor neighborhoods because they already know that there is a there was a causation, causal effect between those factors and how many beds they're going to need to build in the prison system. And so what they do is they borrow against those numbers because it's a secure, safe bed. This is how savage of a system that we're dealing with. So I appreciate the advocacy, but there needs to be. Our next speaker is Tracy Weatherby. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. Um, I'm Tracy Weatherby, the Vice President of Strategy and Advocacy for Second Harvest of Silicon Valley. As many of you know, we've been huge advocates for universal school meals, and we really appreciate the support of this board at the county level, especially as Supervisor Ellenberg and Sumidian. One of our core principles revolves around free school meals. We believe free school meals create equity and community by ensuring that every student has the nutrition they need to learn and thrive. And in turbulent times, universal school meals also ensure that school is a place where communities are created, not divided. Imagine if no child in California had to worry about where they would get breakfast and lunch. Imagine we didn't divide our children into free, reduced, and paid kids, but simply lived in a society where every child knew that when they came to school for their free education, they would get the meals they needed to ensure they were ready to learn and thrive. We would greatly appreciate your support of this crucial effort to support our communities, which leverages a huge amount of federal dollars. Thanks for your consideration. Our next speaker is Debbie Austin. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello. Hi, I'm Debbie Austin. I'm the director of child nutrition in Mountain View Wisconsin School District. It's K through eight students. We have 4,784 children enrolled in our schools. I'm here today to ask you to please submit a letter of support for Senate Bill 364, which, which would provide free school meals for all children. It is so important. This bill would also provide financial support to families in the form of boost EPT when schools are closed for scheduled breaks and unexpected times as these. During the pandemic, families have had access to the pandemic EBT program, which provided critical food benefits to children while schools were closed. The boost nutrition program will build on that success to ensure that low income children who have access to nutritious food for all. Food justice starts at school. Each child should have access to clean water and food and not be hampered by hunger. Families thrive when their children are well fed. Thank you for your support. It's much. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you very much. All right, Supervisor Submitting, and I cut you off when I went to the speaker. Did you have anything you needed to add on um, to your joint motion with Supervisor Ellenberg? Um, uh, forgive me, I'm uh, managing the tech here. Uh, just, just to say that, as was alluded to by a couple of the speakers, um, I think our board certainly is mindful of uh, the breadth and depth of hunger insecurity, but 
it is not always fully realized, I think, that there really are educational implications to uh, hunger insecurity among uh, school age children. And uh, so I'm, I'm pleased that uh, that reference was made. Uh, this really does uh, speak to not only the nutritional needs of the you know, 6 million kids in California's public schools, but uh, um, the, the ability, uh, their ability to get the kind of education uh, that we hope they will get and that we think they deserve. And I'm happy to support the measure. Thank you. Got the motion. We have the second. Dave, call for the question or roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Smith, your county executive report. Uh, <clears throat> I will pass um, on timing grounds. Thank you. James Williams, your county council report. One moment. At the April 5th, 2021 closed session by unanimous vote with all members present, the board authorized the county to file or join amicus briefs in community housing improvement program versus city of New York. U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit case number 20-CV-03366. This case challenges the constitutionality of New York City's rent control laws specifically relating to the takings clause and the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. That concludes my report. Thank you very much for that report. Supervisor Simidia, on uh, item number 20, did you have some additional comments or things that you wish to um, make at this time? I've reviewed you... the materials and I'm prepared to move the recommendation. Thank you. I'll take that as a motion on 20. I'll be happy to second that. We have one speaker for one minute, and then we will break for lunch. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, thank you. With respect to what was just mentioned, that is the core of my argument. The core, the core of my argument is this, is that the, the Mexicans have been denied two, uh, two constitutionally protected rights, due process of law and equal protection under the law, under the fifth and the 14th amendments. And, and this is a very easy argument for me to win. I can argue this in court and win. I, I can do it. I don't want to go that route to put, to put my county and my city on blast like that in those courtrooms because I can articulate it succinctly, directly, and accurately, and no one will be able to challenge me on it because it's correct. It's not my opinion. It's not a fact. It's the truth. And so this is the kind of reality that we have to orient ourselves in if we, if we hope to have the words equity have any substance to it at all. Thank you. Next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, as item number 20 agenda, it is imperative to know that uh, there are, uh, with the SB 980 bill, there are privacy uh, there were privacy uh, with the privacy and genetic testing, uh, you know, conducted by the companies. There are certain uh, certain act, uh, certain uh, mandates, you know, that has been made to the SB 980 bill for the DNA analysis as a part of a uh, as a part of a, a biometric information such as the consumers de uh, uh, deoxy uh, acid uh, that is being collected. The act requires that the business that collects the consumer's personal information at the point of collection be informed the consumer with regards to the category of the information that is being collected and also allow them to opt out of such information as well. When such analysis being performed, such bills are required to be implemented as well. The Senate Bill 222 uh, also clarifies a similar prohibition and the disclosure in terms of a healthcare services to be provided along with the genetic testing and a DNA analysis. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you very much. We have a motion by Simidian, a second by Wasserman. I don't see any hands raised. Dave, will you please call for the question? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. 
Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank, Thank you. you. We're all going to break for lunch now. We will return at 1.10 with items number 11 and 12, which is to be heard no earlier than 1 o'clock, our, uh, our um, the normal COVID presentation we have. Thank you all very much. We'll see you at 1.10.
And I need one Supervisor Chavez. And there she is. All right, Dave, would you please take roll? Supervisor Lee. Present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Siminian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. President Wasserman. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now turn to items 11 and 12. Dr. Cody will open up with you, or perhaps James, or perhaps Jeff, or perhaps Dr. Tarver, perhaps Dr. Kester <laughs> Scheib. Good afternoon, Supervisor Wasserman and members of the board. I, I'm here with all the good doctors um, to uh, give our update on the COVID-19 pandemic here in Santa Clara County. Um, I'll start and then actually the majority of the presentation today will be Dr. Fenstersheid. Um, many of our team members are taking well-deserved breaks. So we're a smaller team, uh, but we'll give you uh, all, all the updates. So just to start with the first slide, the um, overall pandemic in our county is what we've seen is that our our case numbers have flattened. So remember they were, at last we um, gave you the presentation, they were falling but slowly and now they are essentially flat. Uh, some days they tick up, some days they tick down, but overall the pattern is uh, flat for the last uh, for the last two weeks. In the next, and you also just want to note that very, very, very few, just a scattering of cases associated with long-term care facility staff or residents, um, which is excellent news, um, uh, reflecting the vaccination that of course started first in long-term care facilities in mid-December. Next slide. When we look at the case rates um, by county section, uh, we can see that the case rates are declining everywhere and some of these gaps are closed. But if you were able to zoom in, you would still see that we still have the highest case rates uh, in Gilroy and South County, followed by East San Jose, uh, and then the rest of the county sections. In the next slide, you can see our case rates by race ethnicity. And the disparities are um, closing. Uh, rates in all groups have been decreasing, um, but still the uh, Hispanic Latino population case rates in that group do remain elevated among other groups as they have throughout the pandemic. Next slide. The deaths in our county, uh, thankfully, uh, are declining. The last two weeks, those data are still preliminary, so they're grayed out. But what you can see is we're reaching, these are um, uh, deaths by week, um, and we're, we're down to where we were um, last summer um, and late spring, um, which is very welcome news. And again, I think reflects the uh, strategy to vaccinate those first above 65 uh, who are more likely to die of COVID if infected. The next slide shows the number of patients hospitalized uh, per day across the county. And you can see that um, it's still declining, although very gradually, it's um, starting to become a bit flat. And Dr. Kamal will talk more about the hospital status across our hospitals uh, later on in the presentation. Next slide. Uh, this is the uh, where we sit with the blueprint, and again, the unadjusted case rate in the um, dotted line and the adjusted case rate adjusted for testing in the solid line. Uh, both of those rates are still decreasing, um, but as you can see, they're starting to flatten. According to the blueprint metrics that were published today, we remain in the orange tier, as I believe uh, all the counties in the Bay Area uh, are remaining in the orange tier. Our um, adjusted case rate was uh, somewhere between two and three, I can't quite recall. Um, and our unadjusted case rate was um, a, a little above five. Next slide. This shows the testing uh, while our testing 
remains higher than the state median, uh, which is shown in, um, in uh, orange, uh, you can see that testing across our county uh, is also slowly beginning, uh, slowly declining uh, and has been uh, since early January. Next slide. This shows our test positivity uh, uh, decreasing. It's now just a little bit lower. It stands at 1% in the blueprint for this week. So uh, quite solidly within the yellow tier. Next slide. And testing in the lowest quartile is also decreasing. Um, it's now uh, just a little bit above two. Um, uh, and so getting uh, close to the yellow tier. Next slide. And before I turn the presentation over to uh, Dr. Fenstersheib, I just wanted to say a little bit about variants. Um, as you all know, we're really in a race right now between the variants and the vaccine. Um, we have detected all variants of concern in our county, uh, thankfully still in small numbers. Um, but I just wanted to to just put this context around what you what you've seen as far as the numbers, which looks very encouraging that our rates have been decreasing to staying flat. But I think it's really the variants that threaten to undo the progress that we've made. The variants, uh, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is one where its job really is to adapt and change, and it will continue to adapt and change. And so we're really on the lookout for variants that, that, that cause havoc in one way or another. Either they spread more easily or they cause people to be more sick or somehow they escape the therapies or vaccines that have been designed for them. Um, the variant that most, um, the California variant, the also known as B1427 or B1429, um, it has uh, a few properties. It's a little bit easier to spread. And that's the variant that's um, of all the variants more prevalent in the state and in our county. But it's followed by the UK variant, which we're beginning to pick up increasingly. And that's quite a bit more transmissible and associated with increased disease severity. The good news is that so far, the vaccines uh, that we have deployed are performing well uh, against these variants, um, but we just have to continue to be watchful because of course it's the uh, virus's job uh, to evade whatever it is that we put up. And so the goal here is to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible particularly in communities that have been hardest hit, where the virus has amplified um, most prominently over the pandemic. So I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Fenstersheib for an update on vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Cody. And um, you have me for a few of these presentations. Again, as Dr. Cody mentioned, that some of the staff were taking well-deserved breaks uh, this week. Okay, so um, on our challenges in the vaccine world, as all of us know, the vaccine <clears throat> allocations continue to be inadequate. We hope they will improve over the coming weeks, um, but clearly our eligibility and our demand far exceed our current supply. And in fact, we are probably only using about a third of our capacity given that limited supply. Um, we also have our challenges in closing the disparity and equity gap. And of course, not having enough vaccine just further widens the gap uh, for us. And of course, the issues around vaccine hesitancy, which are ongoing. Next slide. So this is a, um, a slide showing eligibility, where we have been, where, where we are now, and where we are going. and. Um, Currently, we've expanded as of April 1st to individuals who are 50 years of age and older, and then everyone else in previous eligibility tiers um, are still coming in uh, to be vaccinated. Um, all of these eligibility um, requirements or expansions are basically coming from the state. We have no say in uh, changing any of these or making new eligibility criteria. 
Um, the state has told us, though, that as of the 15th of April, we will expand to including everyone, all adults 16 years of age and older, um, to be eligible for vaccine. And again, we hope that there will be sufficient supply by then. Next slide. This is a screenshot from our dashboard, and um, we have just um, bypassed the 40 percent number for the um, individuals, the number of individuals in our community who have had at least one dose of vaccine. So 40 percent, I think, is very, very good um, and probably doing better than certainly doing better than other areas in our state and certainly in our country and also nearing 25 percent or a quarter of individuals who have completed their vaccine. I would point out also that the seven-day average, which is that red squiggly line, is showing nearly 20,000 doses of vaccine on average um, given per day. Let's move to the next slide. If you take all of the data on our dashboard, um, which is all available there, but I just uh, broke it down into some of these main categories. I already mentioned that 40, over 40% 40 of the adults 16 years of age and older who are vaccinated. But when you look at the breakdown by race and ethnicity, you can see um, some of the gaps uh, which have been ongoing, especially, I, I would say the African, African ancestry gap is narrowing. Um, the Asian uh, percentages have always been above average and the Latino Hispanic uh, uh, discrepancies are dis or disparities are basically improving slightly, but um, not a lot. Um, if you look at the 50 years and older, that is our new eligibility criteria. We are very happy that we have 56 individuals who have had at least um, one dose that are 50 years of age and older. And you can look at the uh, breakdown by race and ethnicity. It's pretty similar in all age groups. But again, pointing out over 65, we're well over 70% of those individuals vaccinated. Next slide. Since we were talking about um, the increasing numbers of people vaccinated in our community, I just wanted to bring up again where we're trying to head. Um, before we had any vaccines, of course, we were just using our preventive measures because we had uh, no other way, means of keeping transmission down. And so the likelihood was very high, obviously, uh, for spreading of the disease. As we started to begin our vaccination, we have some people vaccinated. I, again, at this point, a quarter of our population, but that's not nearly enough. Um, and so continued transmission occurs if we are not following our preventive measures. So that's why even as we are vaccinating, it is critical to continue wearing our masks, social distancing, and all of the things that we have been learn we have been taught to do over the last year. As we move towards vaccinating more of our community, um, we hope that we will reach um, the condition of herd immunity, which would mean that we had enough people vaccinated that the virus basically would have very few susceptible individuals to um, transmit to. Uh, there's a lot of variables with herd immunity. Um, and if everybody were vaccinated, we could reach that goal. But the question is, we, we know that not everybody um, wants to be vaccinated. Uh, we know that as of yet, we don't have anyone under 16 um, eligible for vaccine. So um, again, we're moving cautiously along. But the key, as Dr. Cody mentioned, is a race against the variants in trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible and that are eligible. So we all have to work toward that end. Next slide. Uh, we're returning the slide um, of complexity to you of, of basically showing the allocation schema um, for how vaccine comes into our, in, into our county. We all know that the federal government has been providing vaccine directly to the phar retail pharmacies that have been working in our skilled nursing facilities and long-term care facilities. And that has been working very well. We have augmented some of that work through our mobile unit. You can see that on the right-hand side of this particular chart. And that just the um, information here is that program will be ending on April 7th. So again, uh, we know that it isn't 100% complete, but our mobile units are working to uh, bring up those vaccination rates in those facilities. 
Also, the federal government is providing ongoing and increasing numbers of vaccines to the federally qualified health centers, the FQHC clinics, um, and we expect to see uh, additional vaccines coming through that corridor in the next com coming weeks. Um, the county's own FQHCs have applied for vaccine um, and will be looking to receive vaccine over the next week or so. The local pharmacies, the retail programs, which also include our pharmacies associated with the county system, are having increasing numbers of uh, vaccine doses being allocated to them. Um, for this, for instance, this past week, we had nearly 30,000 doses of vaccine being allocated to retail pharmacies. So that's your CVSs and Walgreens. They added Costco and Walmart to that list. And all of those vaccines and those links are available on our, on our website. So that's a good thing. Um, then when we come to the state, uh, the, government the state government receives vaccine from the federal government and working again through the TPA, the Blue Shield, vaccine is coming directly to our multi-county entities, the Kaisers and the PAMPs, the Sutter system. And then um, we are receiving vaccine um, after the agreement that was signed and the addendum that was agreed upon. The county receives an allocation and we provide uh, through, through that allocation to our uh, existing clinics. And then we also support the community health system, the community clinics, the uh, community health partnership and other clinics, which include seven clinics, and those are listed on this chart. And um, those entities, those providers, including Stanford, El Camino, and the Bay Area um, Health Committee, Health Clinic, um, have signed on their own the TPA uh, with Blue Shield, and so they received direct allocations. However, that dotted, that dotted arrow shows <clears throat> that we are actually have eyes and have, through that agreement, um, an opportunity to discuss and to make recommendations and advise the TPA on allocations to those entities that have signed directly with, T with Blue Shield. We do not have eyes, again, on the Kaiser or the Sutter system. Okay, sorry for that complicated slide. Let's move on. This week's allocation coming in this week uh, that we received information on and were allocated last week, but it's arriving this week, um, are, are as follows. The Pfizer uh, doses of 35,000. Again, you can see last week we had um, a little bit more. The Moderna, 17,200. Last week we had a little bit more, but the uh, Johnson & Johnson, we got a considerable amount in addition to above what we got last uh, week. Um, nearly 20,000 doses. And that's because the state received um, over a half million doses of Johnson & Johnson. So 71,900 doses of vaccine coming to us. It does, again, those numbers do not include the uh, multi-county entity, the Kaiser numbers uh, or the Sutter numbers. Let's move on. And this is a breakdown uh, showing um, how the um, basic uh, disparities, the uh, equity issues show up on this linear graph. And you can see, as we saw the numbers before, how that plays out um, on this particular graph. And the Latino population, Hispanic population, again, you can see the gap where they are at 23%. Next slide. So this is a um, vaccination record of numbers of vaccinations given per day. And you can see that um, overall the numbers are increasing. The dark blue bars show the first doses and the orange bars show the second doses of vaccine. So the good news then when you look at it is that we have considerable more uh, first doses of vaccine available in our community. And um, so that, that, again, that's a good thing. Next. This is our county health system. And I think we pointed out a couple of weeks ago that we had so few first dose appointments because we had so much um, of that orange bars, those, those second doses. But now, as you see, um, moving to the, to the right side of that graph, that there are, there's a lot more blue in the way of those particular bars representing more first doses of vaccine. And in fact, this week, uh, we opened up 52,000 first dose appointments uh, that are opening up this week. 
from the county system. So that's, again, a good thing. And you can see, if you can barely see that um, dotted uh, or that broken red line that's showing the increasing amount of first doses that we have available. Next slide. Um, this is, a, I think, a very interesting slide to show who has the vaccine, which providers are providing over time the vaccine doses in our community. The county system is in the dark blue bars, and we were going considerably up, and then you can see that we started to dip a bit, and that's, again, because we weren't getting enough vaccine allocated, but we are picking up again. Again, the dark green bars, uh, you'll note that that's the Kaiser system, and so we're very happy that Kaiser is starting to get increasing amount of vaccine, but we, we don't think it's quite enough yet and hope that they will be allocated more. The light-colored salmon, I would point, point out, is, a, um, is, is showing you how much the retail pharmacies are adding to our vaccine allocation. And as I mentioned, there was about 29,000 doses uh, given to the retail pharmacies. It doesn't show 29,000 there because some of those doses were given to out-of-county residents um, and, and what we're showing here are just the county residents. It's that there are um, additional locations. And um, I think as of yesterday, the count was 65 locations in our county for uh, retail pharmacies. Move on. Uh, so we had talked about um, bringing some data to you, uh, looking at the uh, Asian subgroups and um, there, I, it's a big challenge, and I think our epidemiological team, our epi team, has worked very hard uh, to bring this data to us. Uh, in fact, Cam Stoddard is here today with me because for sure I won't get this right. But um, they've been very challenged in, in bringing this data to us. The, the, the main limitation of the data system is because the Asian subgroups, as you can see there, are not captured in the CARE system. So the CARE system, remember, is the California immunization registry, and that's where all of the vaccine data is get is put as you are vaccinated, but it does not have the subgroups captured. Um, the county does ask for subgroup data from patients um, served in our own clinics here, but we have found that over 55% of the Asians um, who identify as being Asian did not uh, fill out the subgroup field. So the analysis of the limited data that we have now is done with, um, with a different type of algorithm, basically uh, using uh, surnames under, under an algorithm, which again, I'm not even gonna attempt to explain to you. But if you want, if you want to ask Pam, she is available after, the, uh, after my presentation. Um, there are many limitations in doing this analysis, um, but this is about the best we have. I also would mention also that the subgroups were uh, assigned to 79% of people who, would, who were identifying in Asia, as Asian, 21% uh, had no match. So already there's a limitation of about uh, 20%. So what do we see? So if you, you first have to realize that all of this data is subgrouping of those people who have identified as Asian. So that's a sub, all of these are subsets of Asian subgroups are Chinese, Filipino, Indian, and Vietnamese. And so if you look at the first category of Chinese, of all of the Chinese uh, population within the, within the Asian uh, race that have identified themselves um, as Chinese, the population um, that has been vaccinated with at least one dose within the Chinese population is 25%. Do the same for Filipino. All the Filipino population, about a quarter have received the vaccine. And same with the Indian population, uh, about 24%. But of note, the Vietnamese population, um, half of the population uh, that is 16 years of age or older has received a vaccine. Again, please take this with um, that, the idea that there's a lot of limitations um, and potential errors in, this, uh, in these data. Next slide. We also have we also have some data from our own system, and this is a little bit different. So again, this is the category of everybody who's identified as Asian. And then the teal bars are taking that population and showing you what the breakdown is by population, um, by subpopulation within the Asian population. So for instance, within the Asian population, 
in the county, 30% are Chinese, 14% Filipino, and so on. The orange bars basically are showing the proportion of vaccine that uh, has been given by our county system divided up proportionately amongst the population. So of, uh, for instance, looking at the Chinese population, um, they make up 30% of Asians and uh, they were vaccinated at a rate of 20% of the vaccine that we provided was, was provided to Chinese. But again, of note, uh, the Vietnamese represent 19, nearly 20% of the Asian population in the community, but uh, received a much higher percentage of the, popula of the vaccine at nearly 40%. Let's move on. And again, just to remind you that we have a very active uh, website at sccfreevax.org. As soon as you go on, you can find an appointments a button there, or if you want to see all this data, you can go to the far right and see the vaccine data. That'll take you to the, the appointment data. Uh, the appointment link will take you to the buttons on the right, and we have all of those buttons that are available for you to find the provider of your choice. Um, and we've added the retail pharmacies also that'll take you to the site where you can make appointments with any of them. Next and next. So um, I, as far as our mobile, vaccina uh, mobile vaccination efforts, to remind you, we have six mobile vac teams. And they are divided up into doing work in the long-term care area, uh, the skilled nursing facilities, as I was talking about earlier. And they are also involved along with county fire and other fire agencies in doing in-home uh, vaccinations. And you can see in the first green block there that at the bottom, we have 85 of those scheduled this week for in-home vaccination. And then all of the other listed uh, SNF and long-term care facilities will be visited this week. The middle is our, are the teams that are dealing with place-based vaccinations. And you can see all of the places that we will be this week um, with our mobile units. And then this week also just one work-based uh, team will be going out again to, um, Mont to Monterey Mushroom. The total given, the total doses given when we added them up was about 22,000 dose, 22, doses so far of vaccine that has been given, that, uh, that has been administered by our mobile team. They have 6,500 doses of vaccine scheduled this week uh, to be administered and also another 6,500 next week to be administered. Next slide. And where are they going? Well, when we look at all uh, the places they are going and where they're using all that vaccine, um, exactly in the targeted areas where they need to be going, nearly um, 30, nearly 40 percent um, going to the east side, over a quarter of it going to the South County and some to other areas. And those are mainly uh, rel related to the area to the work they're doing in the skilled and long-term care areas. So those facilities might not be in East Side or South County. And on the outreach side, um, the outreach teams are very busy. Their, compa their capacity is increasing. You can see this is a daily chart of what they're doing. Um, you can see the lull that we had um, last month and earlier, earlier a couple of weeks ago that we basically didn't have the vaccine available, so we couldn't make the appointment. But now that we're getting more and more vaccine, they now have a capacity of nearly 5,000 vaccine appointments, and they're working to, um, to increase that. Um, the outreach team is also working to support our mobile vaccine by finding new sites. And uh, this coming week, they will be providing some training to new community groups um, in the North County to teach them how to do scheduling, and actually a uh, vaccine scheduling event at Mountain View Community Center is scheduled on April 25th. So we will have um, a, an outreach scheduling uh, potential up in the north of the county. Next. And then if you just break down the number of uh, vaccines that we're actually doing by race and ethnicity, again, fulfilling the the uh, goal and the priorities of providing most of it in the Latin and the Hispanic communities and also in the Asian communities. So they are doing what they set out to do, which is, um, which is even improving to this day. 
Okay, so um, I will move on. You just have me for a little bit longer and then I'll be done. Um, as far as testing goes, um, I, you know, the overall issue is that we're just not utilizing all of the testing that we have. The capacity is down um, quite a bit. Um, of course, that this particular chart doesn't look so bad. The numbers aren't, but the counties, the county's numbers are dropping. There are other facilities that are actually, as you'll see, doing um, quite a bit of testing. The good thing, as Dr. Cody mentioned, is our positivity rate is overall way down at the 1% level. So that's good. And the next slide is just showing you again that overall there's a drop in the amount of testing, more so in the um, east side and south county and um, uh, somewhat of a larger gap um, in areas where testing is done outside of those two. Next slide. And this is again showing the fall in overall positivity. Um, and in the east side and south county, again, the positivity numbers, which we know have always been elevated, are, are also down considerably, but a little bit more elevated than the rest of the county. Next slide. And again, um, this is showing our other providers. I would just point that we see this kind of every time I present it, never doesn't ever look that different, but um, I would note Stanford. Stanford has done some a, a lot of testing this past week, and I'm not. I tried to find out who they're testing. Uh, maybe it's the students that are coming in, um, the juniors and seniors, but I don't. I don't know that for sure. And then you can see that on, on the next slide, which is the trends, and you can see that everything is dropping as far as testing. But that red line there is Stanford, and how that's that's in, the only one that's really increased. The next slide is a. Um, a look as we always do for the uh, fairground site. And again, overall, you can just see that the numbers have dropped, and um, but also our positivity has dropped. And the next slide is just all of the data, uh, a breakdown of what we're doing at the fairgrounds. And the uh, positivity overall is a, it's always been a little higher than, than the rest of the county. And if you look down, you can see Latino and Hispanic levels, which are the highest, nearly 5% of uh, people coming um, to the fairgrounds, Latinos are, are, are positive. Next slide. And then I always show uh, what it looked like a couple of weeks ago at 4.9%. You can look at the Latino Hispanic, for instance, and then what it looked like um, over just this last week. So it's a little decline, but not much, still about 4.5%. And then just a reminder on this last slide, um, how we've all said that testing is so very important as a public health tool, along with vaccines, and especially as we're waiting to be vaccinated, we really, really have to continue to do all of our preventive measures, um, including being tested. So we really, really want to get that message out to everyone, especially people on the front line, to be, you can, there's plenty of capacity. If you want to be tested every week, come on down. Um, and it's, it's really important that we make that message clear. Okay, I think this next one, of course, is just was just the um, was just the pop-up site testing site uh, days and where we're going to be, but we don't need to dwell on that one. You can just refer to it as you need, um, and then I'll move on to turning this over to Dr. Kamal for an update on our healthcare system preparedness. Thank you, Dr. Fentershad. Next slide, please. So our COVID-19 hospitalizations have been quite stable, maybe decreasing a little bit, and we're continuing to monitor trends that may suggest increased severity of illness along with the variants Dr. Cody mentioned. Next slide, please. So this is our big graph showing our hospitalizations. As you can see, we continue to trend slightly downwards from the peaks we had over the winter, and we are now down to just about 100 total COVID positive patients in the hospitals. That includes both ICU and non-ICU patients, right? So here's the same graph I showed last week, which is, or two weeks ago, which shows that the number of new hospitalizations has gone down. Uh, however, the length of stay continues to trend upwards. In speaking with hospitals, the major driver of this most likely is that those remaining in the hospital tend to be the sicker people who may have been admitted uh, months ago. 
So it doesn't necessarily mean that the newly admitted people are um, any sicker than they were. It just means that the people left in the hospital tend to be of a higher severity of illness. Uh, next slide. And in terms of the other metrics we're keeping an eye on, we're looking at the percent of all cases that have been hospitalized, which looks like it's gone down a little bit and it's certainly down from up to 10% earlier in the pandemic. And then of the patients who are hospitalized, what percent get admitted to the ICU? And these, once again, look like maybe a slight uptick, but we're keeping an eye on that once again as the variants continue to emerge in our, in our community. Next slide. At this slide here, so is the percent of hospitalized patients for COVID who are 65 and over. And as you can see, the percent has gone down in the most recent two months. Uh, the most likely explanation for this is that we have successfully vaccinated some of our older people. However, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that does this mean that COVID is perhaps attacking a younger age group, which appears to be possible, especially with the B117 variant. Um, however, given that our total number of hospitalizations aren't going up, um, it's more likely this just reflects the impact of vaccination on older people. Next slide. Here we see the number of beds remaining. As you can see, we are out of that red zone. And at this point, the hospital beds are mostly related to the hospitals flexing up and down depending on demand rather than uh, unrelenting demand for COVID patients. And uh, next slide. Um, in terms of PPE, we continue to do very well. Um, we've been working with the hospitals, continue to talk to them every week to make sure that there aren't any impending uh, shortages, in particular as we ramp up vaccination and um, uh, look at uh, more people being eligible. We're trying to make sure needles and gloves and all those are in good supply and so far the hospitals are very comfortable with that. Our therapeutic supply remains adequate and our staffing uh, situation also remains quite good and stable. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Ballier. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. Next slide, please. We continue responding to concerns uh, filed through our portal at sccovidconcerns.org. And as of March 28th, you can see we recently just uh, breached the 9,000 mark, which is a tremendous number of complaints filed by the community. Really want to commend the community's diligence in reporting these potential violations to our office and through our portal. We continue to resolve about two thirds of those through an educational manner, such as a phone and email response, with only about a third going to on site inspection, uh, which includes the proactive compliance checks that we were performing. Uh, we had issued about 740 notices of violation during that time. And again, consistent with some of the past reports, food retail, uh, retail trade, and gym and fitness being the top three sectors. Next slide. Uh, continue good news on the number of complaints that are coming in, and I know it's hard to make out on the right side there, but we continue to see a significant decline in the number of concerns that are coming through the portal, uh, which bodes well for compliance with it with throughout the community. Next slide. I turn it over to Consuelo. Good afternoon, members of the board. Hong Kao with the Office of Supportive Housing and I will be providing the status of the isolation quarantine support program. Next slide, please. So from the start of the pandemic through March 31st, the INQ program has helped nearly 2,149 persons, including persons without a permanent home to isolate or quarantine in hotels. And you'll note that this is a slight increase from when we last reported due to a recent data reconciliation in our database. We've provided supportive services and over 857,000 in groceries and other necessities to help over 4,100 households to isolate or quarantine at home. And we've distributed over $9 million in direct financial and rental assistance to nearly 4,400 households. Next slide, please. And since we last reported to the board between March 18th through March 31st, we have helped 43 persons isolate or quarantine safely in a motel. And we've provided 156 households with in-home support and 228 households with financial assistance. And to continue meeting our goal to assist um, households with assistance within the first 24 hours from when we receive the referral. Next slide, please. And 
this graph shows the program trend for total households assisted, which continues to mirror the number of cases countywide on a seven day moving average. And I will now turn it over to my colleagues in the social services agency to present the next slides. Good afternoon. This is uh, Frank Mata, and I'm a project manager with the Social Services Agency Administration. Um, we wanted to uh, bring you the board up to date on the food and uh, meal programs as we've responding to the COVID pandemic. Over the first, uh, over this last 12 months, we reporting that we have maintained a senior nutrition program increase of 40%. This has been in enrollment numbers as well as those seniors um, accessing grab and go meals. Uh, as a result of this, we are executing agreements uh, to continue to address this higher um, this higher need through through the at least a fiscal year and into the the next year um, knowing that this isn't going to be a hard clip drop off but maybe a tapering off um, after things settle um, we also are addressing a gap a significant drop gap in the health trust meals on wheels program um, for the county outside of the city of san jose they had significant um, increases in enrollment uh, leaving with about a 30,000 meal gap that the um, county is filling with, uh, with Older Americans Act funding, uh, FEMA and other emergency funds. Um, we have continued to meet monthly with the food uh, network providers, if you will. Uh, uh, these are meal providers as well as um, second harvest grocery and uh, food providers to uh, monitor very closely uh, upticks and uh, growing needs as well as uh, what may be needed to support the system. Uh, certainly last but not least, over the last 12 months, we have had a sustained um, increase of approximately 20% uh, increase in the number of individuals receiving CalFresh benefits. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, Overall, this uh, slide just breaks out some of the highlights of some selected programs, what you saw before uh, in terms of the 40% uh, increase, but uh, we, we are looking at almost, a, you know, 220, over 223,000 additional senior meals, additional 30,000 health trust meals on wheels. Uh, the county as a whole has uh, distributed 200, over 250,000 Great Plate meals. That's a very specific uh, state sponsored program. Uh, there have been over 12 and a half million school meals provided and an additional uh, 191,000, over 191,000 child and over, uh, as you can see, a great number of adult family meals distributed. Uh, we continue to coordinate with various San Jose programs and also with our office of housing for the quarantine meals. Next slide, please. Uh, a significant uh, change in the federal SNAP or in California, the CalFresh program has been that there has been an emergency allotment, which took all families to the maximum grant amount for the CalFresh program. And beginning this last January uh, for uh, the COVID, period, uh, which will be ending September of, of this year, as defined federally, uh, that there's a 15% supplement attached to all CalFresh benefits. So uh, the chart below shows what uh, families enrolled in CalFresh are receiving uh, throughout the county uh, at, during this period of time. Next slide, please. Uh, for school meals, uh, the school uh, in-person instruction in, is, is going to be governed by individual school districts. Uh, this will not disrupt the current uh, food program as, as it's been explained to us that there will be continuing to be the school distributed meals and the family and child meals. Uh, 
the, this will still be an important part of the learning process as most uh, schools will either have a morning or afternoon session and uh, the food that they're they're providing and uh, will, will help the families focus and be able to uh, to succeed. Next uh, slide. Uh, going forward, we are going to be focusing our, administra uh, our administrative aspects on this to uh, move the state towards a different, more family-focused uh, CalFresh recertification policy. This will certainly help our, uh, our enrollment numbers uh, maintain over time. Uh, we want continued community input in terms of tracking needs and uh, monitoring sources of community investment. And we will continue with collaboration coordination through our major key stakeholders, school district, Second Harvest, City of San Jose, and, and others in the community. And last slide, please. Oh, that, that will do that. We'll be back to me, it sounds like. Dr. Marty, did we end that where you wanted? Looks like we're okay. That, that wraps up our presentation, Supervisor Wasserman. We're happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Cody. Appreciate that. And anyone uh, listening to this part of the agenda that um, wishes to speak, well, we can get into that after the supervisor's questions. Supervisors, I'm just going to go down the list here. Supervisor Lee, any questions that you have? Does anybody yes, have? Oh, Supervisor Lee. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I uh, it took me a while to unmute. <laughs> it's been like that all day today for all of us. So first of all, thank you very much for the wonderful uh, presentation, Dr. Cody and Dr. Fenshan and everybody else uh, who spoke just now. Uh, very excited about the the new numbers uh, that we are definitely trending uh, better. Um, seeing that our number is stabilizing, I, I certainly hope that it would continue dropping, but at least we we're not really necessarily going up. Um, one thing is a bit con disconcerting is the fact that it looks like those who are being um, hospitalized now seems to have increased severity at, uh, as shown by the length of stay going up. Um, do you have any um, uh, uh, data to see why this is the case, why these cases seem to be more severe? Is it because of the new variants that we're facing? Uh, thank you, Supervisor. Yeah, I've spoken uh, at length with the hospitals regarding this, and many have seen the trend. At this point, we don't think there's any change in the virus or the severity of illness. It merely reflects the fact that those people who are still in the hospital tend to be people who were admitted maybe weeks or months ago and are of the sicker type. So all the sort of not as sick people have been discharged, and now it's just remaining the people who have been there for a long time. So when we look at the average length of stay of people being discharged, it's higher. But I don't think this necessarily reflects the variety of illness, but we are keeping an eye on that um, going forward. Yeah, thank you. And the uh, the patient that's coming in too seems to be uh, dropping in age, which in some ways is good because obviously we know the older patients tends to have higher risk of uh, more severity and, and death. So uh, right now we are looking um, much, many more are younger patients, correct? That is correct, proportionately. So the total number is down and the number of elderly people is down even more, um, right. proportionately speaking. Right. Um, the other thing that is unfortunate is that we are able to see that uh, all the variants that we have been uh, hearing in the news, whether UK or Brazil or South Africa, or there's this California variants, as they say, uh, we have it all in our county, correct? That is correct. Sir. Okay. Um, I'm glad to see that we are certainly still very vigilant as a state and certainly as a county. Uh, things that is worrisome, of course, is looking at some of the other states, which obviously have very different policies in terms of uh, getting rid of mass mandate, like I think Texas and Florida. Uh, and some of the numbers also have been increasing uh, in Michigan uh, quite dramatically recently, uh, and people are talking about a fourth wave. Um, 
how likely do you think this fourth wave will potentially be affecting us as well? The, the truth is we don't know. Um, I think it's going to depend on a number of things. One, people's behavior. Will people continue to wear masks and uh, conduct most activities outdoors and keep, keep a distance from people outside their households? Um, and uh, the other variable is how quickly will we get vaccine supply? Uh, as you know, that's really the limiting variable for us. It's not our capacity to vaccinate. It's the supply of vaccine that we can deploy. Um, so if we can get our supply up and vaccinate really fast, um, both in our county and around the state, you know, we might be able uh, to avoid a surge or a swell, um, but it's really a little early to call it. All right, we just don't know in this race between vaccine and the emergence of variants, um, which one is going to move faster. Right. I mean, as we saw, uh, I mean, some of the images, seeing what happened at the Texas Ranger Stadium, I think was it yesterday, where they have what a packed stadium of 30,000 people, um, mostly not wearing any mask, full capacity, uh, is in my mind absolutely horrifying. Uh, if there is a mass spread event, that absolutely qualifies as one. And, and I'm very glad that our state, or none of our stadium is doing that of anything. Our 49 er stadium is actually a mass vaccination sites. So hopefully uh, now that we are getting our FQHCs uh, being moved up of getting more uh, vaccines uh, this coming week, hopefully we'll be able to uh, schedule some of those mass vaccination events to uh, definitely get our vaccines out as soon as we can. Uh, I'm, I, I'm really, really appreciative for all the great work. And just to share with you, I have had many constituents coming to me saying that, wow, I got our, our, our first vaccine, second vaccine in the fairgrounds, at the Burger Drive, at the, at the county building. Uh, you guys are doing such a great job, uh, very smooth, very professional, very, very safe. Uh, and everything is, is uh, very, very well uh, handled. So I just want to share that good news I'm hearing because we always hear about the complaints. Like, for example, this morning, I have a few uh, protesters outside my door uh, try to share with me their feelings about me and about Dr. Cody. Uh, and I'm just glad to be <laughs> along with you, Dr. Cody. With the, the fact yeah. that we mentioned along you, yours, I feel very honored. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first lovely thing I've heard about having protesters. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and I understand that the, the, the segregation of data is difficult because uh, the state is not capturing as well as we can, but please continue it because I really want to see that number among the Asian Pacific American uh, segregation because um, clearly the Filipino uh, uh, population uh, is one where uh, we need to do more work in terms of outreach, but it's good to be able to see the data and track along with the Vietnamese uh, 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 numbers as well. So thank you very, very much. And that's the qu question I have for now. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Allenberg. Thank you. Uh, some individuals have disabilities that have, been, that have been shown, of course, to be at higher risk of severe illness uh, due to COVID. And I know that this is a large and diverse group of people that might include um, mobility issues, developmental disabilities, uh, or additional outreach and support. And while we're expanding eligibility following the state guidelines, uh, can you talk about what steps we're taking to support vaccinations for those with disabilities um, and how, I, of course, I know, I know about one that I'm happy for you to share as well, uh, coming up with Special Olympics and um, the 49ers, but what else is happening and how can we track um, how well we are doing reaching uh, residents with uh, disabilities? Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, uh, Marty Fencer Scheib. So yes, you did mention the Special Olympics um, uh, pod that we're going to be having at the Levi Stadium coming up on Thursday. So that's mm -hmm. good. We've been certainly working with the uh, with the community, with the uh, disabilities uh, community, uh, with a focus on looking at additional pods, specialized pods, also working with them to make sure that all of our sites um, have the appropriate accommodations as they are suggesting, um, because clearly we have the ability to 
provide those accommodations and special needs in many of our sites, uh -huh. uh, not just the single site. So we, we're working closely, in fact, in communication. I'm not the one that's in direct communication. Dr. Salmon and others are in direct communication. We can get you some additional information, but we've, we've had an ongoing open uh, dialogue with the communities um, on a regular basis. So we're putting together all kinds of um, opportunities for that community to make sure that we safely and efficiently vaccinate them. I just wanna really appreciate that work. I know you, you've also been in conversation with parents helping parents and um, th this clearly is a, a vulnerable population with, with particular needs. And I'm, I'm very glad that we are giving the group the attention that, that is warranted. Um, I have a question about the um, uh, food insecurity uh, presentation that was made. Thank you so much for, for the update on the ongoing work to address food insecurity for all residents, certainly with a focus on kids and seniors. Uh, this is an area that Supervisor Chavez and I discussed recently at the Children, Family and Seniors Committee. And I'm pleased about the new collaboration as well as the new federal resources that are supporting um, increased uh, CalFresh benefits. In addition to the advocacy around CalFresh recertification, there are also opportunities to increase school district meal reimbursement if we work to boost CalFresh enrollment so that kids are directly certified for school meals. I'd like to ask administration, um, if you're not doing so already, to please look at any opportunities uh, for increased outreach to boost CalFresh enrollment prior to the SSA and school district data match in June. Um, th that might include leveraging, uh, if appropriate, our Chibet team, schooling service coordinators, the isolation and quarantine team, or others that are in direct uh, contact with families in high need districts to help them enroll in CalFresh. Dr. Smith, is that something you want to answer, whether we can do that before in time to boost our numbers before the recertification? Dr. Smith? Um, I can't authoritatively tell you right now, but we'll do everything we can and get back to you about details. Perfect, perfect, thank you so much. Um, and as we talk about recovery planning in the, in the next item and looking ahead in the budget process for the next fiscal year, starting next month, I'm interested in what public health has been observing in the data about health issues that have been impacted by COVID and the interruption of, of other activities. We had discussed previously that some of these have been tracked throughout the pandemic, but others um, and others have some lag time that may make it challenging uh, to monitor closely. Uh, some items I've been um, thinking about include uh, suicide attempts and the mental health crises, uh, lower preventative health screening uh, levels or and uh, well child visits. Would it be possible to share some outline of health issues that have been exacerbated by the pandemic that should guide board planning in the coming year, either at the April 20th or May 4th meeting? Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, let us check with our EPI team. Uh, we will do everything that we can to get an outline to you to give you a sense for um, health outcomes in other areas. Thank um, you so much. I think that will be useful as we talk about the budget for next year, um, being able to understand where the gaps in, in public health that are not COVID related um, are happening so that we can, we can make sure to close those over the coming year. Certainly. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate the issues, Supervisor Allenberg, that you just raised. I think those are the right questions to be asking. I would like to just add um, to the last point that Supervisor Allenberg raised about the health gaps that one area I, I'm really interested in us taking a look at is mental health and behavioral health overall. And I think what Supervisor Ellenberg pointed out about um, suicidal uh, behavior or ideation um, is really critical. And I, I just would hope that the scan we do is really countywide with the deficits relative to health. Because I, I think behavioral health 
may have some data that maybe public health doesn't. And I think the health system overall, I, I want to just lift up something else that Supervisor Elmberg raised, which is that we know um, folks haven't been going for some well checked visits. It'd be interesting to know if it's maybe not impacting children, but more impacting elderly, or if it's impacting everybody for, for example, mammograms or um, you know, pap smears or other other uh, kinds of checks. And I and so I don't even think it needs, you know, and I'm not going to speak for my colleagues. I, I don't think we're asking for anything perfect. I think it's just really giving some guidance to how we should be thinking about this body of work over the next uh, year and and what are the implications for some of the trends we're seeing. And that may not be knowable, you know, on May 4th or, or April 20th, but at some point um, as that becomes revealed, I think it would be really important for the board uh, to at least have a high level set of that information. I think that's particularly true as we're having budget discussions because while I know we budget annually, I know Dr. Smith that a lot of the planning that the staff does is really biannual or, or uh, multi-year. Uh, and so just better understanding how all that gets integrated would be, I think, really helpful for the whole board. So I just wanted to reinforce that and add my two cents about uh, reaching out kind of countywide. Um, the, the other thing is, I, I, I just want to ask and confirm on April 20th, are we having a more extended look at our partnerships with uh, relative to food during COVID-19? You're, you're asking that of Dr. Smith, Dr. Cody? Uh, Dr. Smith, I think it's, I, I'm not sure who would know I, I, if it was coming back as part of COVID-19 or another report back to the board. Doctors. We'll have it as we'll have it as a part of the a separate part of the board report. It'll be okay. its own issue. Great, thank you. I I was hoping that that would be an opportunity to um, to discuss the other issue that Supervisor Elmberg raised about how we do a deeper um, kind of outreach around CalFresh. I I think we've all been trying to figure out the the right approaches there, and I think the that at least I think at committee, we were having a discussion about the importance of taking a look at who's out in the community now that might be able to assist us. Um, and then the other question I would have is just whether or not, um, given the number of people our community health partners are seeing also over the next you know, uh, number of months to do COVID vaccinations, whether or not there was an opportunity while people are in line waiting for their vaccinations to, um, at least be queried about their their willingness or ability to sign up for CalFresh. I mean, as an example, so I'm, I'm just hoping at least a couple of those ideas could be presented on the 20th. Um, so thank you for that. And then, you know, I wanted to go back to the TPA and vaccine allocation. I, I wanted to say a very, very sincere and special thank you to our staff for the amazing, amazing work um, that you did uh, to help position not just our county, but really counties across the state um, to be able to increase the amount of vaccine and do and and frankly not tie our hands at a local level. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge Supervisor Ellenberg for her work at CSAC to uh, address those issues and and also Senators Cortez and Weiner um, and others in our delegation for their just really advocacy. And I understand that some of that advocacy will yield uh, resources to the county to continue to do outreach. So I wanted to make sure I said uh, thank you to them. I also really, um, Dr. Smith, wanted to thank uh, you in particular and the team uh, for working with Congresswoman Lofgren and, and uh, Congressmember Ro Khanna and other uh, members of our delegation for the advocacy to um, address the opportunities and the need for sooner allocation of vaccines to our federally qualified health centers. And in particular, as I was thinking about this, I was also thinking just about the amazing partnership we have with the Community Health Partnership and Dolores and Sarita and Raimundo and their amazing work. So just to say, oh my gosh, thank you. And we'll look forward to seeing uh, more, more vaccines. Um, my last uh, area of query is um, about the, the, uh, the feedback we're getting over the way we're handling the, our, um, our enforcement. And one request that I've made of staff that I haven't yet received is I wanted to get um, the policies and procedures we're using for enforcement um, prior to the April 20th meeting, just because I want to better understand the 
the um, breakdown of citations and the processes we were using, especially relative to giving people um, both a grace period, but also a warning. And if the staff, again, could make sure that, that those materials go out to the full board before we hear this item again. And I, I just want to say to, to Michael and his team, you know, I, I wasn't, frankly, the concern, I, my concern isn't that other people weren't doing enforcement and we were, I think that actually speaks to just how strong our team was and looked at every single angle to really address COVID-19. Uh, but I do want to better understand some of the concerns we're getting about whether or not people in fact received the um, warnings and under what terms and conditions they did or didn't, and just as I have constituent uh, follow-up that I'd really like to be able to do. And without that information, it's difficult to, to do so. Um, thank you, staff, for the presentation as always thorough and thoughtful. And I know um, we'll be con continuing to work on the equity issues um, that are just really continue to challenge us <laughs> and really challenge us and appreciate all the efforts that are going into that body of work. And I don't know if we've been receiving them, but I, I mean, I haven't received them, so I don't know if my colleagues have, but I want to just reinforce that I'd like us to get the weekly reports of the, um, the activity in the community and on the doors broken down by nonprofit, the doors, the phones, or whatever means they're using for contact. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Mr. Simonian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let's see if I can make the uh, video and uh, audio cooperate. And if not, I'll uh, get rid of the video uh, to improve the audio if that's necessary. Um, let me ask for Dr. Fenstersheib or uh, any other member of the team to help uh, clarify bottom line a few of the um, vaccine uh, issues. Um, if if I heard it right, Dr. Fenstersheib, we, we, we kicked up to about 70,000 and change in terms of vaccines that came our way, which is an increase of maybe 20,000 doses compared to the prior week. But in the same week, we have uh, the over 50 uh, cohort now eligible, which means our eligibility increased by about 370,000 people in the week that we got 20,000 extra doses. Do I, do I have my data straight here? You do, you, you absolutely do. The, the, only, the only caveat I would say is that um, those 70,000 are not, is not the total. That's why I was showing right. you that it doesn't include the, the MTEs or the retail pharmacies. So we're, we're over 100,000 that we get during the week any week so far. Thank you, I, I, you, you anticipated my next question uh, after I, I just said, I think, um, having a dramatically increased eligibility uh, pool with an only modestly increased supply of the vaccine is uh, a formula for frustration. I'll just let it go at that. Um, so back back to the uh, finer rain analysis uh, that you were uh, helping to provide. Do we have the ability to to know, in addition to our, I think, almost seventy two thousand doses? with any real precision what the total number of doses coming into our county is do we uh, i got um uh tangled up a little bit in some of the numbers earlier about what we did or didn't have currently as opposed to retrospective uh information right so we've we've been trying to find all of the information from all of our data sources on inventory coming in um and it looks like the our best guess in, over this last week is that there were probably close to 120,000 doses or more um or slightly more coming into the county um similarly the same around 120 last week and a little bit less the, the uh, previous week Again, for the retail pharmacies, they just get inventory that <clears throat> we get some information on, but a lot of the people that receive vaccine from retail pharmacies don't necessarily um, reside in our area. So again, the data, sometimes the data is inventory, sometimes it's related just to our, like the care data purely to the residents um, that are vaccinated in our community. But I'd say about 120,000 plus doses into our community. Thanks. Thanks. That's, a, that's helpful, even if it's uh, going to be uh, a little bit imprecise. 
So 120,000 doses with 370,000 newly eligible. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, the 370 is the 50 and over, but again, some of those probably were vaccinated in some of the other tiers. So they may have been a healthcare worker or they could have had a chronic disease or been in one of those occupations. So this overlap there. Well, and I, I was uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, doctor, I was thinking, well, you know, if there's 370,000 folks more or less who are uh, newly eligible and you point out that some of them may not, may have been eligible previously uh, under other criteria, uh, and 120,000 doses a week. I thought, well, that's three weeks to uh, get the job done, except by then uh, we will have everybody 16 and up, yes? As eligible. On the 15th, yes, on the 15th. All, everybody and, come on and, down. And, and that, and that, yeah, well, be careful what you wish for. Uh, and that number is how many additional who will be eligible as a result of uh, including the 16 to 50 cohort uh, as newly eligible? Oh, I didn't do that math, but the, the total eligible over 16 in our county is about 1.3 million. So that's the number we, we've started off. 1.5 million? Oh, 1.5 million. Are you, I'm sorry, 1.5. They're, they're correcting me because I think we were looking initially at 85% of for, for herd immunity of the eligibles. So over 16, 1.5, and if we were looking at an 85% coverage, because we're never going to get 100%, then it would be about 1.3 million. I thank my colleagues here for correcting me. And the, the piece of this that I'm anxious about is that we're going to have folks who uh, are newly eligible uh, and uh, try to get the vaccine and then discover that they can't. And I'm, I'm just hoping that they're going to be persistent and keep coming and come back until such time. But do you, do you have any information either uh, uh, data or e even just anecdotal information about um, f folks in this newly eligible uh, cohort who are trying to get vac vaccine appointments but can't, or has that not bubbled up yet? I'm hearing about it in my office from my constituents, and I'm trying to get a sense for what the extent or scope of the challenge is. Absolutely. We're hearing lots of people that have to continuously go online and try to get an appointment. As I mentioned, there were over 52,000 new appointments, first dose appointments made for this week that we're opening up. But still, it's not, it's not enough. Um, but yes, and it will get worse if we don't get enough vaccine over the coming weeks. So, Dr. Benster I, I not to put words in your mouth, truly, but I just, I'm trying to figure out what the best advice we can give our constituents is, and it sounds like it is what we have been telling them, which is, I, I know it's frustrating, but given the eligibility criteria established by the state and the doses available provided by the state, all we can tell you is please keep trying. It's important that you stay persistent and, um, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't give it up. And if anything, uh, if you're eligible at the moment, uh, keep persisting between now and the 15th because it's only going to get more challenging after the 15th. Is that a fair assessment? That's Yeah, that's correct. Again, and for those two-dose vaccines, we have to make sure we get the second dose also, so that increases the amount of vaccine that we need. We're hoping that those that FQHC allotment will be in our, uh, you know, in our favor, that we'll get a lot of vaccine there, and then, again, increased um, manufacturer and allocation to the state of California. So fingers crossed that we'll get additional vaccine over the next coming weeks to meet the need of our increasing eligibility population. All right, and uh, a question that you and I have discussed uh, before under difficult, different circumstances, different, difficult, but different circumstances. Um, if folks are newly eligible on the 15th, when can they actually sign up based on their age? We're opening vaccine slots on a weekly basis, so they can't be vaccinated till the April 15th, but a week before they can begin making an appointment for after April 15th or after. But again, we don't have vaccine appointments since we don't know what our supply is more than a week out. Okay. Um, uh, another question we've talked about in the past, I just wanted to see if there was any update. You know, fortunately, we do have people in March, April, and May who are going to be getting their uh, first and we hope second uh, doses. 
Uh, and so that has prompted a series of questions from the community about, so what is the current thinking on the need for a subsequent uh, vaccine, a booster, if you will, at some point down the line? Are we still um, uncertain about that uh, and, and sort of waiting for um, guidance at the national or state level, or uh, do we have more clarity about that at this point? I think we're really waiting for national guidance on that. I, I know that they are looking at developing vaccines as even if we if even if they don't think we need them right now um, for the specific variants. Um, I've heard that. And then also we may need to uh, vaccinate people on a regular basis, depending on whether this virus uh, basically continues to uh, mutate as it is and whether we will need just like we do for flu vaccine, a new vaccine every year. So we don't we don't know more information um, right. coming from the federal government. Yeah. So again, I just want to make sure I got it. Bottom line, there isn't yet, there is not yet a medical consensus on the nature or need of uh, booster shots uh, some months or years in the future. That's correct, but I believe research, um, they're working on it, but uh, there's, there's okay. been no announcement as far as what, what's going to happen. All right. Sounds to me like you're, now I am going to put words in your mouth if you let me, and that is, sounds to me like your best professional judgment is, that seems likely. Is that a fair characterization? I don't know if I'd want you to put those words in my mouth, but but it's right. looking right. at then other I, viruses. Then yeah. <laughs> okay. Then I won't, Dr. Spencer. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me let me uh, let me shift slightly uh, to some of the um, topics that were being raised by Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, Dr. Fenster, if you will recall that in the Fifth Supervisorial District, the district I represent, we have a disproportionately high share of uh, seniors of older residents, which means I am um, uh, always interested in hearing more about our ability to provide services either mobily or for folks in home. Could you revisit the current status of those programs and also a little bit about where you think those programs are headed in the coming weeks and months? Right, so again, all the providers are gonna be hopefully getting additional vaccine so that they can provide vaccine for all eligibles uh, of all ages in, in our communities. Our mobile vac unit um, is certainly working in communities of high need uh, and I think and I mentioned also that in the in the Mountain View area, our outreach team is going to be working on uh, training people to sign up and schedule additional people for vaccinations up in in uh, the Mountain View area. And then the in-home team, um, which has about 85 uh, appointments scheduled this week for in-home uh, patients that are eligible for vaccine or, or who want vaccine um, will, will continue to increase. And we are also joined by some of the fire agencies also in getting out to the various communities and providing in-home vaccinations. That will increase over time. All right. And uh, forgive me, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, but Supervisor Chavez uh, raised the issue of uh, food security uh, somewhat uh, relatedly, and I just wanted to ask if we are coming back on the 20th on this issue, Dr. Smith, would that be a time uh, when uh, we could get some information about uh, CalFresh uh, recipients as a percentage of the public assistance population? Sure, we can uh, get that information back to you on the 20th. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, bear with me here. I just uh, I want to let staff know uh, that all the work they put into the quarterly statistical report on uh, public assistance programs uh, does actually reach us and that it is carefully reviewed. And Dr. Smith, I'll have my staff follow up with your office, but here's the thing. Uh, I am looking at uh, the numbers in each of the five districts. And what I notice is that in districts one, two, three, and four, 26, 27% of the folks on public assistance, not the population, but of the folks who are actually on public assistance, 26, 27% of them are CalFresh beneficiaries. In district five, 
uh, it's not that I'm surprised that the numbers are lower, but the percentage is only 19% of the folks on public assistance who are uh, receiving CalFresh benefits. So it's, and it's literally the one outlier, uh, appreciably lower in terms of the participation in CalFresh. It's making me wonder whether there's a, a systemic challenge or whether it's just the nature of the, the numbers. But uh, if it's an outreach problem, uh, I, I really am concerned that we seem to have a disproportionately lower share, again, not of the population, and I know there are significant population and income differences, but a disproportionately lower share of folks who are identified as public assistance recipients to be continued. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You got it. Supervisor Lee, do you have any follow-up questions? Actually, no, I don't. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg. I'm all set, thanks. All righty, Supervisor Chavez. None, thank you. Supervisor Simidian. All good, thank you, sir. You got it. I'll just chime in with my praise and kudos to everybody working there, those on our call today and those all taking a well-deserved day off. I've got a new favorite chart on your dashboards and seen 650,000 people having received at least a first dose and 40% of our population. I think you are all doing an absolutely loaves of bread and wine and taking care of so many more people than is imaginable. I am just so proud of all of you for doing the job that you're doing with the 99% um, use rate of the vaccines we've received, getting to the most vulnerable, the, the outreach. It's just been absolutely incredible what all of you involved in this vaccination program um, has done. And I am very thankful on the board of, on, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors for your Herculean efforts. And I can't wait until you have more vaccines than you need. Thank you very much for that. We'll move on to item number 11, excuse me, 12. Oh, David, let me just check with you. I, I don't believe we have any. We have no speakers, sir. Participants, no, we don't. All right, just a whole lot of good listeners. All right, we'll move on to item number 12. Yes, Supervisor, this is Martha Lipinski, Deputy County Executive. I have a brief verbal report. Thank you. So this is, this is a referral from the March 9th board meeting. It's a three-part report you have in your packet that includes an overview of the structure and activities of the county's disaster recovery management team and their engagement with external partners on community recovery. We were also asked to reach out to community organizations that developed recommendations to get their thoughts on the county's response. And then we also plan uh, asked to plan for an FGOC discussion on the prioritization of community recovery recommendations. So as you see, in your, the report contains information on structure, roles, and community partners in the various areas, including community capacity and planning and capacity building, economic recovery, health services, social services, housing, natural and cultural resources, and then also includes the reconstitution of county operations. So I won't go into all the details here, but I do want to highlight with regard to reaching out to the community partners that provided recommendations, we weren't able to include those details in the written report at the time it was submitted because of the need to coordinate multiple community stakeholder calendars for each of these reports. But we do have two meetings scheduled this month and we're in the process of scheduling several more. We hope to get this wrapped up in April and then we're happy to report back to the board on the feedback we get from the groups after we've concluded these meetings. So it may make sense to report that out at the next quarterly status update to the board in June. In terms of uh, next steps, this, is, this item is scheduled to go to FGOC on May 20th for a discussion of the prioritization of these recommendations. And then because we were asked to come back quarterly, we plan to come back, the next quarterly report is planned for June 22nd. And so with that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Martha. Dave, I don't see any registered uh, speakers at this time. I'll turn to Supervisor Ellenberg, who's got her hand up. Thank you. Uh, Martha, thank you very much. I appreciate the report and the opportunity to discuss both our 
COVID response activities as we do at each meeting, alongside now a focus on future recovery and longer term planning to address um, county reopening and the impact of COVID on a, a wide variety of, of uh, community needs. Um, I appreciated in the report seeing uh, the overview of the disaster management recovery team structure of administration and recovery support function teams. How often does the DMR team meet as a whole or individually as the recovery support function teams? Supervisor, are you asking about the management team or the various groups within? Both. Okay, so it depends on the, the for the management team, it depends on uh, what events might be happening with, as it might be once a month, it might be twice a month. If the EOC is still in activation handling a surge, we would kind of ramp back the meeting cadence for the disaster recovery team. But on average, lately, it's been about once a month. In terms of the teams meeting within each of those recovery support functions that you mentioned, uh -huh. I don't have those details with me here today. However, to say it's, it, it would be extremely complicated to figure that out because um, there's no kind of clean cutoff between the active emergency operations center and recovery management team. Many of the recovery activities are also being handled by the staff who serve in the active EOC. And so there's many, many meetings happening at many different levels. So it would really be hard to kind of pin that down. Interesting. Let me, I'll, thank you. I appreciate hearing that. And um, I think I might have a, a further off agenda request, but I'll stew on that for a moment. I didn't see uh, any nonprofit CBO partners listed among the participants in the support function teams. And I'm concerned about the economic impact on these organizations and how they sustain their work for the benefit of our residents. Have they been engaged uh, at all, for example, in the economic recovery support function? Yeah, Supervisor, you bring up a perfect example there. So the area of focus underneath the economic recovery support function is determined by the team. And while it's led by county staff, the folks on the team um, include members of the city, uh, representative of city managers, Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, Joint Venture Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill Chamber of Congress, uh, Nova Workforce, Santa Clara County Farm Bureau, uh, City of Milpitas, and six different county departments. And what they're working on, if I could, is, is includes, they come up with the agenda. And so it's about ag business recovery, government cost recovery, resilient economic opportunities, business impact assessments, financial recovery, and then communication plan. It, let me just stop there. Thank you. Thanks. I, I think another important voice or partner there would be CBOs particularly, and, and I'm, I'm thinking of Catholic Charities because I know they have such a um, robust program to help people get back to work um, and having voices that represent those um, those kind of niches, I think would be very important. They need to hear what jobs are going to be available, what kind of training and support is needed, what new roles are we are we talking about, and be able to um, to connect directly from this um, kind of policy driven piece with the folks who who need to get back to work or need to get to work. Uh, so I'd, I'd really like to, I, I appreciate that they are in the room. I want to uh, really elevate the importance of, of having the CBOs that are representing so many of the people who are out of work um, with a full voice at the table. I'm, I'm also particularly interested in the work of the resilience committee listed in the report. Can you um, tell me what the current priorities and activities are of this group and thinking about how we build toward a, call it a better than before state and, and who are the county and, and non-county partners that serve on that committee? Sure, I don't have the details of the county and non-county partners, but it it's one of the groups that is tasked with working with county partners, coming up with an after action report on how we do make a better than before um, 
state of the county. I'm going to have to provide those level of details off agenda, though I don't have them with me. Okay, I'm going to make, um, let me then wrap up with a few off agenda uh, requests to make sure that, that everything is covered. Uh, first, I'd like to request an off agenda report that lays out these teams, maybe in a table uh, that indicates the frequency of meetings and participating representatives, including both county staff and external stakeholders. Uh, next, I think that this planning work is really critical to share with the board and with our partners and should certainly inform our budget planning for the future. Um, I, I appreciate the uh, suggestion of Supervisor Chavez at the last meeting to bring this discussion to FGOC to sort through and prioritize. So either in preparation for that FGOC meeting or in an off agenda report, I would appreciate before the budget workshops in May, some input, input from each of the um, recovery support teams on the following questions, which I think will help us inform priority setting. What have we had to do differently during COVID that we should continue in the future? Um, thinking of things like expanded telehealth, the use of motels for at-risk unhoused residents, decompression of the jail populations, et cetera. Uh, second, what county services or activities have been limited by COVID that requires special planning to bring back online? And what are the anticipated timeframes for those um, items? And here, some examples would be in custody services, addressing the court back backlog, um, et cetera. And then finally, what community needs have been made more acute by the pandemic and associated economic and social disruptions that the county has a role in addressing? I can you know, name quickly, housing insecurity, food insecurity, demand for behavioral health services, um, et cetera. Martha, so this we can report back on that. Yeah, this is all recorded, Martha, so you can catch it. <laughs> yes, and, and I'm happy also, Martha, to, to have my uh, team send you, send you an email, but yes, it is all recorded and I tried to do it slowly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it, Martha. Yeah. Supervisor Lee, I saw your hand next, and Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Lee, you're muted, or you need to speak louder. Of course I'm muted. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks, Ms. Wapinski. The, uh, we, we have reached out to some of the CBOs and they have some questions and, and I'm trying to summarize some of these to ask. Uh, I think uh, Supervisor Ellenberg has covered quite a few of those two as well. Uh, but uh, a couple of questions here left is um, uh, the plan of, the, so the current EOC functions, right? Now that we are uh, winding that down, um, are we getting that phased out and have these handed over, uh, these type of response operations to the recovery branch? And how is that being worked out at this point? That's an excellent question. It's a little, it's a bit of a gray area in that while the EOC, active EOC starts ramping down, disaster recovery ramps up, although we've been actively planning since last March, it's not an easy demarcation. And, but, but the benefit of the disaster recovery management team is that many of the active EOC staff also staff the disaster recovery. So it's, it's not like there's a information handoff needed. It, it'll be a smooth transition in terms of the subject matter experts that are involved in this work. So basically, they may not be working in the same location, the EOC, but the knowledge is still with them wherever they ended up, is what you're saying. Correct. Maybe I can jump in here a little bit. Um, the EOC is still activated um, completely, um, but it's decentralized. So um, all of the um, individuals who are working in management and the different structures in the EOC are typically back in their own offices, um, meeting virtually um, daily. Um, there are some individuals who are not in their own offices, but are transitioned into temporary offices, but they're decentralized out of the sheriff's office. So <clears throat> we're recovery process is in planning still. We're not 
um, activating it in the sense that the, the disaster continues to be ongoing. The state continues the disaster um, status as well as the uh, local um, county. Um, but we're preparing for recovery in the sense that much of the EOC action at this point now boils down to recovery and vaccination planning and data collection. So that a huge part of what our response is right now is making sure that we've got all of our work um, organized, what we have done, what we will do so that we can be able to sustain an audit by FEMA and others uh, when we go through that. Um, so it's, it's not a clear demarcation, but all of the same work is being done. Thank you, um, Dr. Smith. Um, the other questions regarding the, uh, the seven um, RSF, the recovery support functions, um, in particular about on the area of social services being uh, listing these CBOs uh, as stakeholders, uh, how will they be involved in this respect? Excuse me, forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> how they how they are typically involved is the recovery support function lead, in this case, Bob Mendicucci, will be engaging um, the partners that you see there in the report as part of all the various plannings they're doing around our vulnerable populations. Does that help? I don't. Some, somewhat, I think it probably would be something that you would answer in uh, some of the answers you're giving to the off agenda. If, uh, sure. Zonberg, you might be able to uh, elaborate a little further. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, yes, I'm happy to get details from um, social services and provide those to the report. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and then there's also a question regarding the uh, transparency to the public of the recovery function. And there's been asked whether we could get the org chart the committee charters, the, like the meeting calendar, uh, and how to plug in and, and make these be uh, available um, and easy to read for the public. Let me figure out how to do that and get back to you, Supervisor. Okay, and the last one is regarding the funding uh, and the budget. Uh, so reg regarding these uh, recovery plan and goals uh, that is we uh, discussing, uh, how can we sync that up uh, so that we, we incorporate those issues in the budget hearing, just to make sure that's being um, considered. Thank you. Yes, we'll include that. Uh, I can uh, try to give you an answer to that right now. All right. Um, the recovery costs and functions are also reimbursable by FEMA. Um, and the main issue there is that we need to keep all the data and um, be able to make our case to FEMA what the expenses are, and we're doing that on a daily basis. Um, the um, in the budget, you'll see um, some presumptions for reimbursement from FEMA because we had to make our best uh, estimate of what we thought the uh, reimbursements would be, but we won't be able to finalize that until after this year's budget is approved, so we'll come back with uh, budget modifications as necessary. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith, and that's all the questions for me. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, Martha, let me start out by asking, um, Martha, I know, I feel like you get a lot of jobs, so I just want to acknowledge that, that you're like, you're a you're like the utility player um, for us. There you go, Mike. Very good. Um, so uh, Martha, here's my question. Who's on your team? Like who's supporting you doing this body of work? So each of those recovery support functions that you saw in the report, each has an executive leader from the county. For instance, like I mentioned social services, um, it's Bob Minicucci. The economic RSF is Margaret Olaya. Uh, under natural and cultural resources, it's Janet Hawks from Parks. And then let's see. I, I get the picture. I uh, guess, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, so in a way you're playing sort of a, a 
a ringleader, a, 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 um, a ringleader, is that kind of right? Uh, I'll say director, but if you'd like to say ringleader, sure. Well, I just feel like these are so different. I mean, they're just such different areas. As I was imagining this, I, I saw you with plates. That was my visual. Um, but I, so part of the reason I'm asking the question is that I think that there are, um, there, there are pressing issues in addition to the issue that you raised about the EOC. And at some point, um, I think we're going to need to do a, a kind of a deep dive into the EOC and, and, and evaluate the, the, um, the strengths and weaknesses of the, the strategy we're using for the EOC and, and we're using and even the people we're using in it. So that, that just, let me just put that aside for a moment and, and make an observation. And actually, Dr. Smith, I'm not going to put Martha on the spot for this question, but this is something I'm really interested in getting your perspective on. Um, as we look at what the federal government and the state government um, are doing to try to maintain um, and improve the, the economy, both from a traditional perspective through construction, but also through some operational opportunities that I think directly um, could impact counties, it occurs to me that one idea that you and I have been kicking around for a long time, and I, and I know I've even brought a referral to this, but I don't think we were able to really land the plane, was to look at whether or not we needed to have an economic development arm um, to the county uh, in order to support the, the, the county's efforts in implementing opportunities that get raised by either the stimulus or the way we're uh, dealing with property ownership or any of those other things. And I wonder if, if you've given any thought to that relative to the situation we find ourselves in, both from a recovery perspective and also an opportunity perspective. Yes, uh, the issue of an economic development structure is um, certainly one that's important. Um, it's not a historical effort that counties uh, take on in California because most of that economic development um, historically has been done within city boundaries and is done by cities who obviously always have economic development. However, we are entering into a different world and uh, I think it would be good for us in the county to take on that type of role. Um, it will require um, significant new staff because we um, just simply don't have the skill staff, skill in the current staff to be able to do that, nor do we have the time uh, or um, you know, capacity. So um, I've been working on it with the team and we um, won't be presenting it during this budget, but once we have a mature idea, we'll come back to the board with a suggestion of how we should proceed. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that was very helpful, Dr. Smith. And two recommendations, just as you're giving thought to this, because I know it's still a burgeoning idea. Um, one is that I think there would be a benefit to having a conversation as part of the um, weekly meetings that you already do with all of the city managers to get their thinking on on what kind of partnership they'd like to have uh, with the county because they're because you're right their primary role is economic development and it would be interesting to get their perspectives on on how they're looking at the stimulus and our role relative to their role, because I think this should be done in a very team effort or team, from a team perspective. Um, what are your thoughts about that approach? I agree with you. Um, right now we're all, you know, cities and counties, and for that matter, the state are in the process of trying to evaluate uh, the new monies that are being targeted uh, regarding uh, the rescue plan that was approved and with the leadership of our, with uh, Zoe Lofgren and others from our uh, legislative team. 
Um, the regulations have not been developed yet to let us know clearly what those monies can be spent on and how they can be uh, spent that way. And we know that um, basically a little bit less than half of them will be coming, half the money will be coming this year and then it will be spread out over future years. So clearly we're going to have to figure out the rules of the uh, expenditure plan and then sit down with the cities and others, including our CBO partners um, and develop a plan that we can come to the board with uh, to suggest allocations. Um, we obviously aren't going to do that before the May re or May recommended budget comes out, but um, we will um, as fast as we can, as fast as we can get the regulations and analyze them, we'll be doing that. I think one of the, the very unique opportunities that we have at this point in time is that the way the federal government has designed the infrastructure package, it uniquely suits what, what counties do um, more so than I would say any other level of government, in part because there is um, money that's going to be set aside for, you know, infrastructure such as bridges and roads and transit and transportation, and then investments in areas like um, seniors and senior care and child care, areas, frankly, that we already um, play a critical role in providing services. And the question becomes, how then does that get uh, transitioned into this idea around a more fair and just economy? And I mention that because I think we would be looking for a, a somewhat non-traditional approach. And in many respects, the framework that the federal government is laying out is one that really gives us an opportunity to think more, um, well, to be inclusive of the, the people we provide services to um, and to be more targeted in that it may create opportunities for us to strengthen the services we're providing today or be able to expand into new services, for example, through our healthcare uh, system. So one thing that I think would be very interesting to take a look at is to do a, a request for um, ideas or you know, much more along the lines of what we do when we're looking for somebody who might be interested in partnering with us to see whether or not there are firms out there that are, can be non-traditional and help us flesh this idea out a little bit more. Yeah, good point. Um, as I've been thinking about it, um, and probably stating the obvious here, um, most uh, the recovery from most emergencies involves recovery of property and rebuilding of property. And that's typically something that cities worry about mostly, whereas county is in California, counties worry mostly about people. Um, but this type of emergency with the pandemic means really rebuilding the structure of our society and the fabric of society and rebuilding the safety net. So it does become more of a county, typical county function than a city function. I think you're comments are spot on. We'll have to rethink um, how we decide to spend this money and how we decide to partner because it'll be a longer term, more um, challenging effort than typically rebuilding buildings after an earthquake or something like that. I appreciate that. And one, one just example, um, Dr. Smith, that I was thinking a little bit about is we don't yet have a, a, um, a broad enough system to provide support for hospice care in our healthcare system, meaning the county's healthcare system. But that's probably something we're going to need to think more about and something that I believe is um, whole or in part covered through 
Medi-Cal as an example, you have raised with the board the incredible, um, really tragedy we saw with seniors living in group uh, and congregate care. And that in some instances, we had buildings that were poorly designed. In some instances, we, we were working with staff that weren't properly trained or equipped to provide the protective uh, services they needed for seniors in our community, which is part, in part why they were so um, susceptible to COVID-19. And, and that's a part of the system that I don't know if, if Medi-Cal or healthcare, I'm sorry, uh, insurance providers are gonna get more engaged in and I don't know what the implications of that are for our healthcare system as an example. So what we may wanna be doing is hiring um, consultants, frankly, to take a look at our, our current model, our current financial model, look at what services we could expand into that could be paid for and therefore be able to leverage services that aren't easily paid for, but that, that will eventually land on government to do, but doing it in a more pro proactive way, which may be hospice relative to, um, to skilled nursing facilities as an example. So I, I think that whatever help you need thinking about this, that if we could do that robustly on the front end, I think it's gonna give you the guidance and the staff the, the opportunity to, to help us um, understand better how we branch out where it's appropriate for us to do so. Where is it a county uh, issue versus a private sector issue versus a city issue? So anyway, those are just some thoughts that I have and I'll look forward to learning more at the um, at FGOC. So thank you for that. Is that it, Supervisor? Thank you. Yep, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My questions have been raised and uh, addressed. I'm good. Okay, thank you. Um, Martha, I, uh, ever since getting to know Supervisor Lee better and his joining the, uh, our board, I've used the word mission more and more and more often than I've ever used it in my entire life. And when I looked at this agenda item number 12 and I looked at the disaster management recovery team, I thought, okay, what, what does that look like? What does recovery look like? What, what is our mission? And I came down to the end goal of a return to normalcy. Normalcy and better would be nice, but the end goal is return to normalcy. And to get there for me means to clear whatever backlog we have of things that didn't get accomplished the last 12 months because of so many people being repositioned into emergency type services. So we, we have a backlog on things that need to be done um, as simple as bathrooms and parks needing to be cleaned. I mean, it's, that's just a super simple example, but we, we have a backlog of things that were deferred that need to be brought current. And we also, and Jeff mentioned it in, in a few of his words, I've been through three disasters in my 11 years. And it's that FEMA audit that comes after the promise of disaster expenses reimbursed that you really have to get through that audit. And our people, whether it was the flooding of the downtown area, the flooding of the mountains, all the roads that were taken out, if it was those type things, if it was fires, whatever it was, we would submit to the government the expenses that they said they would recover, but it's with that they would reimburse, but with an asterisk. And that asterisk was that we had to pass their audit. And Jeff's been through an, enough of these as well. And all that work that's being done now to substantiate the hundreds of millions, and I don't know if we're over a billion dollars, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we've spent in COVID related expenses, that I think is mission critical. Getting back to normalcy is what we all want to do. Santa Clara County 12 months ago was doing great. And when I look at that title, Disaster Management Recovery Team, it's all about recovery, Martha. It's all about getting us back to where we were 13 or 14 months ago and 
getting us full reimbursement or as, or as close as possible to all the expenses we've put out doing the job. Now, anything beyond that is cake. Anything beyond that is, is wonderful. But as our disaster management recovery team leader, that's what this supervisor wants. This supervisor wants to get back to where we were in February of 2020. Because we were pretty, pretty dang good operating on all eight cylinders and doing all kinds of wonderful things and not spending more money than we received. So that's what I'm looking for, Martha. I'm looking to return to normalcy, to clear the backlog of deferred items, and to recover all the money possible from the federal government. Because that dollar amount is 10, if not 100 times larger than any other project or thing we want to take on. So that's this supervisor's personal perspective on what my priorities are. I'm just sharing them with you, Martha, in this open and public forum. I, I'm glad you're in the position, you're the right person at the right time in the right place. And that's, that's what I want. And my feeling is if we can get back there, we are gonna have a very, very, very happy county, county residents. The GDP for the next year is expected to be 6%. The job openings right now are at a two-year high. I know people are talking about people, you know, unemployed, and but it's changing quickly. And I know a person in San Jose used to keep unemployment numbers um, for the city of San Jose anyway. And I don't know how we compare now to what we were before, but we're well on our way to getting back there. And that's what I call disaster recovery. That's all I've got. Any other supervisors? Anything else you want to chime in with? This was simply to receive a report, and I think we've done that. I know Martha was taking copious notes of everybody speaking so quickly, and uh, it's recorded, and she can follow up with each of you. I'd like to see, uh, Dave, I don't see anyone who has registered electronically to speak. Do you concur? That's correct. We have no speakers. All right. We will move then from 12 to its reverse or inverse, 21, which is to receive a report from the Office of the County Executive, Office of the Census relating to the Santa Clara County 2020 census effort. Key will uh, talk about this. Mr. Lee, you're on. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. Uh, good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Uh, Key Lee, Deputy County Executive here. Um, to this afternoon, we're coming to you with our final report on the county's efforts around the census. We believe that it's been a successful effort, especially given all of the challenges, especially the pandemic. Um, this success certainly belongs to the entire community, uh, enabled by your leadership and that of uh, Dr. Smith. Um, before I sort of turn it over to Nick Kawada, who will walk us through a brief presentation. I just wanted to uh, acknowledge a, cu a couple of individuals. Um, <clears throat> first, um, you may recall that David Campos uh, led uh, this effort. Um, I just wanted to uh, recognize his contributions and his leadership. Um, second, um, I want to recognize Nick Kawada and the census team. Uh, they worked extremely hard to uh, make this report um, uh, finalized this report um, to supporting him was also Carolyn Lee and then Betty Young who was sort of worked through the night. So with those acknowledgements uh, and my appreciation for everyone, I'll turn it over to Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Key. Um, I really appreciate uh, everything that you said there. And if, again, Key was instrumental in helping us reach uh, the end finish line here. So I'm going to share my screen real quick so we can start um, the presentation. One moment, please. Apologies, one moment. Okay, here we go. Hopefully folks can see that. Yes, we can. Perfect. So um, good afternoon, President Wasserman, members of the Board of Supervisors. I am Nicholas Kawada uh, with the Office of the Census 2020 um, in the Office of the County Executive. And 
you know, 2020 was an incredible year. We saw a lot of different things happen, but one of those things that happened was we had the most successful census in the county's history. Never did we have a, a higher count. Santa Clara County has the highest internet response rate and the second highest total re self response rate in the state. And in case you're wondering, San Mateo took that top spot. So we have some competition in the future. Historically, California has always been uh, the hardest to count state in the nation. And this time we exceeded the national average by leaps and bounds. Our county was able to accomplish a successful census count despite an unprecedented global pandemic, uh, record setting wildfires and a federal administration that actually sought to dismantle the county's efforts. So in fear and distrust in communities through severe underfunding, constant litigation, attacks against immigrant community, uh, and attempted exclusion of undocumented individuals and families, and denying the language accessibility that historically has been a landmark of the census count, just to name a few. Um, so under the leadership of the board and the county administration and our community partners, we were able to run a very highly adaptive campaign that created opportunity to cover all ground by establishing a census coalition with over 50 community-based organizations, creating internet access points for communities on the other side of the digital divide to complete their census, creating our own language accessibility plan, materials, and virtual campaign that gathered over 130 million impressions. And in the last month of the census, the county and our community partners Silicon Valley Community Foundation and Working Partnerships USA made the final push across the finish line with a team of more than 100 canvassers who reached 122,000 households and made 86,000 phone calls. So, you know, a great big thank you to all those folks who made that happen, but the people who we should be thanking the most are actually the folks in front of me. Um, so the all these points are, are, are here, uh, actually con contained in our census report, um, you know, the most important piece I would have to say is our in-depth campaign, which is actually one of the appendices and the reason why the report is so long. And it actually uh, is a guy that carefully has curated every detail of the campaign so that we can see uh, that success again in the future. This is our love letter to the 2030 census team and beyond. Uh, but we don't have to wait until 2030 to implement our lessons learned. As we speak, members of the former census team are in the county's emergency operations center assisting the vaccination outreach plan. So we are seeing a broad outreach effort that's continuing on even past census. Um, you know, it's been an honor and privilege to served as your program manager for the County Office of the Census. This is my final presentation to you and my last act as a county employee. Coming from a community-based organization myself, you have put community first and chosen to trust in the relationships that these CBOs have been investing in for generations. Without your leadership, investment, and vigilance, we would not have accomplished such a successful count. It's just not possible. Every flyer, every door knock, every phone call, every single last conversation was absolutely necessary. Thanks to your efforts, we've secured hundreds of millions of dollars for our most vulnerable communities and given them a voice for the next 10 years. You have made our community a home, a place that welcomes all people. And if the board doesn't mind indulging me for just a moment, I would like to end my final presentation with some appreciation remarks. Supervisors, uh, Cindy Chavez, your staff have been incredible. Uh, Dr. Smith, Miguel Marquez, James Williams, always speaking at our events, always championing census, even when it's out of fashion. Uh, Stephanie Kim at the United Way of the Bay Area, our more than 50 community-based organization partners and census champions, ANM and Manny Santa Maria at Silicon Valley Community Foundation, our county census ambassadors who are internal county employees who push census, David Tucker, our PM for the state, our vendors, DSJ staff and the leadership, especially from Betty Young, um, the county census team, which David Campos, wherever he may be, Paul Kumar, Marcelo Quinones, Greg Bazhaw, Yoko Myers and Brian Schutz, and Daniel Christian. Um, and then, of course, my own staff, Monica Tong, Miguel Santiago, you guys will always be in my heart. So thank you again. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Nicholas, thank you very much for that. Oh, good. I'm not uh, muted. Supervisor Chavez, you're first. Thank you. I I wanted to say thanks to Nick. Um, you know, when Nick got here as a as a new county employee, he just he just shined the census. Every group we asked him to speak to, every moment we asked him to be out in the public, he he represented the county, Nick, beautifully, um, and also just got people enthusiastic about helping. And that is really not an easy thing to do. So I just wanted to appreciate you. The other thing I wanted to say is between um, wildfires and heat and COVID-19 and the ever-changing rules of the federal government, 
to have accomplished the numbers that were accomplished, Nick, with you and the team, um, I think, you know, I, I just were amazing. And I, I just wanted to say, and also to Jennifer Tonks, Nick, I know you guys were like this and Miguel, <laughs> like every time I saw you, you guys were together. And I, I just really wanted to say just how much I appreciate you. And, you know, I'm very competitive. I wanted the number one spot, but I think it, but given how high the numbers were, I don't know how we would have done that short of sky writing. I don't even know if that would have worked. I actually, you did do that, Nick. I should stop right there with that one sign. Um, I also just wanted to share with my colleagues something that um, you may or may not know, and that is that when we very first uh, started working on the census, I really can't thank um, then uh, County, um, I'm sorry, uh, Deputy Director um, David Compost for really just putting us on the right path right away. But I wanted to say to Dr. Smith in particular, um, and David Compost, who isn't here uh, any longer with us, he's in San Francisco, he hasn't gone to another place, but just to another city. Um, how much I appreciated the leadership that was taken by you all, because I, I spoke to colleagues in other parts of the country and the state, and they didn't have the support, all of them, of their administration or the leadership of their administration to invest the resources um, and to embrace community partnerships. So I, I really wanted to say a very special thank you to to David, but also to you, Dr. Smith, because um, you were a standout as it related to other places in, in the state and the country. So thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to our speakers and we'll come back to supervisors in just a minute. How long would you like to hear the speakers, Mr. President? David, two minutes. Okay, one moment, please, while we set the timer. The next speaker is Tiffany Wong. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, board. My name is Tiffany Wong. I work with uh, EH Housing, an affordable housing nonprofit organization. We want to thank Silicon Valley Community Foundation and Santa Clara County for awarding us a $17,500 grant uh, dollar grant for 2020 census. Each, each housing was the only affordable housing developer to apply and receive these funds. We also want to thank Nick Kawada and his team for their leadership. We are very grateful for this grant because it helped ensure that our residents were counted. At each housing, we were able to outreach and educate 2,666 hard to count households, including immigrants, people of color, seniors, and others who live in affordable housing. The funds allowed us to hire translators, purchase iPads for mobile outreach, create and distribute marketing materials, and purchase supplies and PPE. Our partners, such as U.S. Census Bureau, Ethiopian Community Services, and the City of Morgan Hill, supported us by staffing informational tables during our weekly food distributions. By taking COVID-19 precautions, we were able to safely meet residents outside their doorways and connect residents to the census. These interactions made a huge difference and were extremely effective to help residents understand why it was so important to be counted in the census. We also, we also hosted a census caravan and drove by 20 affordable housing communities in South County. Additionally, we participated in countywide phone banking efforts, working partnerships, and made 6,000 calls to households around, throughout Santa Clara County. Overall, our efforts were very successful. EH Housing was able to get 90% of our South Bay residents to participate in the 2020 census. Again, thank you to the County of Santa Clara and thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is I Can Zoom. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi there. My name is Isabella Wong. I represent I Can, a family services nonprofit where I served as the census coordinator. Um, during the 2020 census, I Can outreach to the Vietnamese community. We phone banked, held office hours, and online forums hosted a QAC or Questionnaire Assistance Center, uh, broadcasted PSAs, provided translations, and we canvassed neighborhoods that were historically hard to count. Um, so for the 2020 census, um, it was the first time that households could respond online or via phone. And of course, uh, these implementations were extremely valuable. Um, I can uh, notice that despite the availability of multilingual assistance resources and services, 
um, the staffing of said resources were um, oftentimes unequal, uh, resulting in long wait times for phone, ex phone assistance, for example. Um, we understand that resolving those challenges uh, fell under the U.S. Census Bureau and that we as community partners can only reconcile so much to help our, um, our residents here. Um, so we would ask the, uh, the board to continue supporting um, the efforts of like CBOs and like the CBO network um, to continue to provide outreach and uh, education uh, services uh, in order to reach the community in ways that um, resources from the census would not be able to accomplish. Uh, we are grateful to the county's Office of the Census and cohort partners for their support, direction, and leadership throughout the challenges of the past year, making our um, 77 response rate among the highest in the nation. Thank you, and I yield my time. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to mention to uh, Seneca County Board of Supervisors about two bills during the census 2020. The one is the HR 732, which is the Census Idea Act. The, the bill has provided the enhanced accuracy and as well as the, the, and as well as the protection to the consumer data. And, the, and there is another bill, which is uh, uh, 4048, which is for the fair and accurate census act data that has been introduced. These two bills are gonna be held over the course for the county to implement the right set of a standards for the US Census Bureau, and as well as the county to count the population, and as well as, you know, relates any, uh, any, anyone who is impacted with the COVID-19 during the 2019 and 2020 year. Uh, during this entire uh, COVID-19 situation, and as well as the census 2020 data, there is an enormous uh, information that has been collected over the course of time. However, both the bills, which is, going to, which is introduced in the Senate of 116 Congress, they're gonna be emphasizing more on the consumer privacy and as well as the accuracy of the data, which is going to be collected by the Census Bureau, which is going to be helping the county as well in order to ensure the right set of information and statistics to be collected. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gabriella. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Gabriela Garzon Gupta and I am here representing the Asian Law Alliance. We first wanted to thank the county and, um, for the support in launching and sustaining the Census 2020 outreach campaign. Although the census was happening in the midst of pandemic and also we had different changes such as it being online for the first time, we were able to conduct robust outreach and we would not have been able to do so without the county support. Our census team, Efrain Delgado and Victor Sin, were able to carry out all types of outreach. For example, they served on the steering committee for the complete count, the immigrant and language barrier subcommittee, as well as coordinating with the Census Bureau to execute a car caravan in San Jose. We were also able to employ paid volunteers to conduct phone and social media outreach in various languages, including but not limited to Spanish, Mandarin, and Vietnamese. Community-based organizations are so key to effective census outreach because we're able to connect with different groups in the preferred languages, as well as making, making sure that we are adjusting the message in a way that resonates with the communities we're trying to outreach to. I hope that we can take the wins from this round of census outreach and utilize similar techniques for the 2030 census, um, namely interesting CBOs such as Asian Law Alliance, as well as our partners and community leaders to conduct outreach with the populations we are already serving and we already have a strong community bond with. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roberto Gill. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, thank you. Thank you for um, allowing me to talk about the census. I wanna thank the, uh, the, the Board of Supervisors and the county for supporting the 2020 um, um, census count. Um, we were very grateful. Um, Sacred Heart Community Service was very grateful to participate in this. Given all of, given all of the, um, everything that happened in 2020 with the pandemic, the fires, everything just making um, the count so much more difficult, um, we always stopped and reflected of what if we didn't plan for this. So it just shows um, 
what we were able to achieve, even with all the obstacles, is such an amazing feat. Um, given that we planned to do so much more, but it was still amazing. Um, we did canvassing, we did phone banking, um, we hosted a question and assistance center. We were able to reach so many people in our community um, that wouldn't have been counted otherwise, that wouldn't have had a voice. Um, so thank you for doing that and supporting that. Um, I, I especially want to thank Diana Paz and Marta Barajona, two of our community members, um, two of our census ten, um, um, staff members that had courage and strength um, and pushed through all of these obstacles um, and were able to um, engage um, many, many, many volunteers and community members um, to help with the count and give people the right information. Um, so thank you. And I also wanna specifically thank Nick and his office for all of their support um, and also um, the Community Foundation for their support as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kuyan Vong. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Kuyan Vong, Executive Director of ICANN. First of all, I would like to thank the, the leadership and the support from, uh, from the Board of Supervisors of Santa Clara County. I got to tell you, compared to 2020, 2010, we were so prepared for 2020, ready to go, right? I even have a huge uh, map of the county's office with all, county map with all the census tracts printed out, identifying exactly where the Vietnamese live. And then, of course, you know, uh, sent, um, the pandemic descended upon us. But um, I, I want to say that, you know, in every census, there will be some sort of challenges that we have to fight against. But we prevailed, and I'm very proud and very happy about it. I want to thank the, um, the board, as well as Nick Kawada and the uh, census office at the county, as well as NM and uh, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and the Bay, United Way Bay Area and all the funders the, coming together to support us in this endeavor so that we all can have a successful census. I also want to recognize the hard work of ICANN staff, especially Isabella Long, who just spoke for a few people ahead of me. She was my right-hand person and she actually worked really, really hard. And I must say that, you know, without Isabella, I, ICANN could not have done what we did. Um, so we are very grateful. Hopefully we're anxiously waiting for the results to come out so I can print my 2020 census map for the Vietnamese uh, the community. So then we can uh, start getting ready for uh, 2030. Thank you so, so much. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Um, Nick, I wanted to say, despite the numerous trials and tribulations, and without a doubt, the most difficult census climate to date, our county came out on top with a, with a self-response of 77.7%, as you said, the second highest in the state. And I believe you said it was San Mateo, Nick, that uh, came in ahead of us. Well, first of all, San Mateo is only about 40% our size. Secondly, they don't have a professional soccer team or a professional hockey team, or a professional football team. So as far as I and the very competitive Cindy Chavez are concerned, we are number one. Um, I've now been here for two census. I don't know if you call them sensei or not, but censuses. And what I hope is that those people that are here for the next census in 10 years will recognize that our early investment in this census pay dividends and agree with staff's recommendations to move up the, the timeline to better capitalize on our opportunities. I agree with staff that we must utilize the census data to formulate more equitable public policy in the years ahead, including getting healthcare, human services, other vital programs to the people who need them the most. Nick, I wanna thank you very, very, very much for your, your leadership, your relentlessness, your energy, your passion, it was, it was obvious every time you presented, um, you took great pride in what you accomplished and rightfully so. And we take great pride in having you lead, lead this effort. Thank you for what you've done and very best of luck going forward. That's it for me. Oops, I see a supervisor Ellenberg and then supervisor Lee. 
Just very briefly, because you did it so beautifully, Supervisor Wasserman, I want to thank Nick um, and the the huge and phenomenal team that that was the the census operation in Santa Clara County and whether or not we were first our uh, our response and results were tremendous and the odds were were stacked ever against us in every possible way and just want to wish you the very best in your next adventure and thank you for doing such a such a tremendous job for us thank you vice president supervisor lee Yes, thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, amazing jobs. Uh, as we see, the census 2020 has truly been a really challenging feat in the middle of the pandemic, uh, with the number of language barriers and over 14 languages being identified and used for the outreach uh, certainly is uh, uh, tremendous and amazing. Uh, with all the help of our community-based uh, organization partners, uh, and uh, I do have a question regarding all this data. Now that we, we have been able to outreach to so many people, um, now the census is over. Uh, is the county able to maintain using that for our COVID outreach and any other future outreach? Because obviously many of these are hard to reach communities and since all the hard work is done, I certainly want to make sure that we have that data uh, available for all the future outreach for any disaster uh, notifications and et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. So I, I I definitely can't take any credit for it, but public health is actually already taking the uh, the initiative of creating a dashboard that actually uh, uh, captures the COVID uh, response that the county has taken around people who have been tested, uh, people who are getting vaccines, et cetera. So that is actually readily available. Unfortunately, we're still waiting for some of the data to be processed by the U.S. Census Bureau. There were delays because of the pandemic. So until that uh, those delays are cleared up and, and uh, the data is verified, we may have a little bit more time to wait until we get more discrete information that we'll be needing for that outreach. Great, thank you. And uh, just last but not least, uh, Nicholas, uh, congratulations for a job really well done. I, I did just find out that you are leaving us, which is unfortunate, but uh, I wish you the best. Heard you might be heading over to SDCN and they're lucky to have you. Thank you very much and good luck, thanks. Thank you. We've heard from public speakers. I don't see any more hands raised. So Nicholas, we'll consider your report well received. Thank you very, very much. Oh, Supervisor Smitty, and oh, one more minute, Nicholas. Come on back. I just, Nicholas, I, just Supervisor thank you. I, I don't want to I don't want to delay this, Mr. Chairman, but I do want to add my personal thanks. Uh, this is one of those uh, functions that is, I think, largely invisible to an awful lot of folks. Uh, but that has very, very tangible uh, benefits, uh, a payoff that is real and lasting. And I, I just want to add my thanks because, uh, as I say, in the coming years, we'll be so much better off for all of this. And uh, I doubt that uh, most of us will uh, sort of have, have reason to think back to, oh, yeah, that's because of the remarkable work people did on the census. But we should at least take note of it now. So thank you again. All right, because I know we only have five of us. There's no more hands raised. We're going to move on to 22. Best wishes, Nicholas. Item 22 is the 2021 redistricting process. Dr. Smith or James, who's going to lead this? I think Melanie's going to lead it. Um, Melanie. Or maybe Danielle. Danielle. No, it's Melanie. Sorry. Melanie. Hi, good afternoon. I have attempted to share my screen. Can I get a confirmation that I was Yes, successful? it's there. You bet. There. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. We are happy to follow the census report um, because this is the next step in the process for our county. I am Melanie Jimenez Perez, a program manager in the county executive's office. And I will be presenting this item with my colleague, Danielle Chris, who's also in the office of the county executive. And before we get into the details, we wanted to introduce the item by letting you know that this framework was developed in partnership with the Office of County Council. And we really approached this by looking at what was happening at the state level and throughout California so that we could develop recommendations for the board that gave the maximum flexibility and allowed for community engagement in a meaningful way while also complying with the timeline constraints that are the result of the delays in the release of the census data. 
And redistricting also happens every 10 years and it follows the release of the updated census data. And our last process was in 2011 and there have been several federal and state legal changes that have occurred since then that increase the options that the board has for consideration when selecting a framework for the process. And we also are dealing with many of the same challenges given the pandemic and our current environment that we, are, we strive to address in the proposal before you today. So we will have multiple topics for discussion and we know this will be a robust conversation because this is another important process that will lead to how our county continues to operate in the next 10 years. And so we're asking for input and direction on the items that are pictured on the slide. And overall, the next information that you will receive is all focused around the administration's recommendation to adopt a redistricting advisory commission. And this commission will assist the board with the process. They will provide the flexibility that is needed if our timelines should continue to shift as they have up until now. And also in the event that the December 15th, 2021 deadline be extended. We are going to proceed with the assumption that this is the timeline that we have in place and we hope to have some input today so that we can formulate a resolution that will come back at the next meeting on April 20th. And to have that resolution come forward, we'll need information on the type and size of the commission and a lot of the different components that are outlined on this slide. We have a list of shells and shall nots for our commissioners. We tried to make some clear and concise eligibility criteria because we do have a short window of time in which to recruit potential commissioners for the advisory commission. It is a one month recruitment period, which is condensed, but we, it is doable and we will be asking our board offices to assist with outreach so that we can att attract the best and most qualified candidates. There is some areas of this that are required by the elections code. That is that a, a person who is a member of the board, their family members, staff members, or paid campaign staff cannot be a member of the advisory commission. But we also incorporated some of the elements that were utilized for independent commissions, such as the prohibition against political party committee members, elected or appointed county officers, or candidates for a county elected office. And all of these are requirements that will be in place while they are commissioners, unlike some of the larger requirements that are needed for independent, we are only focused on the time period where they will actually be serving as the commission. Another element that we have added because we want to ensure a transparent and public process is to prohibit ex parte communications. We want to ensure that in this virtual environment, information is clearly um, presented to the community and that they can participate and there is an information that is happening behind the scenes to make this a, a process that is easy to, for the public to follow and participate in no matter where they are and where we are in our new environment. The process is as straightforward as we could make it. We are, def we are trying to get six steps accomplished in this coming quarter. The first step will be really reaching out to com potential commissioners and get asking them to apply between April 26th and May 28th. That one month is the time period in which they can submit their applications to demonstrate their eligibility. County staff will screen all of the applicants just to ensure that they meet the eligibility criteria. And in the event they do not, we will notify them and give them the option to provide additional information to demonstrate eligibility. After the three steps of the screening process have been completed, we will move forward to the three phases of selection. That first phase is going to occur when the board appointees who are the county council, county executive, and clerk of the board will each be given the opportunity to review the eligible candidates and select one potential candidate per supervisorial district to go into a pool by a supervisorial district. And then we will be conducting our first live virtual selection process where the three candidates who've been placed in the pool will be randomly selected one per supervisorial district. The two who are not selected will go back into the pool to be forwarded to the Board of Supervisors and you will each have the opportunity to review eligible candidates for your supervisorial district and to select 
they name to go forward. And on June 22nd, we hope to have the first 10 commissioners seated and appointed by the board so that they can convene at their first meeting where they will then do a review of the 10 commissioners and think of what are the demographics or the social factors that are not represented on the commission and then to review the remaining applicants and select based on how they can best diversify the commission to reflect our county. Now, after that entire process, we will eventually arrive at 15 commissioners. And this is a, the same number that we had in 2010 and in 2000. And this is a number that we wanted to maintain because if our goal is to represent our diverse community, we wanted to make sure that we had enough spots to do so. It also is best for us to use odd numbers for voting purposes. And so we may be larger than some of the other commissions that other counties are going with. We really wanted to ensure that we have the ability to represent all of the different social factors within our community, nationality, gender, ethnicity, and political party. So we have this three-phased approach so that at each of those steps, we have an opportunity to make adjustments to, to diversify and reflect our community. And I keep using the word community because we know that they are going to be a critical part of our success in this endeavor. It is going to be important that we do outreach from the very beginning to explain what is the process that we're going to be moving forward with as a county, how they can get involved, how they can participate, and even if they want to receive training on how to use mapping software that we're providing those opportunities. So the framework that is included in this report is also going to draw upon some of our best practices that we have developed over this last year as we've done outreach for the census, for our elections during a pandemic, and even just as we do outreach for the pandemic. So pictured on this slide are the specific groups that we want to utilize to help us get the word out about the upcoming redistricting process. And we want to leverage our existing relationships, but also focus on some of the unique groups in our community that are focused on civic engagement, such as the League of Women's Voters, or redistricting groups that are looking at what is going on nationally, such as Common Cause, who can help connect us to some of the folks who have been unsuccessful when they've applied for state processes. And this is also going to be a virtual process because we are counting on this being our normal, at least through the end of the calendar year, but we are preparing backup plans in case we are able to conduct some of this in person. And next, I will turn to my colleague, Danielle, who will give an overview of the timeline. Good afternoon, Board President Wasserman and Board members. This slide offers the Board a proposed timeline of key activities to occur over the next eight and a half months. The activities begin with the establishment of an infrastructure for the redistricting process on which administration is asking the Board to provide direction and approve today. Community engagement outreach and activities, including the recruitment for Commission members, as um, Melanie explained, will begin next. Commissioners will be selected and then appointed by the board in June, and commission meetings will be established in July. In the months of August and September, the commission will hold public hearings, and in October, public mapping sessions. These will be followed by two joint public hearings by the board and the commission regarding mapping options. Lastly, the board will adopt the updated map in December of this year. And I'm turning it back over to Melanie. Thank you, Danielle. I know we have shared a, a lot of information and there was definitely careful consideration that went into developing this proposal because we wanted to ensure that the framework allowed for the flexibility that is going to be needed. And we will continue to provide updates to FGOC as we proceed with this process. But today we are requesting board approval so that we can convene an internal working group and formalize this process because it will require a significant infrastructure to be put in place. And we want to start building our own redistricting website, which will be housed on our county website for 10 years and will be in multiple languages. So there are many resources that we will need to devote to these efforts. And one of those will also be securing a consultant who is well-versed in redistricting and a lot of the legal requirements that are needed and can assist us in adapting to this new um, technological mapping session, which will be a first for our county. So we are available to answer any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Danielle. 
Um, first off, I'll ask anybody who wishes to speak on this item from the public to please raise your hand electronically. I'll come back to you in a few minutes. I'm looking for any supervisors that have any questions. Otherwise, we'll go to the public now. Don't see any, it's okay with you. We'll go to the public first. I'll have one minute each. David, if you'll please start the timer. Certainly, one moment while we get the timer set, please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. I was a part of a election commission when the uh, when the meeting was conducted in order to uh, implement the redistricting commission. The purpose of redistricting is to ensure that the, the legislature, which are responsible to, to implement the certain resp primary responsibility based upon the redistricting uh, as per uh, as for providing the right means of redistricting for the right constitutions and as well as the parties to involve as a part of a commission. So uh, a re uh, legislative redistricting commission is an imperative step as a part of a voters first act, which was introduced in 2008 and as part of a we draw a line movement. So certainly it's something required to be implemented in order to, uh, to update the legislative, legislative process with the house and senate and as well as you know with, with require with respect to the state jurisdiction as well. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Steve Chesson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg and supervisors. My name is Steve Chesson and I'm a member of the Citizens Advisory Commission on Elections that recommended that you create an independent redistricting commission for the 2021 redistricting process. I also served on the advisory supervisorial redistricting committee for the 2001 redistricting process appointed by then Supervisor Smitty. I understand that given the lateness of the census data and the time requirements for completing the redistricting process, it was not possible for you to create an independent redistricting commission for this cycle. But I would hope that sometime before the next cycle, the board would take up the establishment of an independent redistricting commission. I know that there is a tendency to be deadline driven and to not consider items until the due date is staring us in the face. And I know that the makeup of the board of supervisors will be different in 2029 than it is today but I would hope that you would put it into a tickle file or something similar to have that future board of supervisors consider establishing an independent redistricting commission early enough so that it could actually be done. Thank you. That concludes our public speakers. And thank you, Steve, for bringing back a, tick a tickler file. All righty. So with that, Melanie and Danielle, you had on your final, I think it was page seven of your slides, items for board input, and direction, um, size of commission. I think you, you covered that commissioner qualifications, commissioner selection process. What, what specific answers do you want, Melanie, at this time so we can make this as efficient as possible for you? It would be if there are any changes to the recommendation that's outlined in the report, we can incorporate those in the resolution for the next meeting. Understood, thank you. I'll start with uh, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much, um, Melanie. I, I appreciate the report and the very clear um, layout. Uh, I also want to recognize and appreciate the um, the plan for very robust community outreach around the appointment process and your commitment uh, that the pool of qualified applicants and, and thus the um, the makeup of the final advisory commission will reflect reflect the broad diversity of our, our entire community. And I, I am planning to support the staff's recommendation of an advisory committee. Um, I have some, some concerns about how restrictive the applicant qualifications are, um, in part given our short amount of time, um, also the tremendous amount of work that we're going, unpaid work, that we're going to be asking people to do, I don't want us to be so prescriptive um, that we can't get people or that it takes us um, much too long uh, to get them. And I'll just give one example um, with respect to disqualifying factors. How are we defining candidates and how much donated to a candidate would be considered to be disqualifying? For example, if somebody um, you know, gave $10 to a random Senate race across the country. Could they not apply? Um, I, 
I understand that we want somebody who's not extensively politically engaged, but this to me feels a little bit too restrictive. And given the fact that we can, we would legally have the option, I'm not recommending it, but since we would have the option to do this on our own, it feels a little bit to me like we're creating perhaps some unnecessary uh, complications in, in laying this all out. And this is my first time being part of this process. So I'm very interested in hearing from my colleagues and what their experiences and, and perspectives are. And, and certainly I'm, I'm very open to learning. Um, the other just more perfunctory question I wanna ask is that I don't see in the um, qualifications or what we're expecting from applicants who, who would be chosen, what, what is the actual time commitment per week and for how long? Thank you, and now before you answer that, I believe Vice President's referring to your slide, page three, the right column may not. And Supervisor Ellenberg, I think you mentioned somebody making a contribution. Yes. As one of the disqualifications. Correct. And I'm, I can speak I'm, to the contribution piece very quickly, and then I can turn it over to Melanie about the time commitment. Yeah, I'm looking um, for that on the right column, James. May not uh, contribute to or volunteer would be, for a candidate, it, I think is what it would come under. What what dollar amounts it, are you talking about, James? Candidacies we're talking about are county elected office. Okay. So it wouldn't be with respect to contributions to city offices or state or federal positions or only supervisors country. correct okay um, so i just wanted to have that clarification then i'll try that's a huge clarification and, and very helpful thank you yeah and that applies kind of writ large to those types of uh, qualifiers you see on there because the uh, advisory commission would only be redistricting with respect to uh, the board of supervisors and not state uh, or congressional seats, for example, which are subject to uh, the California independent redistricting process. Thanks. Be before Melody, Melanie comes back um, to tell me about the time limit, what did we use as a template for for the proposal that you're you're bringing forth today? Because it is so very specific. It, it's based on the some of the criteria from the independent model to try to harmonize a little bit criteria from the independent redistricting model, but in the advisory format. Um, it is the board's discretion. The uh, Most of these criteria are not mandatory, so the board could delete or modify them. There are a couple that are legally mandated. Um, most significantly, the elections code has mandatory criteria for an advisory commission that prohibits a person who is an elected official of the local jurisdiction or a family member staff member or paid campaign staff of an elected official of the local jurisdiction those persons cannot be appointed sure which which absolutely makes sense um thank you and melanie the the weekly time commitment so that's what we're hoping to develop after this we have kind of sketched out what a meeting would look like and it looks like it would be four hours a month um, between July and October. And then in November and December, it would be more of a considerable um, appointment period because that's when we'll actually be doing the mapping exercises. But we'll sure, but we've also got formalize that for the application. Great, thank you. I think that's important. All right, I'm, I'm happy to listen right now to my colleagues and I'll come back if I have more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Just uh, also in the interest of clarifying, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, you said county officers. Uh, Ms. Ellenberg said only supervisors. Uh, uh, county officers could, of course, be construed to include the three countywide officials. Is it your? Uh, uh, and I'm I'm looking actually at page three of ten in the staff report that talks about. Um, endorse, work for, volunteer for, or make a campaign contribution to a candidate for an elective office of the county. So I just, I think if we're trying to provide you with direction today, I, this is not, not something I've got strongly held feelings about one way or the other, but I do think if we're gonna try and provide you direction, 
any clarity uh, we might bring today could would be helpful in getting it uh, close to ready to go for our next conversation. So, Supervisor Samidian, the state law provision I just read refers to an elected official of the local jurisdiction. Um, and even though there are no districts for uh, that are applicable, uh, the sheriff, the district attorney, and the assessor are elected officials of the county. Um, and so they would be covered by that provision. With respect to anything else that, that uh, is added as, as um, criteria, the board has discretion. Thank you. And again, looking at the language of the um, staff report, which is perhaps a little more uh, specific than um, the PowerPoint, and understandably so, uh, I note it says, while serving commissioners may not endorse, work for, volunteer for, or make a campaign contribution to a candidate for an elected office of the county. So to the questions that Supervisor Ellenberg raised, presumably, somebody could have contributed to uh, any or all of the five supervisors, uh, any or all of the three uh, countywide elected officials prior to becoming a member of the commission. They simply would have to refrain from doing these things while a member of the commission. Do I have that right? That's correct. And one of the challenges, um, I think, with the statutory criteria for the independent commission process is that many of those requirements are uh, embodied in the statute but apply for the duration of the um, efficacy of the maps meaning essentially 10 years um, you know especially with respect to um, uh, running for for example one of the offices so uh, that durational element is not incorporated in the recommendation or before. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that's my only clarification at this point. Uh, like Supervisor Ellenberg, I'm inclined to support the staff recommendation uh, with the uh, issue of a tickler uh, addressed uh, so that at some point in uh, uh, some period of years, uh, after a number of us will have left the board, uh, then the subsequent board or boards will take this issue up. All right. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks for the earlier questions from my colleagues. Uh, they were very helpful in terms of answering many of my questions. Uh, the point, uh, one question I do have is regarding the timing uh, due to the late result coming from the census. Uh, certainly our um, efforts here is, is more hurried. Um, and I hear from one of the speakers, Steve Chesson, mentioned that uh, obviously there's a uh, suggestion of having an in independent redistricting commission. And that due to this shortness of time, does it make it unfeasible to even try to go for independent uh, uh, redistricting commission because of that? I just want to get time frame. I think it would be very challenging, uh, especially given those strict statutory criteria um, that I was referencing. Um, we're going to be given a very short period of time to work with the actual data because of the delays associated with the 2020 census. We still don't know when we're actually going to get the data. Um, and, you know, the real work can't begin till it comes in. So, you know, it's going to be a, a challenge. Um, and I think that makes this census uh, cycle definitely unique. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. I've got one comment to make when we're all done. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is not up. You're okay? Super, thank you. I too will be supporting staff's recommendations. Um, but I did want to say, I know Supervisor Smitty was here for a prior one. I may be the only one that was here for the last one. Um, we had more people, Melanie, interested in serving than we had spots for. You know, the opportunity comes up once every 10 years and people are excited about it. Um, I do not remember the may not column 10 years ago, but I'm sure many of those were similar. 
and we still found people that qualified, perhaps coming back with more definitions about, you know, contributing to, mm. is that over the last two years, five years, when we, when we talk about countywide position, um, county officer to make sure that doesn't include contributing to a county uh, member of the Santa Clara County Board of Education or the West Valley Water District or something like that. And we can get clarification from you. Wow. What is entirely different this time, Melanie, is the crunch due to COVID, um, where it has to all be compressed. What I do remember though, for any of my other supervisors, um, except Supervisor Simidian, who has done this before, the meetings were dynamic. The meetings were inspirational. The meetings were, the technology, I mean, I know we just had the iPhone 2 back then or the iPhone 1 back then, but the technology of the mapping was incredible. People would come up and say, well, what if we moved it over here to San Tomas Expressway? What if we, at the end of the day, what is explained to all the people that we end up nominating, appointing, is that they want to move things around so that each of us over the 10-year period represents relatively the same number of people. And when they're all done, the largest district won't have more than 10% more people in it than the smallest district. And they will have projections of which district is likely to grow the most. So who's ever got the background noise, if they can kill their speaker, great. I, thank you very much. Back 10 years ago, it was my district one that was thought to grow the most over the next 10 years. And the census may well show that. We'll find out. So I had the fewest number of people in my district and Supervisor Simidian, it might've been your district that was thought to be growing the least amount because of, of the density. It might've been your Supervisor Chavez. I don't remember which one it was, but that one had the um, smallest amount of people. No, mine had the smallest amount because it was le most likely to grow the most. And the other district had the least likely and the Delta between them was 10%. And we'll find out now from this census how close we were. But when a member of the public gets to get in there and our GIS people were fabulous 10 years ago, I can't even imagine the technology and how they are now, but they're able just to move lines around in a meeting and tell that, you know, it says, and that removes 11,621 people from district five and puts 11,000 into district three. It's absolutely amazing. And for anybody that has the time that isn't disqualified by this right column, I hope you encourage them to participate. It's, it's an amazing opportunity. Um, Melanie, I, let me just look at this for a minute. We may need, yeah, we do need to take a vote. Um, there were four items. I think the first one was to receive. So we'll consider your report received. Number two, provide input. You've been given a lot of input. Oops, Supervisor Smithian's got a little more input to provide. Go ahead, sir. Well, thank you. Actually, uh, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, I um, I was not on the board when uh, the uh, post-2000 census um, was uh, released and the redistricting and reapportionment uh, issues came up. I, I was, however, in the California State Legislature and saw uh, how that process worked and how extraordinarily politicized it was. Uh, so I'm I'm pleased that we're in a position to uh, avoid most of those pitfalls. I think, Mr. Williams, I, I, it is not in my understanding today's topic to talk about um, or resolve some of these criteria questions that are um, now being raised. But presumably, at some point, you'll want to engage the board as well as the commission if we go down the advisory commission path in a discussion about what the criteria are, including um, uh, equal size uh, to assure equal representation and other uh, questions of, of legality and constitutionality, uh, not the least of which is making sure that we don't disadvantage uh, some community of interest in a way that would be unlawful. Yes, yeah, so with respect to the actual criteria for the redistricting itself, as opposed to the criteria for selecting persons on the commission, 
the criteria for the redistricting itself is very different this round than in the past. The state law has uh, changed significantly and has imposed a number of mandatory factors and procedural factors that did not exist before. We're prepared to advise the, both the advisory commission and the board on those details and walk through that uh, really in the context of uh, you know leading up to and then of course in the context of the actual data uh, leading up to so that people have a sense of what all of those rules are uh, but then in the context of the data um, so that the you know the magnitude differences can be um, you know assessed against that criteria to to see which factors really are relevant um, exactly. I think we none of us know you know how significant um, you know the the numbers may look compared to the current districts. Something that you could perhaps preview for our board and or the public with an off uh, memo uh, prior to uh, the convening of the commission, assuming we go down that path. Yeah, absolutely. We can uh, walk through those criteria. Um, you know, I think we have several months before we need to do that. So after the commission's established, we can uh, walk through through those criteria. Thank you. I, I uh, Mr. Or Chairman and, and others, I, what I'm my experience, which is now both different body. Excuse, me, excuse so, me, Supervisor, could you move a little closer, perhaps to your microphone? Sure. What I'm what I'm recalling with some concern uh, and interest is the from a different body, the legislature, uh, and a different time, of course. Uh, Mr. Williams's point about um, new criteria is that uh, even then, as you referenced, Supervisor Wasserman, years ago, um, the the technology really was quite extraordinary in terms of the ability to to match. I'm remembering state senate districts that had at the time 835,000 people in them that could be matched literally within two or three residents of one another uh, using that long ago technology. I was surprised when I came back on the board of supervisors that there had been a deliberate um, difference in the size of the districts, uh, and it was, as you point out, you know, significant. It wasn't, you know, wasn't problematic particularly. It was just a dramatic, and and it was inconsistent with my understanding, which was that the goal was to get as close to uh, identical populations in the various districts. So I'm I'm looking forward to hearing about all this, uh, Mr. Williams. I, I I thought I heard you hedging a little bit on time, and that's okay. Uh, I just don't want. Uh, an oh my gosh moment uh, or for people to feel like uh, they were not fully informed Supervisor, early on about what the rules of the game were. And that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. If you need a motion, I'm happy to move the staff recommendation uh, with the addition of the tickler uh, at some point some, uh, some years down the road. Uh, I thought that was a helpful suggestion. Let make sure people revisit those issues uh, next time around, if not this time, and also a request for um, a timeline on the criteria uh, to be employed and when that information will be available to the board and the public. And your motion includes approval of the 125,000 uh, funds from the general fund to pay for this? Yeah, it does. And I, Thank you. I guess uh, with the motion in the second, which I think I heard Mr. Chairman Chavez, from uh, Ms. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, I guess I would just ask staff, are, are they fairly confident that that's sufficient for the kind of consultants work that they need to get this done? Melanie? Yes, we have met with multiple consultants and we feel comfortable that that will get the job done. Great. Then my motion stands, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Way to come prepared, Melanie. We've got a motion by Supervisor Smitty and a second by Chavez. I see no other hands raised. Dave, will you please call for the question? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move on to item 23, adoption of salary ordinance, blah, 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 an ordinance amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance relating to compensation of employees adding various positions in custody health 
services. So I'm going to, we've got uh, Eureka Day. That's correct. Here you are. Welcome, Eureka. Yeah, thank you. And good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. Today is the second reading of the board item number 104385, Custody Health Services Proposed Restructure Plan, after presenting to PSJC on April the 1st. And the restructure plan has been agendized on the board for since January 2021, and however, has met with several delays due to logistics and due to continued dialogues with our stakeholders and with the unions. Uh, we began the restructure plan with certain budget assumptions, and as you know, those have since changed over time. But otherwise, the restructure plan has been pretty consistent. Um, we are able to present that today, and or if you would like, just question and answer. Thank you. I think what you just said will suffice, unless anyone disagrees. We have no member from the public wishing to speak. I see Supervisor Chavez, your hand raised, and then Supervisor President Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, I I actually, I was going to make a motion, but I want to make sure Supervisor Ellenberg, just so I'll say my motion and then you tell me if you're comfortable with it. Um, I would like to move approval with the request to cut Custody Health Services report to Public Safety and Justice Committee quarterly on the implementation of the phase one of the restructure and progress made relative to the development of phase two of the custody health restructure. And that uh, unions and line staff be included in the development of phase two as well as patients, family advocates as requested by Supervisor Ellenberg on, at the April 1st Public Safety and Justice Committee meeting. That's the motion, Supervisor Ellenberg. I'm willing to second it just for purposes of, of discussion. Um, okay. So let me just start by saying that I, I fully support a restructuring of the custody health department that seeks to improve patient care. And I agree that change is long overdue. And that was precisely why I agreed to accept the report and the salary ordinance at the last board meeting so as not to slow the process down unnecessarily. Um, but I'm no closer today to approving this request for a number of reasons, and I'll be very specific. First, I initially requested information on a restructure plan, including potential budget impacts in August of 2020, and then again on February 9th, 2021, when we were asked to approve the first adjustments as part of a larger structure. At the February board meeting, the board was told by Dr. Smith that administration and custody health could not provide details of the phased approach until it was mutually agreed upon by the impacted bargaining units. At the Public Safety and Justice Committee meeting last Thursday, Supervisor Wasserman and I heard from representatives of RNPA and SEIU that they had not, in fact, been consulted regarding the restructuring plan and Dr. Day confirmed that they had not yet met. Spokespeople for RNPA expressed concerns that the new positions did not include adding RN positions. Currently in custody health, extra help and per diem nurses are working likely at greater expense than making new permanent hires. And certainly we all know that custody health has long been understaffed and this is grossly unfair to people in our custody, not to mention the strain that it puts on employees. Elmwood and Main Jail both rely on overtime to meet daily staffing needs. And in my view, we should have been filling and adding nurse positions you know, very likely over the last 10 years and with much more regularity than has occurred. But right now, adding LVNs, psych techs, uh, and MAs whose scopes of practice are narrower than those of RNs doesn't necessarily address the underlying shortage of nurses. Um, and while this may be appropriate if there is significant realignment of duties to ease the burdens on nurses, that would be one thing, but it, but it hasn't been discussed uh, with labor partners and therefore it's difficult to be confident that the changes will really address the core concerns. It's unclear how the restructure allows for more nurse support to address the needs of patients in custody health, particularly that have comorbidities, addiction issues, and significant mental health needs. And jails across the nation, approximately 86 to 88 percent of the average daily population has a diagnosed mental health condition requiring close monitoring for decompression. Another large percentage of the in-custody patient population 
has an addiction diagnosis that requires close monitoring and assessment by an RN to treat withdrawal symptoms. To me, this doesn't feel like a fair or transparent ask to approve these positions when the frontline nurses and the support staff represented by SEIU that engage with patients haven't been consulted or included in the design of the restructure. I'm also not persuaded by references to the two thirds percent, um, uh, two thirds percentage in increased population as we come out of COVID. Um, and, and I would really hope that we are thinking beyond a presumption that our numbers will return to, to pre-COVID uh, levels, considering the impact of the recent Humphrey ruling, increased use of pretrial services and other diversionary efforts, along with improved post-release support. I would argue that a non-increasing jail population is an equally reasonable expectation. The need for improved and expanded custody health services should truly stand on its own and not be dependent on a presumption of an increased population. So this clearly isn't a new problem. And while I hear a sense of urgency behind the requests, um, and I hear Dr. Day that you've been bringing it since January and I've been asking the questions um, all along with you, I, I don't have a compelling argument of why right now why these particular positions and why decisions must be made absent engagement of impacted and interested stakeholders. And I believe that other than in cases of true dire crisis, we really shouldn't sacrifice engagement for the sake of speed. We're public fiduciaries. We're also partners with our workforce and we have duties toward our individuals, individuals that are in our custody and our county is charged with maintaining a transparent and public budget response, but we've yet to re receive a response from administra administration regarding how the positions will be funded within the context of the broader budget for the next fiscal year, or any assurances that these are truly new additive positions and are not going to be funded at the expense of positions or services elsewhere, including and especially at Juvenile Hall and James Ranch. And when we are asked to make large budgetary decisions, such as adding 46 FTEs in custody health outside of the regular budgeting process, maintaining transparency is even more critical. Um, again, I believe that improvements are long overdue, uh, but if we're committed to making sure that the recommended actions are not just changes, but real improvements, we have to be talking with our labor partners, our family advocates and other stakeholders before implementing significant and expensive changes. That was my hope in asking for complete information early. And I'm disappointed that the board is being asked to approve these positions now with urgency without those steps having been taken by administration. Uh, I am intending uh, likely to vote no today. And I encourage my colleagues to join me in doing so so that the message that we jointly send is that we're serious about collaboration, we're serious about financial transparency, and we're serious about receiving information in a timely manner. Thank you, Dr. Day, any, other, any comments? Then we'll turn to the uh, Yes, if I could, please. And, um, and just to uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's point, and I am responsive, and I think that I have been responsive. However, um, I have had at least 16 meetings with RMPA, uh, and that's been since August of 2020. And so I've had 16 meetings and about 10 of those have been uh, discussing the restructure plan. I think what was mentioned last week on PSJC uh, was one of the uh, members um, concerns about RMPA positions that are vacant currently not being filled. I also have had at least seven meetings with SEIU uh, and four of those were discussing the restructure plan. Um, I also have a meeting scheduled with them tomorrow as well. Since yeah. August of 2020, I've had 34 town hall meetings. 11 of those were specific to the proposed um, restructure plan. I have not gone through a lot of detail uh, to um, absolute simply because we have not had the uh, restructure plan heard by the board and nor mm -hmm. have we had it endorsed by the board. And so um, many of the changes, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, that you have requested are in the restructure plan to include patient care uh, activities, uh, to include the whole person care, uh, enhanced primary care, 
um, restructuring of um, basically our uh, uh, systems and processes and uh, looking at our electronic health record, putting together a dashboard, putting together a dedicated discharge planning uh, with staff that are dedicated to discharge planning, uh, looking at a robust quality improvement program, uh, looking at administrator support for all of the um, support staff and for the um, leadership, as well as looking at inf infection control and putting an infection control process in, play in place and looking at multidisciplinary staff development. So we do have several different parts of a whole person care model uh, to include when I mentioned the mixed use of codes, uh, those would be codes that will support not only physicians like medical assistants, for instance, but also will support uh, care management, care coordination under the whole person care act. And so those are uh, pretty much, I have submitted uh, several different iterations of the plan, a uh, very detailed iterations of the plan. I have also looked at um, several different uh, industry standards around correctional health care. As you know, I have about 10 years experience in correctional health care and bring many of those uh, skill sets to the table. Um, many of the national standards that are out there for correctional health care uh, include the National Institute of Health, the National Correctional Society uh, to include NIC, uh, ACA. And so all of these have industry standards for correctional health care and entering those into the custody health services here in Santa Clara County, I think would uh, add added value as well as align with industry standards. Maybe I so can I, in I, here. One second, I just wanted to note that I absolutely um, appreciate and, and defer to your expertise. I am not trying to um, supplement my limited knowledge. My concerns are really about the transparency and actually what you've just shared right now, Dr. Day, was, um, was considerably more um, than I had heard before, which I appreciate. But I, but I do want to ask, at PSJC last week, when I asked if you had met with labor met with the nurses and SEIU, you did tell me that you hadn't, but were absolutely willing to open to. So I'm I'm just confused now. Yeah, I have met with SEIU and those are not the nursing staff. They're more of the management positions. Mm -hmm. I have met and with the, them. And, I've met and with the nurses, them. but not the nurses? RMPA? Yes. Yes, I've met with RMPA as well. Okay, when I, when I asked at PSJC, you you told me no, which I is which really yeah. raised a, a red flag for me. I've had several meetings with RMTA and uh, to date 16 total, and about 10 of those were on the restructure and talking about the restructure plan early on in September, October with RMPA. I think what I mentioned was is that the RMPA positions that are now vacant, uh -huh. um, were, that's what um, Ms. King had brought up at the PSJC about the vacant RMPA positions. And the town hall meetings, had those been reported to us before? That was, that also sounded. Um, yes. Amazing. And um, Supervisor, over all of these uh -huh. documents and descriptions and PowerPoints uh -huh. um, have been submitted into Minitrack. And so they've all been read everything that has that has come out. And this has been since I think January. Mm -hmm. um, but the town hall meetings have occurred as well. And I had separate town hall meetings with the nursing staff at Elmwood and Main Jail and at Juvenile Hall in the ranch. Um, I had town hall meetings separate with uh, 8A staff. I've had town hall meetings separate with the psychologist. I've also brought in uh, the mediation as a consulting group. I, matter of fact, wrote a proposal for consulting and we did a culture survey. Uh, we did several different mediation type activities with those separate groups. And so it's been pretty active. The leadership team here has been involved in all of this and say so they also have been, you know, they should have been uh, sharing a lot of these changes with their staff as well. I'm interfacing with Dr. Arnold at Valley Medical Center, who is the medical the chief medical director, as well as with Dr. No, who is the physician for population health. Uh, and they will be directly working with our physicians here as we uh, roll out the whole person care model. And so these, um, these activities have been in place. We've been doing this pretty actively um, for some time. I think some of the concern were with the leadership positions, and these are not uh, positions that we're creating per se. Uh, these are SEMA to SEMA reclassifications or the same codes, but we're, they're gonna be functioning 
as either chiefs in certain areas. The one position we are bringing on is a nurse, um, a lead nurse type that will be over all nursing to centralize nursing, uh, to put standards of care in place that are consistent between Main Jail and Elmwood, as well as between the ranch and with Juvenile Hall. And so that main nurse will act as a chief nurse, um, a chief of nursing. And so that's a director of, um, I'm trying to find the position name, a line staff director who will be acting as a chief of nurse. Uh, the chief of quality and the chief of mental health are not, um, those are cost neutral as well because those are basically reclassification of consistent uh, current positions that are SEMA positions that will be functioning in those capacities. Um, part of custody health services, there is not a leadership structure per se. And I think part of that is why we have so many delays in all of the deliverables across, you know, not only the consent decrees that we're working mm -hmm. on, consent decrees, uh, we have the jail reform. Uh, we also have, you know, the blue ribbon. We have several different deliverables, as you know, that are outstanding to include board referrals. And so the directors that I have now that are administrative, they're also seeing patients. Um, and so we do need to have a uh, dedicated structure in place uh, because we have the same re responsibilities, uh, the same deliverables as a healthcare system, as any other healthcare system uh, mm -hmm. in the county. And so those chiefs of mental health, for instance, chief of quality, uh, chief nurse, um, and chief support um, manager um, are operational as well as, you know, will lead their respective areas for this integrated healthcare system. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate all of that. Uh, Dr. Smith wanted to um, weigh in and um, I, I do appreciate all of that. I, I feel like there's, there's still some, some ships crossing because I have read everything very carefully uh, and it has, it ha really has been a struggle to get clear uh, and consistent information, um, e even with the, with the nurses and the communication. Um, the February board meeting didn't uh, have a confidential memo card attached uh, to it to be able to give the background explanation. We, we went back and checked that. Um, this has been a, it's been a very trying process for mm -hmm. me and I am, and I share the desired outcome that, that, that you want. I am absolutely on the same page. Uh, Dr. Smith? Smith, Smith did you yeah, have anything you wish to make? Let me help, I think. Maybe I can help. Please. <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> you sure can. Okay. Um, part of the complexity of this proposal is that it came through at a time period when we were anticipating a reduction in budget. And so the expectation I think that the community had, or the employees had, and I've met also myself uh, personally with the RMPA, the expectation that they had was that there was going to be deletion of vacant um, RN positions in order to pay for restructuring. Um, that's not going to happen. I tried to assure them myself, we're not going to recommend deletion of nursing positions. Right. Um, I think the subject came up during uh, PSJC. Uh -huh. um, I wasn't able to be there, um, but we will not be coming before the board to eliminate RN positions in custody. We will continue to try to fill those positions. That's been a frustration that administration and the union have had. It's very difficult to fill custody are in positions. Um, it's also particularly difficult without the management structure to actually be able to do the operation. And what this part of the restructuring deals with is primarily creating that management structure. We will not um, pay for it by deleting RN positions. We will continue to try to fill those RN positions we also will be adding some additional positions in the second phase, which you'll hear during the budget. Super. And then the obvious question is, how are we gonna pay for this? And the answer is, we're gonna pay for it with general fund budget uh, savings in other locations in the organization. Um, the healthcare of 
and, and by that I mean also medic, both medical and behavioral health care of our inmates is our responsibility, uh, whatever it takes. Now that's obviously not a blank check, but we have to invest the resources in order to be able to accomplish the change. Thank so you. Um, you won't see a reduction in the custody health budget, but you'll see other reductions in other part of the general fund budget <clears throat> that will pay for it. Um, but we're not going to be eliminating uh, RN physicians. Thank we're you. not going to be terminating anybody uh, to do these restructuring. We have for many years under-resourced custody health and we're trying to rebuild it back up. Great. Dr. Smith. And then oh. submitting. Thank you. Um, I very much appreciate that response. And and certainly it is administration's job to answer the question. My cat, my dog is sneezing. Um, <laughs> um, administration's job to answer the questions with clarity for the Board of Supervisors and the public. And I will, um, I think cease beating a dead horse when I when I finish right now, uh, just to say again that it has not been easy uh, to get these answers in the multi phased process outside of the budget um, and with some miscommunications along the way with labor as evidenced at, at uh, PSJC. Uh, but I am feeling um, a little bit more confident now. Um, and I think the expectations around collaboration and transparent communication have, have certainly been made clear. So thank you, President Wasserman, for all the time. Thank you, Vice President, your second, Supervisor Chavez's motion still stands, is that correct? You're on mute, there you go. I would rather someone else take the, the, the second. Fine, I'll be happy to second. Supervisor Smitty. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Chairman. I'll. Um, I'll be an I vote, but I want to thank Supervisor Ellenberg for teasing these issues out in the discussion today. I, um, I, I found the conversation helpful. Uh, I found Dr. Day's um, uh, uh, clarifications very helpful. Uh, the ex explanation from uh, Dr. Smith, um, you know, it's the kind of conversation that I think is is real and substantive and important to have at the board level. Uh, and I say that as the chair of the Health and Hospital Committee, who still felt like, um, you know, I, I learned a lot today about the, uh, sort of the current state of the situation. And and what I what I wanted to say to the administration is, you know, there were a couple of references to the changing circumstances or the changing dynamic. And I think that that has been a challenge for our whole organization. And that that's not that's not an, a criticism explicit or implicit of anybody. It's just the fact of the matter is that the irony is it's harder or the, the, the difficulty is it's harder to keep people informed when circumstances are changing rapidly, mm -hmm. yet the need to keep them informed is greater than ever when circumstances are changing rapidly. So at exactly the moment when it's toughest to do, it becomes, uh, absolutely, uh, all the more important to to try and provide the information. So, um, again, my thanks to Supervisor Ellenberg for um, uh, pushing a little bit to make sure that our our whole board and the public uh, had a clear understanding. Dr. Day, uh, nicely done. I feel like I am um, more fully informed than when I sat down in my chair, uh, and that's that's to the good. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, Dr. Smith was able to sort of put some overarching context uh, in the conversation as well. I will be an I vote. Thank you. We've got a motion and a second. Uh, Supervisor Lee, your hand. Thank you. Um, the first question I have is regarding the position of the chief nurse. Um, I look at the ordinance 23A, I couldn't find it. Am I missing something? Supervisor, are you speaking to uh, me? Yeah, uh, on the one that's on this slide. Yes. Yeah. I want Actually, you to open, but I don't see a chief nurse. Go yeah, ahead. that's the, um, it's a healthcare service line director. 
uh, which is a nursing position, but it will be functioning as a chief nurse. So that's the B5E. B5E, okay, gotcha. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, and all these positions, how many of these are RNs that you're adding? Um, this particular position is an RN. It is, And right. infection control is right. an RN. It's also the only RN that you're adding them, right? That's correct. As we know, uh, licensed vocational nurse uh, LVNs are not RNs, right? Well, we have the LVNs that are in the nursing uh, umbrella, and then the medical assistants are in the nursing umbrella. Right, yeah. But but they do not need to be um, qualified as RN to take those positions, correct? They are not RNs. They're LVN MA, medical assistant. Right, okay, good. Thank you. Um, right. uh, thanks. That's all the questions I have. Super. All right, Dave, if you could please do a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Sorry, uh, my, sorry, President uh, Osterman. Um, Supervisor Ellenberg, Vice President Ellenberg. Sorry, I missed your hand. Uh, thank you. I, I just, um, I'm grateful to have heard from all of my colleagues. Uh, Supervisor Chavez was really listening to your motion and seeing if I could uh, get back to it. I appreciate um, your recommendation that PSJC um, would monitor this. And I think uh, with the confirmation that um, that our employee group partners were in fact um, consulted and made part of this conversation, um, I think I can get to to yes today. And um, it's very useful for me to hear from all of you to hear the multiple perspectives and and how we can move forward together. So just want to thank my colleagues and Dr. Day and Dr. Smith. Supervisor Wasserman, um, I, I too wanted to say um, how much I appreciated hearing all this, it's, it's both from Dr. Day and from Supervisor Ellenberg. This was very, very informative. And I think the one thing that I will just add is as part of the quarterly report out, I think that there should be a, um, a particular section on communication and outreach, because I, I do think that uh, Dr. Day, you're doing a lot of stuff really quickly. We're talking to the community and the bargaining units relatively in, in short succession. And I think clarity about the meetings, the content of those meetings and the outcome of those meetings would just help us all stay on the same page. So uh, that would be, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, if you're comfortable, that would be part of the report out that would come to your committee, to Supervisor Ellenberg and your committee regularly. Understood, yes. Great, thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg, your hand still raised? Nope. Supervisor Chavez? Nope. Looks like all hands on deck. All right, uh, Dave, if you could please take the vote. Supervisor Lee. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Day. Thank you. All right, board members, that concludes item number 23. Uh, 25, we didn't pull any items from consent. We had one deferred, so it leaves us with item 24 as our final item of the day. Receive a report from the Department of Planning and Development relating to processing of Lehigh Permanente Quarry's Reclamation Plan Amendment application. And Supervisor Smithian, are you present? I'm kidding. Jacqueline, if you'll please open it up. Yes, thank you. Jacqueline Anshano, Director of Planning and Development. Rob Eastwood is going to present on this item. Thank you. Mr. Eastwood? Yes, thank you. President Wasserman, members of the board, very brief presentation. You have the report with you. Uh, this report is an update on the department's processing of the Lehigh Permanente Reclamation Plan Amendment. Uh, the department has provided the board with updates and off-agenda memos in 2020, both in August and December, and this is the most recent update does include some more recent activities uh, in terms of processing the reclamation plan amendment. Uh, most recently on March 3rd, 2021, the department sent an invoice to Lehigh asking for funds to fund the preparation of an environmental impact report that is required to process the application. Uh, another update on a parallel track and the department has uh, notified the board of this, the department is preparing to bring an evidentiary hearing for the board to review the activities in the reclamation plan amendment to evaluate if they are consistent with the vested rights at Lehigh Permanente Quarry 
uh, that were determined to be vested in 2011 by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we are estimating to bring that evidentiary hearing before the board in the third or fourth quarter of this year. Uh, that is the summary of our report. And again, the intent is just to update you on the activities. And again, Jacqueline and myself are available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. I appreciate that. Anybody wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand electronically. We'll recognize you in just a few minutes. And I'm looking for any speaker. This is receiving a report. We'll start with Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask a, a couple of uh, questions. One, thanks uh, to staff for the report. And two things that I just wanted to understand um, one is that we um, got a letter, I think it might have been today or yesterday, from Lehigh. And one of the statements here, and I don't know, if, did you all receive a copy of this letter too from, that came to the board? Oh, okay, great. So the part that starts with specifically the memorandum presents a newly devised procedure to reassess the determined, you know, the vested rights. Um, there's a comment here that says no. No county code provision, state statute, or court decision allows this. Lehigh would be asked for a supplementary evidence. Anyway, what I just wanted to ask is, um, could you respond to that as a, yeah, just respond to that. Uh, Actually, we, we would like to have uh, Elizabeth Pianca respond to that, our legal counsel. Great, right, thank you. Certainly, this is Elizabeth Pianca, lead deputy county counsel, and, um, the county's procedure uh, is to determine or to make a vested rights consistency determination as part of its review of the reclamation plan amendment. Um, the um, statement in today's legislative file is consistent with prior statements that have been made by the department relating to the processing of the reclamation plan amendment and the um, parallel process to make a vested rights consistency determination. Um, the intent of the legislative file was simply to make it clear that that determination would occur at a noticed public hearing and that Lehigh would have an opportunity to be heard as well as an opportunity to submit any and all evidence that they wish to submit. Supervisor Chavez. So I just as a follow up question to that, um, and, and maybe I, I'm, I, Elizabeth, I'm sorry, there, there may have been a piece of it I just didn't, um, didn't understand. What you're saying is that because there's a new application, it gives the county an opportunity to reassess the, to reassess a previous board action. Elizabeth Kianka, again, from the County Council's office. No, um, to be clear, the prior board's action was a determination on the geographic scope of Lehigh's vested rights. The consistency determination is to determine whether the proposed activities in the new reclamation plan amendment fall within that scope of surface mining and related activities. That it's it's not something distinct and different from what has been occurring on the site in prior years. Okay. Um, I just have one other question. I'm, I'm not sure I, 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 Elizabeth, thank you. That was helpful. It's just, a, it just is kind of kicking around some other questions for me. Um, the last thing that I wanted to ask, um, the last thing I wanted to ask is, could you just give comment to the, the um, issue relative to timeline? And really what I, the reason I'm asking that question is I know that, that we've been pressed or that Lehigh is um, contending that the county isn't moving um, in a judicious fashion. And so, do you mind commenting on that? Judicious by speed, I mean, timeline wise. Elizabeth. Um, certainly, um, 
The, this is a complicated application. The timeline that was attached to um, today's file um, identifies the various steps in the process um, to determine a complete application. And the department um, has been working to prepare a scope of work for the environmental impact report um, as expeditiously as possible, given the circumstances. Thank you. That's all, thanks, Mike. That's good, good for now, yes. I'm gonna guess Supervisor Smidian wishes to speak. Supervisor, do we have uh, members of the public who'd like to speak? I think uh, before no, I- No, sir, we do not. We don't, all right. No. Uh, then let me just ask uh, the planning staff, if I may, there is reference to the um, <clears throat> work on the large cement silos. Uh, do we have a determination as to whether or not that work was performed lawfully and with necessary permits? We're looking to Rob or Jacqueline. Yeah, Supervisor um, Sumidian, Jacqueline Anshano, Director of Planning and Development. Our building official has been conducting an investigation. What he reported back, Neville Pereira is our building official. What he reported back was that the work that was done on the silos, and they're sending out an inspector, but based on what he had reviewed, is similar to someone um, repairing plaster in their home and did not require building permits. And we'll get a final determination on that roughly when, Ms. Anciano? Um, within the week. Great, thank you for that. And then um, I wonder uh, from, the, from the granular to the grand, uh, I wonder if if uh, you all could share some thoughts about the role that the alternatives analysis um, might play in the EIR process. I, I am raising that because um, I think sometimes alternatives analysis is frankly just sort of a check the box exercise when we go through an EIR. Uh, and um, I just I wonder if you or your your team could talk a little bit about what a a really robust and appropriate alternatives analysis looks like in the context of a project like this, which is um, anything but plain vanilla. I'll let it go with that. I feel that. Yes. Uh, Supervisor Smitty, and we're uh, as I mentioned, we are waiting on the funding from Lehigh to start the IR, but the, the intended scope of the EIR uh, is intended to be more robust in its evaluation of alternatives. And you might remember we, we used this approach before once with the uh, Stanford general use permit. And the intent is, is that the alternatives that analysis is isn't just- a understatement of the day, uh, <laughs> sir. I, I remember it quite well, thank you. <laughs> interrupt me. Uh, was not to make sure it wasn't just an academic exercise, but to, to give the board uh, the option to fully weigh alternatives to a proposal that are feasible that perhaps could avoid environmental impacts or, or if there's conflicts with county policies. So again, it's the department's intent uh, to have those alternatives available if the, if the board sees uh, that perhaps the, the proposed rec plan does conflict with county policies or environmental issues, that there might be a, a feasible alternative that would achieve the goals of reclamation uh, that, that could be adopted as an alternative. So that, that is our objective uh, with the IR. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, with no predetermination whatsoever uh, or opinion about what that might or should yield, I, I just want to encourage the staff that if and when we get to that point, which you know we expect to, um, that, that that issue of alternatives analysis be given really rigorous thought before we proceed. I think that is fairest both to uh, the public and to the applicant, that uh, if we're gonna have that conversation, 
we tee it up at the front end uh, rather than uh, as a one more thing towards the end of the process. So I just, that's my ask of staff or I'd at least like to plant that seed. And I guess the last uh, question, Mr. Chairman, is uh, for uh, either planning staff or county council's office. It, if I understand it correctly, the plant has not been operating, the quarry, excuse me, has not been operating uh, for a while now. Is that, is that correct? There's been some idling of uh, the cement plant and the mining operations both? We are working to confirm that. Um, that's what has been reported by some of the public, but we are working to confirm whether that's true or not. Well, I guess the question for legal counsel is, you know, if that is the case, at, at what point, if at all, does um, a cessation of operations trigger a determination that there's been an abandonment of the cement plant use permit or require an interim reclamation plan for the mining operation? It, it, Ms. Bianca, Mr. Williams, do you, it, was I clear in the question? It's a kind of a complex topic for me to articulate. Certainly, this is Elizabeth Pianca, lead deputy county counsel. Um, with respect to the cement plant, uh, the cement plant operates under a use permit that was issued by the board in 1939. Um, under our county code, if there is a, a, secession, a stop of any and all use for a 12 month period, um, that could create um, an effectively an abandonment of a use permit. Um, separately, the reclamation um, plan um, is governed by state law um, under the State Mining and Reclamation Act, and they have what's called an idle mine. Um, and I um, do not have a specific um, length of time that a, mi a mine basically stops operating such that um, you can uh, suspend reclamation activities, but we certainly can get that information, the exact length of time for a, um, a mining operation to become idle and report back to the board. If you could uh, do that, if I could make that request through the chair yes. and report back, uh, it, it, I'm gonna be deliberately a little ambiguous here uh, by whatever uh, means you think appropriate given the fact that we have pending litigation. Uh, I, that would be my request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to planning and uh, uh, council. Absolutely. And we still don't have any public speakers. Any other board member wish to speak on this item? Or we will consider it received. Seeing no others, we will consider item number 24 received. 25, is, as I said previously, we don't have any for today. That leaves 26 as adjournment. And I just wanted to apologize to the board of a little while back, I had to go off video. That was because my daughter was showing me her bridesmaid dress that she's going to be wearing in my son's wedding. So she just got it and uh, wanted to show dad and, and uh, she looked beautiful. So thank you all. Have a good evening. This meeting is adjourned. Thank, thank you. you. Congratulations. Yay. Yay. And with that, this meeting will end. Thank you. Have a great day.